Air quality isn't the first thing that comes to mind when you think about chess and esports, but it affects our focus, decision making, health, sleep, and more. What's in the air you breathe? Find out with Air Things. How many times have you been stuck in a rut where you're just not improving? Why can't I improve? I, I'm 1600, 1800, you know, even 2000. I can't get to the next level. What am I doing wrong? This course is aimed at taking you to the next level. I show you one game which has inspired me, which has really helped me in a particular idea. And this is what Berea said in his notes. The move H4 is not to try and checkmate Black, it's to try and stop Black from playing F5. And I'm going to show you one of my own games where I've used that idea and I've put it into practice. That's why I started playing H4 in multiple positions. I now play Bishop E2 and you can see it's very similar strategy to the last game. I want to play h5. <laughs> Best form of defense is attack and calculation is key. Force your will on your opponent. Rook to d4. Boom! So get yourself a nice cup of coffee, get yourself a nice comfy seat, lay back and learn. So actually my first question is going to be about your name. What do you pre prefer to be called? I think Prague is uh, definitely fine. So just Prague? Yeah. I started to know the rules at around three and I played my first tournament at the age of five. Wow. And I started with the state tournament, I think. And it's also funny that uh, sometimes my sister would usually go to some strong event. And you know, I, I would be sitting outside with my mother and so my mother uh, just thought I, she would just put me into the tournament and just... I usually play all the tournaments uh, where my sister plays. So. Wow, and so how much older is she then? How, what age? Like just was... four years old. Four years older? So at uh, five years old, you would maybe play against nine? Or yeah, eight? yeah, something like that. Wow, and would you start winning? No, I that? don't win, but I get a lot of experience and I think which really helped me. He's a very jovial kid. He's not very emotional. Uh, he doesn't get upset about things. When things go wrong, he can uh, smile at it and forget it. So he doesn't react to negative things in a traditional way, I would say. <laughs> I started working with him when he was like seven and a half years old kid. <laughs> he was already having probably around 1700 rating, which was uh, quite high for a seven plus year old child. And it was very clear that uh, even at that point, it was clear to me as a coach that uh, I'm uh, getting an opportunity to work with a highly talented player. And he was extremely passionate about the game and uh, very hardworking. And uh, he became an international master at the age of 10, which was uh, at that time, he was the youngest in the world to become an international master. And subsequently he became a grandmaster at the age of 12, which was number two in the world at that point. He became a 2600 player at the age of 14. 
which was the youngest in the world at that time so it looked like he is very much on course to at least trying to become a world champion at a very young age but then uh, covid happened and he could not play any competition in the last couple of years and uh, now he is trying to make a comeback so it remains to be seen how things will pan out from here and uh, what do you enjoy doing outside of chess do you have any hobbies i like to watch some comedies and some movies sometimes and yeah i usually like to play sports uh, some sports but i'm very bad at them yeah he's basically a very jolly going person i would say he likes to have fun uh, but when it comes to chess he can become very completely different person altogether <laughs> born uh, in Russia uh, St Petersburg uh, to father from Nepal and mother from Russia my parents met in Russia because there was a program where uh, they would invite um, a lot of foreign students from different countries and Nepal was one of them so it's not entirely accidental that my father from Nepal uh, studied in Russia Living in Russia and with two grandparents who loved chess Anish Giri was bound to start playing chess but it was a book that got him hooked on the game. My mother taught me when I was little. I didn't really learn it very, not immediately at least. Also, I don't know how patient she was at teaching me. Um, but uh, eventually I, uh, I received the book as a gift when I was six, I believe. And uh, the book was called How to Become a Gentleman. And there were many chapters. Uh, of course, I see. those who know me well know I skipped all the chapters and went straight for the chess. So I didn't become a gentleman, but I do know how to play chess. When he became better than his mother, she did something clever. And maybe that is the reason Anish is known for his confidence today. My mother tricked my uh, chess club. So I learned uh, from, from um, the book. And then I played a lot with my mom. And only when she thought it was too much and she no longer could spend so much time playing me, then she gave me to the club. And by that point, I was already, um, well, perhaps stronger than her. But what she told to my club teacher was that uh, I'm a complete beginner, I only know the rules. And they put me in the lowest section and I won everything. And uh, it continued like this for a very long time. So I kind of had like a head start. Uh, and I just was reading everything from the start. Yeah, it's great. So I know exactly what Magnus feels like. <laughs> Nothing special. <laughs> but it's not all fun and games for Anish. He is one of the most hardworking players in chess. If I had to do something which I wouldn't love, I don't think I would be as hardworking and as disciplined uh, as I am with chess. So probably my passion for the game is my main strength. Of course, I would love to become a world champion, but you have to definitely be uh, fortunate. Uh, and uh, well, you have to do everything you can and be fortunate. So I'm doing my part and hope uh, the fortune will smile. t-shirt uh, from the movie Coming to America and it's kind of symbolic <laughs> that I'm coming to America, becoming part of this country. Together with his girlfriend, Levon Aronian has moved into his new home next door to the chess club in St. Louis, USA. He was first introduced to chess by his sister at eight years old in Armenia. Since then, he's come a long way. She told me to play chess because she said, okay, you're too annoying, here, do something. And then, uh, <laughs> yeah, and then I fell in love with the game. Levon had an incredible natural talent for chess. And at only 10 years old, the family became dependent on him to get food on the table. Because of the fall of Soviet Union and uh, a lot of uh, problems in Armenia, uh, my father and my mother, they were not uh, earning anything really. So I was earning the money by getting sponsors. Okay, there were of course tears, uh, but uh, it's very easy when you don't really have like, oh, I wanna do this, I wanna do that. No, I knew that I had to do this. My, my first successful tournament, I was playing under 12 in Seged in Hungary and uh, my mother came uh, to the tournament, but we couldn't afford her to stay uh, in a hotel with us. Uh, and she was staying 
she, we made an arrangement that the bus that took us to Hungary from Moldova, uh, she could stay there. So she stayed on the bus for 11 days. You know, she would, she would come to the hotel, we would uh, sneak her in so she could have a shower and things like that or bring her something to eat, but she would stay on the bus for 11 days. Yeah, there were a lot of sacrifices <laughs> from my parents. His parents sacrificed a lot during the 1990s. Life was hard in Armenia back then, so Levon's success as a chess player was their only hope. Back in the day, okay, I did have some sponsors, but I knew that if I travel to one tournament, and if I don't play well, I cannot play any more tournaments. And in order to secure myself, which was of course foolish of me, at the age of 15, I would play uh, blitz at nights. You know, just, just to earn some money on the side, you know, just to... Because for amateurs of different countries, uh, I think this uh, $5 a game was nothing. But for me, $5 was a huge amount of money. The Armenians are sad to see Levon leave. But at 38 years old, he feels this is the best option for him to keep pursuing his dream of becoming the world chess champion. Oh, it's very nice. Hello everyone and welcome to the Mathwater Champions Chess Store, Chess 24. What excitement we've had here at the Julius Baer Generation Cup. This is day two, a day that we're all very excited about for several reasons. Of course, one of them being the big game six that's coming up and all the drama around it. But also let's not forget what a fantastic day we had yesterday with such twists and turns and big results. And before we get on with our pre-show with a very special guest, let's quickly bring up the standings and take a look at where we are in the tournament. Magnus Carlsen on pole position with 10 points. I have to say, brilliant performance, phenomenal play by the world champion on day one. Very often we've seen Magnus struggle a little bit in the start. At an event, he takes his time to slowly come up the table, a ranking board, but that was not the story this time. But just behind him, a big chaser pack with nine points. Vassal Ivanchuk, Pragnananda, Hans Neiman, Arjun Aragasi, Levon Aronian with eight points, Wojtasak and Anish and Vincent with five points. A big day, two coming up. A lot of these players need to play aggressive attacking chess to make sure that they're in the race for the big eight spots into the knockout section. But of course, there's a lot of chess action on and off the board. And to discuss more on this, I'm going to pull up chat. A big welcome to all of you uh, joining us on Twitch and YouTube and on Chess24 and our very special guest. Let's bring him on. He's a good friend. He is one of the best in business. I'm really not sure what his business is yet, but uh, we'll ask him. Let's bring him on. Lawrence, hi and welcome to the show. Thanks, Tanya, for that lovely introduction, as always. Uh, yeah, hello, everybody. I don't know what my business is. My business is getting random texts from you saying, come on the show, so I have a chat with me, you know, that sort of stuff. That's my business. I'm, a, I'm a, uh, how can I call it, like a, a saviour. I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a stream saviour. I come on when they need me. I couldn't before. agree more with you. I, I forgot to add the one and only Lauren Strand in that introduction, but you know I meant it. I and know. of course, I really appreciate you here being with us, especially uh, rumor has it that you're just back from an extremely debaucherous weekend in Oslo. Well, um, we uh, had a, a very good time. Um, I am a little low on energy today. It was, uh, we went for the uh, the bachelor party of our good friend Askild, who's mm. working with the team out in Oslo. You will know Askild if you've watched the main stream. Uh, he's doing I a lot worked of with him in Dubai. We all know and Askild. You work, you, everybody knows he's getting married to a lovely lady and uh, he had his bachelor party and it was, uh, it was good fun, uh, but uh, certainly suffering a little bit today. So still getting over it, not recovered. Not not fully recovered, not even close. But uh, I do not regret one minute of it. It was it was really beautiful. Now I'm sure there was a lot of stuff that happened there that you can't tell us about, as you mentioned. It was a bachelor's. Uh, but what I do want to ask you is, what is the latest and the greatest 
from Oslo about all the drama that's been overtaking the chess world. Yeah, well, it's a tricky one because I did see Magnus as well. I, I hung out with him quite a lot this weekend. Um, and uh, first thing I want to say is regarding this particular tournament, he's very determined to win it. So that's number one. Uh, he told me that uh, he's he's actually very motivated to win this and he's going to just crush everybody. That's number one. So, uh, and the way he played yesterday was just insane, given that, uh, you know, he had... Uh, He'd been with us as well for a lot of the weekend and to be able to perform like that and get in the zone and just crush like he does. I mean, there, there is a reason there is a reason why he is the greatest of all time. Um, so I fully expect Magnus to to keep on pushing today. Of course, the important thing is to get into the top eight places, but um, for sure, he's he's for the next week or so. He's going to be uh, very, very, very focused on this tournament. Uh, regarding the other stuff, obviously, he is also not really, uh, as a result of uh, talks with his team and consultations, he can't really say much. But I will say one thing, and I've been thinking about this for a long time. I was actually commentating the mm. game <clears throat> from the Sinkfield Cup with Jan Gustafsson and Rustam Gazanjanov when... Uh, 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 was I commentating, or maybe it was the day before? I, it was. I it was. I was either commentating or it was the day before. In any case, um, one thing that I realized was that Magnus doesn't make impulsive decisions when it can affect the tournament, affect the game, you know, affect the future of the game. And I was thinking about this a long time, and I thought it's so uncharacteristic of Magnus to just do something rash. I can imagine other players doing it more of super emotional players, but Magnus, no way. And so what I will say is that I believe he has very solid reasons for doing what he did. Although I also do believe he, I think he believes he could have done it in a better way. What, you know, I, I, I think he knows that. But I believe the actual foundation of his argument is probably valid. And at some point, some further um, sort of um, uh, clarification is required, both from Magnus, from, from, from the guys in St. Louis, whoever it is, because we can't just go in limbo, have this accusation uh, on, on hands, allow him to play the same tournaments, right? It just, it doesn't, it doesn't work. At some yeah. point, there has to be some kind of... Um, Hold up. Yeah. So let's see. I don't know when that will be. I don't know what's going to happen today. Obviously, Tanya, they're playing in the second game. So goodness knows what will happen. Have you got any ideas on, uh, on this uh, chaos, let's call it? Chaos it is. And we had Alejandro on the show yesterday as well. And he mentioned exactly what you're saying, that uh, Magnus Carlsen does not take his responsibility as the ambassador of our game lightly. So for him, it's definitely a big deal. But that said, 100% there needs to be a break to this radio silence that we've been getting from him after that first initial tweet. And Jan Ludwig Hammer uh, mentioned it about the two players, both Hans and Magnus, declining interviews for the event uh, on day one as a media blackout from both parties. What do you make of that? What's the reason that they're not coming for these post-game interviews, which is, by the way, part of the obligation that the players have? Yeah, well, it's just a very, very tricky moment because, um, you know, you also have to be uh, a bit careful about things like defame, defamation, right, of somebody. Um, there might be some grounds for a legal uh, dispute if either Magnus or if Hans says something. So I think Magnus is trying to be smart in the sense that he doesn't want to say something that could really land him in trouble um, mm. without having then the, 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 the evidence required. Um, and I'm not saying he doesn't have evidence or some kind of very strong foundation, but I think he's finding a way to be able to to show to show the world what's going on. Again, I didn't talk I to him about it. Yeah. I hear you, Lawrence. And no. I get the feeling 
that you are inclined to believe Magnus in this. I, so when I first did the broadcast, I thought Magnus made a huge mistake. Mm -hmm. And I thought that what Hans uh, did was, was very reasonable. But I've had a chance to reflect on a few things. And uh, I am now uh, very, what's the word, on the fence. Or um, the Magnus's side is now much more uh, credible from what I've seen. And I'm not going to reveal what I've seen. Um, I have... I have seen some things that previously were not available to me. And so, but at some point, clarification is required. That's the, that's the thing to say. And then we can all move on. And I, I don't really know what the best outcome is for the chess world either. Let's say, for example, serious evidence was provided that Hans was cheating. Is that good for the? Is that good for us? Is that good for the chess world? Is that good for this tournament and the future of online chess? Probably not. Um, if Hans is proven to be innocent, then is that good for the tournament? Is that good for Magnus's brand and his reputation? No. It feels like we're in a lose-lose situation somehow, and I just want to know what the the what the best worst case is. If you get my idea. If you understand what I was saying, what is the best thing that could happen for everybody so that we keep everything moving That's and we question. can just use this as a as as a learning a moment? Learning rather than, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think the best case scenario out of this would be that this whole conversation around cheating and chess, which is a very big problem for the chess world, is taken a lot more seriously by all parties involved, players, organizers. Uh, but in my heart, Lawrence, I'm hoping that... Um, Hans's name is cleared. And as we can see from whatever has come out so far, whether it's been Grand Chester, or whether it's been Sinkfield Cup statement, or Arne, who did who did an interview about the games that Hans has played online in the Champions Chess Store, it does look as if there was absolute fair play and no foul play involved. And uh, I hope that's the case. But you're right. We have to see how this unfolds. Now, you mentioned that Magnus is extra motivated. And that's how you felt when you spent time with him in Oslo. Yeah. He wants to just crush the field. And yeah. that's the kind of chess we saw from the world champion yesterday on day one. Does this have something to do with a certain player he's playing in round six today? I, I, I don't know if it's anything specifically to do with hands, but I think he wants to really make a statement that what happened in uh, in the Singfield Cup is, is a very isolated event. He's still very motivated. He wants to win this tournament. Um, he... Uh, you know, I was, you know, I spent most of the weekend with him, to be honest. And, um, you know, he's preparing for the games. Uh, he's, he's, he's got his coach, uh, Peter Heiner, helping him, sending him files, sending him ideas. It's not just a random blitz game. He, he knows what he's playing in every game, pretty much. He knows more or less the, the strategy. And I think he wants to show who's boss and that he's still boss and that this episode isn't going to derail him too much so yeah. i expect i mean his his pairings today are extremely interesting because he's got uh, uh navara we can, have, we can have them up on the screen yeah. if we can have uh, magnus's road on day two uh during the preliminaries up on screen while we have that sorted now this big game six uh, mm. it's almost like the two of them have a score to settle against each other are you expecting the hype to be real and for a really big fight? Or what can we expect out of it? The only thing that I don't want is an anticlimactic draw in this one. No, I think there's zero chance of a quick draw. Hmm. Uh, but the truth is, I have absolutely no idea how the game is going to go. Because I'll be honest, Hans has played really well as well. He's on. Uh, he got three wins yesterday. He played some, some, uh, some beautiful chess. He did play some of the players that, however, you would say if he's going to win, it would be against those players. Christopher Yu, the 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 the, the young uh, American grandmaster, lowest rated player here. Boris Gelfand, who's obviously a bit more old school and not really used to playing uh, this online format, and he beat Vincent as well, um, who is also, I mean, of course, Vincent's a young the young generation, but 
you know, hands with the white pieces, you, you can think, ah, oh, he's capable of beating Vincent. So he's on a, a very healthy score. Um, so it will be very interesting to see uh, what happens. Uh, you, you know, you feel as though it's just going to be expect the unexpected or, or something, uh, I don't know. I, I mean, but, but, uh, Hans could blow him off the board for all we know. I mean, it could be one of those weird pairings in chess history now where, you know, one of the big underdogs gets a good score. Again. Or maybe Magnus will just go to war against him and just say, you know what, I've got to teach this guy a lesson. I don't care that I'm black. I'm going to play something uh, double-edged. I'm going to get a position that isn't dry. And I'm the just going to crush this kid. Sorry? We might see the hippo return. Well, I mean, look at what he played yesterday. He played the perk. He played the modern, right? He's playing openings to provoke his opponents. And look what he did against Eric Asin in, in, in round one. I mean, yeah. how do you beat somebody like that from a perk against one of the best prepared young Indian players in the world who's winning in 22 moves in black? It's, it's sensational. We could see the, the same today. And in fact, you know, Magnus, he's got white against, um, against David Navarre in the first round, which he'll be very happy with. I think his score against Navarre is unbelievable, by the way. Uh, so assuming that he continues his good form, if he wins that and gets off to a good start, then we could just see him crush hands in, uh, in round six. But, I don't uh, underestimate hands right now. No, that, that's he's, what got, he's got so much at stake, uh, Lawrence, you know, and, and yeah. this extra motivation is not just from Magnus, I think from Hans as well. In fact, right now, if you told Hans that he could beat Magnus, and maybe not qualify for the top eight, or he could lose to Magnus and qualify for the top eight. I'm not 100% sure which one he would pick. And then no, we I see- I think he would choose to qualify. He would choose to qualify. You might be right. That's pushing I, it, but let's just take a look at Hans's road ahead. He's playing yeah. Arjun in the first round, uh, yeah. first round of the day. Then he plays Magnus, Adiban, and Liam. It's quite interesting because for Magnus, as we saw, his day builds up uh, as well. You know, he's playing he, every game, of course, here is super strong, uh, starting with David, then Hans, then he plays Lev, and then he plays Prague, and he recently lost to Prague in the FTX Crypto Cup. So uh, a tough day ahead for both of them. Chess needs to scream for itself today. Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I think, uh, and we've just got uh, confirmation from our fantastic producer, that Magnus also lost to David Navarro with White the last time they played. So it could be, I, I'm very curious. I, I can't wait for the game to start really how Magnus will, will do against Navarro. I think if he wins, in convincing fashion, I think mm -hmm. Hans is really going to be in for a tough time. Yeah, um, but, but but Lawrence, if Magnus lost to David in the previous tournament and mm -hmm. Magnus doesn't have a great start today, that might also work in Hans's favor. For sure, because then Magnus might be incentivized to really push with Black. I mean, he's in a position where he's a point clear, but there's tons of chess left, right? There's absolutely tons of chess. We've got all of today. We've got all of tomorrow and all of the day after, right? Yeah. So, you know, uh, his his position at the top is not, he's not a, uh, a guarantee to qualify for this top eight yet. There are far too many games left. So it'll be really, I, I've got absolutely no idea what his approach will be today. I just know that he's out for blood. I know he's frustrated. The whole episode has actually bothered him immensely. Uh, but as it should, because it's it created, should. yeah, it's created a complete storm in the chess world. Yeah. And, and you know, he's not been on the receiving end of most of it so far. Exactly. So uh, yeah, it, it's just gonna be fascinating. And obviously, I'm gonna watch you and Peter uh take us through all of the action. Uh Super my, excited my about boy. That one. My but boy Peter. Yeah. <laughs> Your boy, Peter, will be yeah, joining yeah. us uh, very, <laughs> very soon. And of course, we've also got a very big matchup coming up with Boris taking on Vassil, our two icons from a previous generation. Uh, this tournament is all about how chess can be played across different age uh, groups, even at the highest level. So that's one game that I'm really excited about. Now, Lawrence, just moving on from uh, this bit, mm -hmm. I also hear that yeah. there is a very big announcement that <laughs> you're about to make. No, uh, I did. 
No, on I mean, the yeah, yeah, it's of it's, September, apparently. What can yeah, you tell so, us about that? No, I can't. That's the point. So, I mean, all I can say is that... I, what is I, this? What is this? You know, about Magnus, I've got all this big secret and this big inside info, but I can't tell you guys what it is. On 23rd, I have this really big announcement, but I can't give anything away. No, I mean, the Magnus thing is is not uh, inside info, per, per se. It's just that I've had a look at, uh, you know, what he has looked at, okay, uh, which is available for everybody actually it's not inside there's no there's not some inside info there and my opinion on it, the validity of his argument has changed in so far as i believe that he's got serious grounds for mm. his position um and uh the other thing my thing is just a personal thing that's going to be I, I you know very nice to to to, to talk about but it's Nothing really to do with. Give uh, us a hint. Time. Give us a hint. I, I can't because even a hint will will just give it away. You'll just have to wait. Follow me on Twitter at Lawrence Trent. I am. Follow me on Instagram. I've got an open profile, uh, so I'm going to be putting the the video there. And uh, yeah, uh, hopefully by the 23rd we can uh, we can get it out there. But for now, really, it's all about this tournament, Tanya. Uh, I'm, then, I, I'm yeah. going to get to the tournament. I just want to say, Lawrence, if on 23rd. If on 23rd, you announce your announcement has got anything to do with you retiring from chess for the 700th time. No, it's not. That's just going to be incredibly annoying. No, no, I would never make it. No, it's it's nothing to do with, nothing to do with my retirement. I mean, I'm not even a player. How can I retire? Um, talking. Uh, what about you, Tanya? Let's talk about you for two minutes. Uh, when are you playing next? I've got the Asian Continental Championship coming up and that starts mm -hmm. last week of October, I think. So after this okay. event, I'll sort of go back to training mode and playing mode. Kind of looking well, forward need... to that because after the Olympia, that will be my next event. And then Citrus in December. Oh, right. Of course. Well, if you need any help, let me know. Um, happy to send my notes uh, whenever, <laughs> whenever you like. <laughs> We've got different styles, though, so it might not work. Okay, I'll ask you a question that you can, yeah. in fact, tell us something about, I'm pretty sure. Now, you mentioned that, you know, you're pretty good friends with Magnus. You've just spent some time with him and all of that. Uh, your notes and these files that we <laughs> often hear you talking about, have they been used by the world champion in his games at the No, it's, it's funny, because when I, when I talk to him about some random junk line... Um, you would think, oh, maybe he doesn't, but he knows all of the junk lines, right? He knows everything. He 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 makes out that he, he has studied all of the garbage lines. He knows them all back to front. Um, so uh, he laughs. He says, yeah, I looked at this. Yeah, I know about this trick. And yeah, yeah. And so, you know, he's, um, I, I think people over the years have just underestimated how much he knows uh, theory wise. Mm. Like he's never, I don't know why he's not put in the category of the, you know, the top theoreticians because, you know, we talk about Fabi and we talk about Kramnik and, and, and these guys, but Magnus has done, I mean, he knows so much and maybe his contributions are, are less visible. I don't know. Like you can see like massive breakthrough novelties by Fabi, you can list them or by Kramnik or Anand, you can list them. And with mm -hmm. Magnus, it's like, can you think of a breakthrough novelty that he played off the top of your head that is a really critical novelty in a line? The answer is probably not. It doesn't immediately come to mind, but it, he has done it. So don't underestimate Magnus and, and his, his the, and, and what he does, he just so skillfully, um, uh, he kind of understands what kind of opening to to employ the direction of the army. I mean, look what he did yesterday. Against okay. Adivan as well, right? He also against, knows how to play against... Well, a player. against Adivan, he was a lot worse, right? That's but there's something. one... Lawrence, there's somebody else we have with us who's also... Yes. Who also knows everything about everything uh -oh. when it comes to chess. So we've got to bring him on. Let's bring on the one and only Peter Lecco. Peter, welcome. How are you doing today? Yeah, hello, Tanya. Hello, Lorenz. Very Peter. nice seeing you. Joining Lovely us, great. Yeah, Peter? just talking, talking a bit about today should be quite the, quite the day. 
Uh, Peter, whenever whenever I have a conversation with Lawrence, the first 15 minutes of that conversation, every time is spent arguing, who does Peter like more, me or Lawrence? <laughs> I'm not even joking about it. It is an ongoing competition as intense as who will become Grandmaster first, me or Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope the, the best for both of you. Yeah, this... You see, I told you. That, that, that's the most important, uh, but also coming back to the conversation about Magnus yeah. and his openings, I absolutely agree with Lawrence, yeah, that uh, Magnus is heavily underestimated because he's just so smart in his openings, yes. yeah, he's choosing the right weapon against the right people, he knows all the psychology, who doesn't like what, and being capable of playing everything, yeah, he's the one who chooses the battlefield. And then he doesn't need to do some incredible move 40 novelty or whatever, some very principal battle. He already gets his territory and that's more than enough for him. Yeah, that's a really good point, Peter. I, I discussed this also. I was with uh, Jordan Van Forest last weekend and I spoke to Jordan who obviously worked with Magnus. And yeah, he, you know, Jordan said something that resonated with me. He said that Magnus doesn't go for the, the move by move. Okay, this is... I can play, I, I, I can play this way. My opponent has to find five good forced moves in a row. But if my opponent finds those moves, he equalizes. So Magnus says, I don't want to run that risk. These players are good enough to find these only moves. So I will get another kind of position where there's a bit more playability. It might not objectively be the best move, but I have a better feel for the position and there are more that the, the lines aren't so forcing. That's where his strength is. As you said, it's guiding the positions in the way he wants against the player as well, right? He's very conscious of the, the, how, the style of, of his opponent. Whereas there are other top GMs who don't have that flexibility. One would be, for example, Maxime bashir -Lebrat. I mean, Maxime has got a very predictable repertoire. You know he's going to play an idol if you play 1e4. So... That's what makes Magnus as well very, very special and, and, and how he manages to win so many games as well. No, it was, a, it was a really great start and so much. We had 24 decisive games out of 32 on day one. And Peter, I think that has everything to do with this super entertaining mix that we have, the field of players that we have. Lawrence, before you leave us, I have to ask you, Vassal was on fire yesterday. And of course, the whole world is rooting for him. Uh, we're also going to bring up Grandmaster Jonathan Distill's tweet on this. But tell me, Despite, of course, wanting him to do really well, were you at all surprised with the chess he played, the quality of games, winning against Anish, winning against Duda? No, because uh, class is permanent, form is temporary. Uh, the, the, this is a man talking about being versatile. Have you, is there, has there ever been a grandmaster in the history of chess who could play every opening and any position as well as a banjo? No. Like, literally, he has played every single over. He, not, he understands structures. He understands the, the small ideas and so many of it. He can play aggressive, sharp, positional, slow. He can do it all. And by the way, it looks as though he's actually done some real work on his openings for this tournament. It's not just that he's making it up. It's clear that he's actually prepared. I would love to see more of Ivan Chuk. I know he's over 50 now. I know... He's not going to really challenge for the top, top, top places. It's just not really plausible. But he can still play inspiring, beautiful chess. Yesterday we saw that. Um, uh, you know, even his game against Pragnananda, which he lost, he should have won. He was crushing Pragnananda in game one. He could literally be on 100%, right? So, you know, I, I'm a huge fan of his. I, when I was growing, growing up, Tanya, with you, um, you know, all those years ago when we were doing things like reading books, uh, no chessable, nothing like that. When how I would much, you at Blitz. How, but no, how much Ivanchuk was there in all of the literature? Hmm. Think about it when we were reading those. Ivanchuk was just everywhere from the, from the positional play to the opening play, and it doesn't matter. He is a class act. I love to see him doing well. I would love to see him. Uh, qualify for the top eight and go far. It would it would be great. I, 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 he deserves it, and uh, especially everything that his country is uh, going through as well at the moment. I don't know where he is playing. 
Ukraine. I don't know if he is in Ukraine at the moment. Yes, he, he had an he interview is. yesterday. He mentioned he is playing from home. Couldn't agree more with you on everything that you just said, Lawrence. Yeah. I think all of us want to see Ivanchuk, uh, Vassil to go really far in this tournament. Peter is a big fan as well. Lawrence, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you, guys. We'll off in a minute. And it's been a pleasure talking to you. And we Thanks, look forward guys. to the 23rd. Sorry, say that again. We look forward to the 23rd. Yes, yes. <laughs> Keep your eyes out. At Lawrence Trent, I am on Twitter. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to this commentary. I'll leave it with you guys. Take care. Thanks a lot, bye -bye. Lawrence. Cheers. Bye. Yeah, bye bye. bye. Wow, chat. And there we have it. We've got all our 16 players on the screen with us, ready to go. We're going to have liftoff any moment. Magnus's camera is just being adjusted, as is Vassil's. Big chess, big, big chess coming up, Peter. And of course, a lot of our chat is waiting for that game six, the Magnus versus Hans round. But even before that, there are so many exciting matchups, and I want to bring up the pairings going into round five. Let's take a look. We've got Jan Christoph Duda facing Anish Kiri, two heavyweights playing each other. Going to be a lot of fun. Although I have a feeling that besides Chat and us, Anish as well has his eyes and mind on that game six. Boris Gelfin against Vasil. I know, Peter, this one's going to be the game that you will be focusing on. We've got 15-year-old Christopher Yu against Ivan. Now, Christopher Yu is making his debut at the event and he beat Pragnananda. He finished the day on such a high, a very important moment for anyone who's making a debut in this format to be able to score against a strong player on day one. Wojtasek plays Pragnananda. Vincent against Lev. Arjun versus Hans, very important. Hans needs all the motivation and confidence before he faces Magnus. Arjun's not going to make it easy. Magnus against David and Adiban against Liam. Yeah, incredible pairings. I mean, so much excitement, so much uh, interesting stuff going on. Of course, as you mentioned, uh, Boris Gelfand against Vasily Ivanchuk. That's the game I'm, I'm hoping for and unfortunately did not start yet. I, I want to see that, will we see D4 or will Boris play some move order trick like Knight F3 or something? Because... Uh... Peter, my prediction is D4 and I think we might see a little bit of some sort of a Catalan position if Boris can get it. Yeah, but here you have it. You see, I, I somehow felt it. I sensed it that Boris will come Knight and C5, C4. All their classical. Okay, I'm, I'm just loving it because yesterday I already mentioned that I think I know almost everything about Ivanchuk. And by knowing almost everything, I also know that I know nothing about him because he's still capable of surprising anyone. And if someone knows even more about him than, than myself, then it's Boris. Yeah, so it's just so interesting for me to see how they will. And there you have it. It's a very special move order. We might be ending up in a Marozzi. It's amazing how you could predict this possibility of Boris choosing the move one knight f3 and not his usual d4. Really shows great understanding there. Peter, what is also very fascinating about this matchup is the clash of styles that we've got here. Boris, really positional, strategic, precise in these kind of positions that require slow play. He's able to get a win out of positions, which just is so hard to understand how anyone can do that. Meanwhile, the street fight chess, as you call it, by Vassal Ivanchuk, going for creativity, attack, aggressive play, combative play, that's also going to be a factor in this game. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, simply, there is so much twist and turn. There, there were times, like in 2007, I think Ivanchuk was always playing the Marozzi against me and I did not understand. I mean, I was so happy, okay. Uh, th th there are so many other things which, which I worry more than, than being hit by the Marozzi. I mean, after all, this is a very stable position from the white side, but also there, Chucky always had his own ideas and he would never play it in a classical game. He would do it in a rapid or in a blitz format so that he can play quickly and he can put the pressure. And I'm wondering if uh, Boris will go for the end game. It, it would be a very classical reaction, but okay, let's not run ahead of, of the action. All right, we're not going to run ahead of the action, and I want us to do a quick opening tour while this game heats up, Peter, because we've got eight important, crucial games running. So let's start one by one and get an update on the kind of positions that we have, and I want to start with the world champion, Magnus versus Navarro. Do we have moves in that game? No, yeah. that's that's oh, the it's... trick. I mean, already yesterday we noticed the Magnus's camera was not working perfectly. I, I don't know what's happening. 
We do have an update and Tad is informing us because Magnus's camera is not set. The games haven't started. So strong anti-cheating measures, no matter who is playing. We are having that ready and it should, we should have lift off any moment. Peter, let's take a look at Anish uh, Giri's game. Anish against Jan Shristov Duda. Two big favorites against each other. Yeah, that's uh, a very big clash and we see a razor sharp variation of uh, yeah basically i i did not want to say that is it a grunfeld or is it a kings in them because uh it was white who picked move three f3 so it, it's a weapon that can be used against both openings a very universal one and the way how anish reacted is uh, is the way of getting it to the same uh same -ish variation with e6 e4 c5 d5 d6 knight c3 bishop g7 it always guarantees some super sharp uh uncompromising chess takes takes a6 a4 knight b7 also there are so many move orders that when do you castle do you include castle do you not include castle i mean i'm certainly not an expert of it but i was always kind of intrigued with this position so i did have my research a little bit just to understand these finesses that why people are castling or why not and in this game we see I'm from Peter, I've played a bit of Samish myself and I play this line with the white pieces. One of the advantages for black to delay castling is that you can advance with your H pawn faster. You can go H5, H4 and try to build something on the king side, even make the move G5 at some point, taking control of the F4 square. And this is something that I think we end up seeing in this game, that not rushing with the king side castling has its benefits for black. Yeah, and we see it immediately at H5, H4, knight F1. Uh, rook b8 i mean somehow to my eyes this this move knight e3 i have never seen it before maybe because the white bishop is usually on e3 it, it could easily be yeah but but the move knight is this slightly surprises me anish blitz is kind of out knight h5 and after e5 look at the evolution bar i mean evolution bar already claims that black has very serious counterplay and this yeah. probably connected with what you mentioned that this one tempo yeah that black saved by not castling gives him some extra additional possibilities and we've got moves like knight f4 coming in now because of this knight on e3 that has blocked that bishop on c1 usually in the samish black doesn't achieve all these things so quickly so definitely some great prep by anish and perhaps jan Tristov duda might have not been very prepared for black to take this direction knight f4 let's say you make a move like shot castle the other knight can jump in knight e5 comes in even options of g5 g4 follow up after you make a move like knight e5 once black has control of all these dark squares it's usually a very tricky position for white to handle don't forget h3 always in the air yeah, but the, I think the big question is after knight f4, could white actually play the move knight c4? And uh, maybe this is the reason why Anish actually opted for knight e5 knight, first. And you don't care about knight g2? I don't care about knight g2 because you don't care about castling. I don't care about <laughs> the pawn, just to make it fair. Yeah, so you give a check, probably I'm going to go king f1. Now you have to play h3. Yes, and I I'm going gonna, gonna to hit you on d6 with a check as well. You know what? You go king f1, I go king f8. Okay, okay, <laughs> but 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 then it's basically just a total mess. I have it's no a, idea how to a, evaluate it. Yeah. But you know what, Peter? If you play these kind of positions, if you get into Kings Indian structure, you're ready to face a mess. Yeah, you should be ready. Yeah, but that's why I'm I'm not facing it. Yeah, I'm not ready for it. Yeah, in any case, it would have been a very unclear situation, very difficult to evaluate in a rapid game. So Anish opted for the more classical way with knight e5 and as you mentioned he's already jumping into knight f4 anyway so maybe he he did not want to get into this uh, craziness talking about craziness a massive update coming in from our producer tad that hans neiman is he in trouble already i do have the position in front of me and black is down upon white's bishop on g2 definitely a monster of a bishop but currently that knight on d5 blocks it Black's bishop, on the other hand, not such a great piece. I don't see enough compensation for black in this position. Yeah, not at all. I mean, okay, but uh, I mean, when I look at this position, I don't understand one thing. Why is Hans also rushing so much? I, I just don't understand because this is very much the narrative that we have seen with uh, with uh, Maxim Vashia Lagraf, and I was very critical that why is Maxim not spending some time? Uh, Jan is also famous of uh, playing very, very quickly. And now Hans is doing the same. I mean, what happened here? So it's a classical Catalan, knight b7, c5, a slightly 
Oh, yeah, but yeah. I already told yesterday that yeah, usually... I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just interrupt by saying that can we just take it right from the top? Because yes, it's a classical Catalan, but those of us not familiar with it, let's just take it from move one and see how the game progressed and got here. Yes, so it's d4, knight f6, c4, e6, g3, bishop, b4, check, bishop, d2, bishop, e7, bishop, g2, d5, knight f3, castles, castles. And I mentioned yesterday that usually the more uh, standard way is to play c6 first and then knight b7, but... Usually, I would say that if black voluntarily goes knight b7 first, that's kind of provoking some c5 move and, and all these kind of things. So he should be very well prepared for that. Arjun went for it, c5, knight e4, knight c3, f5. We see some very complex strategical middle game, b5, bishop f6. So all looks quite kind of normal. Look c1. And okay, this, this knight takes d2 is already slightly strange because the knight on e4 is such a monster, but okay, definitely there was some very concrete reason behind it, queen a5. Is this the reason? Takes, takes. Oh my God, yeah, that's why you should not rush. He just blundered knight takes d5, winning a key pawn. And this is shocking. This is absolutely shocking because this is such an elementary tactic. When your queen is on a5 undefended and your opponent's queen is on d2 eyeing it, these nice knight jumps, we see them in such a wide spectrum of openings. This is a shocking blunder by Hans. Yeah, absolutely shocking. And I mean, okay, why do you rush? I mentioned I did not notice uh, what happened, but just the feeling that, okay, if you take knight takes d2, you can only make a move like knight takes d2 if you spend like quite a lot of amount of time and you know the justification why you are doing this. Uh, but probably he simply wanted to go for this queen a5 and put some pressure strategically, yeah? because let's just show what Hans wanted. Yeah? After queen a5, he put some pressure on the b5 pawn, and he thought like, you know what, white is not able to protect the pawn on b5, because then I will have the tactic with knight takes c5, and the knight on c3 is attacked by the queen and the bishop. Yeah? So he was setting up a trick, and if white is not able to play rook b1, then usually giving up uh, this b takes c6, b takes c6, the tension, and then giving black the chance to activate his bishop would be very good news for black. Yeah, but that's my one thing is strategy, another thing is tactics. And he got hit by knight d5 and basically loses a game. Yeah. You know what is even crazier? That he took a minute and 20 seconds to make this move queen a5. And if you're about to play the world champion in a such a crucial match, which is the next one coming up. This is the kind of blunder that really hits you. You can't afford to play this kind of chess at the start of the day. Uh, absolutely shocking stuff here. And it almost looks like you're gifting a free point to your opponent. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it still requires some work, but of course, yeah, white is pawn up, the knight is heading to d6. There is a weakness on e6, which can be targeted by bishop h3 and rook e1. The rook on d2 is lovely because stops the only counterplay that black could have with uh, entering with his rook on the second rank. So white's rook is perfectly ready for it and will target this weakness. And okay, it's just a matter of time till black posi black's position completely collapses. I mean, imagine a white gets that knight to d6, rook e1, the bishop goes to h3, eyeing that e6 weakness. And besides all of that, white already has an extra pawn. And that's the reason that we see the eval bar love white's position. Hans Neiman in big trouble in this one. Uh, Peter, let's move on. We'll come back to this, but let's continue with our quick opening tour of some of the very critical matchups. And I want to take a look on Levon's position or let's start with Magnus. Yeah, let's start with Magnus. Yeah, because Magnus started a bit late, so we were not even sure what happened. Finally, they played a very classical uh, opening. I mean, they got a cards bar structure. And uh, yeah, Magnus is favorite now, this uh, fourth move C takes D5. Basically, it's anti semitarash weapon, yeah? Because now after knight C3, C5, Black has started to make so many draws. And now Magnus, Starts with cd5, ed5, knight c3, avoiding c5. At the same time, he has compromised quite a lot of uh, other things. So this is considered to be absolutely fine for, for black, of course. Bishop f4, bishop f5, e3, bishop d6. So the first new move, I think, Jan was uh, playing knight b7 in the Singfield Cup against uh, Magnus in the first round, and he got a very normal position. But OK, Magnus was ready. He loves these structures. Uh, David plays bishop d6. Magnus takes, takes, knight h4. Yeah, that's the justification. You have to hit that bishop immediately. Uh, bishop e6, bishop d3, knight b7. And okay, yeah, Magnus gets his 
a position that the bishop on d3, it's very important that he fights against uh, black's bishop. Yeah, he, he has the more active and then uh, his knight can eventually return to f3. Yeah, it's returning and queen e7, that's the current position. And sometimes white has all these plans of putting that knight on e5 and also advancing this f pawn, f4, f5 ideas. You put your rook from a1 to e1, the queen goes to c2, and just slightly easier development for white. As you're mentioning, black has a counter plan of rerouting that knight from b6 to d6. That's how we're expecting this game to develop. Another Carlsberg opening structure in the Pragnananda game, Peter. Uh, let's take a look at that. White sec playing with the white pieces and such. Typical plans of the Queen's Gambit decline Carlsberg structure where we see Whitesack advance with the minority attack on the Queen side, where two pawns try to break into uh, Black's four pawns, getting that B5 move in to create some weaknesses on the Queen side. Very thematic play. Wow, actually almost identical because look at this. Knowing that Prague also, start, I mean, not started, he has played the, the semi tonnage but actually Prague is playing the original semi tonnage knight c3, c5, and after cd5, he's not playing the modern stuff with cd4. He's playing the classical knight takes d5. Radek wants none of it, and he goes for Magnus's pet line now, cd5, ed5. I believe this cd5 is not entirely a weapon which you are ready to use in, in classical chess, but it perfectly suits for rapid blitz play because you get the structure, you can play it very quickly from understanding. And he we see a slight uh, surprise that Radek opted for bishop g5 instead of Magnus's bishop f4. So some little differences here. Knight d7, bishop this. Yeah, this is the classical approach that the bishops are traded. Usually people say that this case black has nothing to worry about. Bishop e7, castles, castles, a3, a5. And we get this very classical position. Takes, takes, knight c8. Yeah, and the knight is heading to d6. White will play b5. We are creating the weakness on c6. And this is tiny bit unpleasant for black, yeah. especially in rapid chess. It's so often that these kind of positions with all these trades taking place, you know, the two bishops are gone. So many pawns have been traded off. One might feel that this is close to equality, but actually the pawn structure, once it's broken on the queen side with the c6 weakness and often White's knight jumping onto c5. Imagine rook comes to c1, knight a4, knight c5, the other knight going to b3. There's always a pull. So even though the position looks like there's no poison, Pragnananda still has a long way to go before he can claim that he's out of any trouble. Peter, let's move on a little bit and take a look at some of the more exciting and go back to the Anish game, the King's Indian defense that we had against Duda. Yeah, well, this is now getting uh, more traditional, yeah, and I feel like White is probably not kind of happy. I mean, he stabilized the situation, at least you know that you got a position which, which you probably are uh, aiming for if you are playing the Zemish. What, what is your take? You said you, you played it quite a lot. So I haven't faced the Samish where Black has managed to trade off that knight, which is so important very often and not having enough space is a big problem for Black, but we see that's not the case now. Usually when Black has managed to uh, trade off a pair of minor pieces, advance on the king's side, that bishop on e5 looking really strong, white's bishop on c1, pretty much dead. Hard to imagine a king's side attack for white here. Uh, it is it is good news for white. In this particular position, the h4 weakness is where black needs to be really careful. Uh, moves like queen e1, queen h4, hitting that pawn comes to mind. King g7 directed against that so that you would have a move like rook to h8, defending it at some point, make the move h3. I have to say, with my experience in the Samish Peter, black should be fine here. Yeah, pr probably. But yeah, it's such a crazy structure. I'm also trying to make sense of it. Yeah, that uh, th these pawns are trying to block everything. If white would get a nice break with GC, even at the cost of a pawn sacrifice and then push F4, then who knows? But it also weakens white's king. Yeah, white cannot just freely do all kinds of things. I'm thinking about something like rook a3. I really want to keep the bishop on c1. I would love to get the rook on the third rank and then somehow combine it with GC. And if I ever managed to eliminate this f4 pawn by forcing to take on g3, then I will have f4 and then the rook joins the party. Yeah, it's, it's some kind of an idea that I feel could be critical. 
Peter, you are underestimating Black's trumps also in this position. Rook A3, very nice idea, but very often you have to watch out for that B2 pawn as well. There are always these motives of going H3 and then retransferring the queen from B6 to the king side. You go queen D8, you get your queen to H4 or to F6 and put extra pressure on that B2 pawn. So with all these ideas, very often Black is able to create counterplay against the white's threat of G3. Yeah, no, that, that's perfectly clear. Yeah, that if you manage to get the queen to f6, you get a very nice stabilizing queen on the king side. Yeah, protecting at the same time, also keeping an eye on white's king and the pawn on b2 might be weak. And uh, Duda goes for bishop d2, bishop c3. So he wants to eliminate this monster bishop as quickly as possible. And uh, I still don't, don't see it because computer says that white is not clearly better. Just just let, let me make a move, human move like queen d8. White plays bishop c3, we play queen f6, as you mentioned. I, I'm loving this plan. And even if I lose this pawn on a6 with all this grip, I don't feel that I'm risking anything. I see the computer evaluation bar, and I am with you that it's also... But also, Peter, these kind of positions... Often the engine evaluation doesn't come to anything. Practically, black keeps chances alive and it's always dynamic play. The current position, let's point out that bishop takes b2 is impossible because white has to move rook to b1, which would pin and win the bishop. So you don't have time to take uh, to take the pawn on b2. I really like the idea of rerouting the queen or maybe even going for something very direct like h3 here. Is that a possibility? Well, H3, I think it's a very double-edged move because your king on G7, I still have this pawn on H2, yeah? So let me just continue, for example, with bishop C3 and the rook is mm. protecting on G2. And now I'm just hoping and wishing that I had my queen enough time to come to F6, uh, but that's not possible. But even this position, a move like rook H8 comes to mind. And it's also still very unclear. And I see that Anish is taking his time to decide which direction to go into. I have no doubts that this idea of rerouting the queen, he has it in his head. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's also a very typical Anish. Yeah, he likes to have control. And uh, the big question is that, I mean, yeah, for example, after queen d8, I'm assuming bishop c3 will be played and then queen f6. How does white plan to plan to break this construction? Yeah, because, okay, as, as we spoke, just to illustrate that, for example, bishop takes a6, even if, I, if nothing, I just take stakes and play rook a8, trade this uh, active rook. For example, take stakes, I'm officially pawned down, but I even don't feel like I'm pawned down. I have I have everything under control. White's king is now much more vulnerable. The, the e5 square is super important. I don't think that white will ever consider grabbing this pawn. All right, we've heard it from Peter Chat that we can, in this position, ignore that eval bar. And look at this, Anish goes for, just as I was about to say, Peter, that everything that you've said, uh, makes one believe in Black's position. Anish takes a very direct decision, a move that I I wasn't thinking about at all, but once it's on the board, I'm wondering why we didn't have this on our radar. F5, a thematic idea, uh, playing with Black in these, in these structures. Yes, it's thematic, but I'm still worried for Black. I mean, I just don't feel like what you are really achieving by opening things up, because if I trade this bishop on, on E5, yeah, for example, with bishop C3, let us not get off the right track. Let's just play bishop c3. And I don't really feel, feel that f takes e4 is something I have to worry about because after f e f e, my queen suddenly will have also very nice uh, options of going to h5. Yeah, so I'm welcoming this uh, trade. Usually when black does play f5 in these positions, the whole point is to try to just not be the first to blink. And you want to keep the pressure going in the center and not really commit. Completely agree. You don't want to give uh, you don't want to give activity to that queen on d1. But what he has in mind for bishop c3, we don't know yet. We will come back and see how he responds to it if Duda indeed goes for this move. Peter, I know you've had your attention, meanwhile, on the Boris and Vassal board. Mm -hmm. And the reason you haven't taken us there yet is because you believe that this position, this game will end in a draw soon. It's been a peaceful one so far. Exactly. I mean, when I, and, but I already had this feeling yesterday that Vasily, Vasily will be very careful against Boris. Yeah. He is not fooled by the tournament standing that apparently I'm on, I mean, Chucky, Chucky's point of view, I'm on fire and, and my opponent Boris is kind of uh, suffering so far. No, I mean, don't get, he's much more experienced. 
he just plays the game. He wanted to be as solid as possible, and his strategy worked out perfectly. I was claiming to see some end game pretty soon, and that's what really happened in this game. Trade, trade, bishop d7, and once uh, such two high level players reach such position, you just feel like there is no way this game not going to end in a draw. And uh, I feel like both players are also showing a tremendous respect for each other. Yeah, just playing very classically, very classically, very solidly. And uh, and that's it. Basically, this end game which we have now, it's, it's just a dead draw. All right, a matchup between these two legends that we were really looking forward to has ended or is about to end peacefully. Uh, Peter, let's move on and take a look on the Lei Kuang Liam Adiban board. It looks like Adiban is in big trouble, according to our eval bar. Yeah, well, I mean, right from the beginning, because I had an eye on, on this game, I have never seen White being in such an unpleasant uh, position after like just 10 moves or something. We might have a chance because, yeah, there is nothing to talk about. Black is now able to take the e5 pawn and we'll be two pawns up. We'll have the better pawn structure. I mean, White will try to put up some resistance thanks to the knight on e4, but, uh, I mean, uh, this, this shouldn't be holdable. And just very quickly, so what happened here? And again, players are playing very, I mean, it's, it's kind of a Ragozin, an open invitation with bishop b4 to the Ragozin. Adiban tries to use the move order to his advantage with queen b3, and probably this heavily backfired. He went for this very sharp position. Oh, no, 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 no. I mean, he, he took on f6, he took on d5, queen takes f2, knight c7, check king e7. And after takes takes, he got a horrible structure because, because now the dark squares and everything, blacks, uh, don't be fooled that white castle and black king is in the center because simply the other factors are just way too, and look at if you have to play queen g it's, it's almost like a capitulation because it's clear. This was the position I have seen and okay, from which opening did we reach this? Yeah, because this is a nightmare of all nightmares for white. Yeah. Okay, and so th this is what Liam is uh, slowly converting very nicely. All right, well, we can see in the current position, Black keeps the advantage and uh, he does need to show some technique here, of course, Liam. The other player who still needs to show technique is Arjun Aragasi against Hans Niemann. Now, Arjun won that pawn. He's got his knight on d6, a dream position for the knight, bishop on h3 on this diagonal, making sure that Black's knight on c7 is tied down to the defense of the e6 pawn. The rook from a3 not only defends the a2 pawn, but can always jump onto the attack with a move like rook e3, eyeing that e6 weakness. Uh, Peter, has Arjun done everything right in the process to get that full point? Well, I think he's a little bit in the in the spot that he knows that he's winning, yeah, and, and somehow he got to this winning position way too quickly and, uh, and without really understanding what he did so special to get it, yeah, and sometimes it's psychologically not so easy to, to continue because you feel like you have to win on the spot, but the game continues. I feel that Hans is at least kind of relieved that the game is still on, and, and he's setting up some kind of a fortress. For example, one very important moment that if we take knight takes b5, okay, it's now black to move, but in general, I want to hide, highlight that after knight takes b5, black probably wants to capture with the rook. And this knight on c7 protects the a6 pawn and blocks the a5, blocks the, the empty square from, from white's rook. The pawn on e6 is a horrible weakness, but the knight on c7 is protecting it. And uh, yes, it's, it's horrible for black, but still not so... And uh, Hans goes bishop f1, he insists. I think we have seen bishop f1 already one time in... The, and knight c8, wow. I mean, as, as Arjun was expecting the move bishop f1. He blitzes it out. He blitzes out knight c8 with this dual threat of getting to the c6 pawn with either a fork or knight to a7, uh, just completely ignoring any idea that Hans might have had with bishop f1. Of course, he doesn't care about the trade. His king will only advance further up the board. And now, not so easy. He might have to just come back with the bishop to b5. Yeah, it's it's looking very bad. Yeah, but uh, then also maybe White will even come back with the bishop to g. Okay, I don't know. It, it just looks. Or hang on, can he even try to go for some mating ideas like bishop f5 to go rook f3 and then try to get knight e7 check, forcing the king somehow to the side and then enter with the rook 
like this and then eventually bringing the bishop and, and checkmate black's king. I mean, there are all kinds of ideas like this. It looks like black is in a lot of trouble. Wow, knight c8, that's quite a stunning spot by Arjun and played in seconds. Impressive stuff. Hans now thinking, uh, but this game has gone bad for him and has gone very wrong from him from the opening. You make a blunder like queen a5, of course, everyone has their moments, but usually players of this level make those kind of blunders when they're short on the clock or something a little more complex. Queen a5 just felt so elementary for a player like of Hans's caliber. Knight b5 played, putting pressure on d4. Uh, but does this not allow knight e7 check, knight c6? Well, it allows everything, but uh, I mean, okay, rook takes a6, knight d4, knight e7, knight c6, but there was nothing better, yeah? He was uh, losing the pawns anyway. So yeah, rook a6, knight takes d4, check. King f7, knight takes c6. And okay, knight takes c6, rook c6, rook b2 is some kind of a double attack, but we have two extra pawns, yeah? Let's not forget and. I'm guessing that just pushing the A pawn and, and relying on the two passers should be easy win. You know, I always thought that there is no other player on camera for online chess, uh, apart from Arjun, who can top his look of absolute boredom and lack of interest in what's going on. And then we see Hans, who literally looks like he's just been woken up from his sleep and been forced to play a game of chess. <laughs> Yeah, could could easily be. I mean, look at look at Arjun. Yeah, it's he's just uh, for him. I I don't know. It's like playing chess, the most ordinary thing. Yeah, like like okay, not nothing is happening. No no reason to feel any tension. It's it's really incredible. It's amazing, and it doesn't even matter who he's playing against, what his tournament situation is. Uh, currently, he is on second position, and he's had a great run on day one as well. After losing that first game to Magnus, winning three back-to-back -back games. Uh, so definitely feeling good. But you look at him, and you just don't feel it at all. Just completely expressionless, uh, totally calm. But like I said, Hans looks like he's also not feeling the chess, but his moves seem to say the same right now, unlike Arjun. Peter, we'll come back to this game and see how it goes. Uh, by the way, meanwhile, Boris and Vassil, their game has ended in a draw. Let's take a quick update on the Magnus David board, an important round for the world champion. Yeah, white is squeezing, white is pressing a bit. Uh, it won't be easy to break because, yeah, black has this uh, huge weakness on E6. Uh, the pawn on d4 doesn't really feel like a weakness because it actually controls both pawns. Yeah, so it's a very useful pawn. And white has the e file. The big question is how are you going to break through? Yes, yeah? so I'm expecting that Magnus is probably hoping uh, or, or he's trying to achieve something like black will take on e4. We take with the rook, then we get queen to e3, putting the maximum pressure on e6 so that the rook on f6 and queen on d6 will be tied. And then slowly g3, h4, h5 we are creating some uh, targets against Black's king. And then combining these factors, we will play on, the, on Black's nerves and we hope that the opponent collapses and will miss something and we win. Yeah, that's kind of the, the, the strategy here. Mm. That's quite a nice breakdown of the whole position, Peter. Uh, very nicely explained, really, all these subtleties. Uh, meanwhile, I just pulled up chat and I didn't notice, but Sean is pointing out that Hans is rocking the Sinkfield sweater just in case we forgot. Well, no one's forgotten today uh, because uh, especially with the big game coming up after this where Magnus will be playing against Hans. But once again, a bit of a shocking game by Hans uh, in round five. We'll see how that one ends and how he proceeds to play Magnus in the next one. All right, Peter, where do you want to jump to? Well, I'm actually seeing quite a lot of technical positions. For example, Vincent against Levon is now very interesting because seemingly a completely drawish look and game, but look at the evolution bar and also my kind of experience. I immediately said that with King G3, King F4 ideas coming, the pawn on E4 is a, is, is a vulnerable one. White has chances. I mean, Vincent really, he's done on the clock. He's done to three minutes, but uh, his position is so super safe. And I think like he kind of tricked he tricked Levon because after takes takes, he opted for h4 and Levon played the very natural automatic h5, which might be a mistake here because after king h2, this is this is now very much Magnus's type of chess. Yeah, king g3, king f4, which Vincent also loves. 
you call it magnus type of chest this is also very your type of chest no peter where it's absolutely <laughs> safe and you're happy and it's cemento and there's just nothing to worry about in the whole world and you can just play with your plants king coming in putting pressure on e4 rook will go to c4 how are you going to defend that e4 pawn rook coming on to c7 putting more pressure it's the kind of position where white feels that you're playing for two results. Exactly, yeah. It's very nice, especially with the, with the short time control. Yeah, the the defense that I'm seeing for black is that somewhere he would love to get the rook to e6, push probably a5, and then finally the king reaches f4, and then you activate the rook. Then black will have a timely check with rook f6, forcing the king to retreat to g3 because the f2 pawn will be weak. Yeah, that's the defensive mechanism I'm, I'm seeing for black. If it really gonna work out, it's another question because White can also start uh, first maybe pushing his. I mean, first of all, he brings the king, but he will also try to push his pawns on the queen side with b4, b5. Some chances here for Vincent. And it's really interesting because uh, you know you're playing against a player like Levon, and to get this end game, uh, that requires a special skill to get it against somebody like Lev. Also, when you immediately saw this position, Peter, for mere mortals like myself, the last word that would come to mind for such a rook pawn ending would be interesting at first sight. But then you explain the subtleties of this e4 weakness, white's king advancing to f4, and black's pawn structure might be black's downfall, and you realize that there is still a lot to play for in this endgame. Yeah, absolutely. And also, Vincent feels the, the momentum. Yeah, he's spending time. Uh, on the other hand, it's a bit scary because uh, he shouldn't be going too low on the clock. Yeah, it will put tremendous pressure. And exactly when you will have a chance maybe to calculate something, then you might run out of it. In any case, uh, it will be very interesting to keep an eye on it. Liam, meanwhile, I think is already winning because he activated his king. And okay, this, these two passers and the dominating pieces are just too much to handle. Uh, what else do we have? Okay. Pragnananda. Let's get an update on Prague's board, Peter. I, that was the Carlsberg structure that we were talking about where White had some chances, but I think now that's all in the past and this is going to fizzle out into a draw. Yeah, still there is one detail. After Ruki A check, he needs to play Knight F8. It's the only move to keep everything together. And let's just point out that after a move like King H7, of course, Knight F7 is possible, but you always have these tricks of even Rook H8 first. But Knight F7... Rook is attack, h5 ideas. He's never going to allow it. Knight f8 has, will be played. Yeah, knight f8 will be played. And uh, basically, if he is able to trade the d pawns, I mean, the e d pawns, then, then he will have to have enough time to, 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 to get out of this uh, slightly awkward position. Yeah, e d4 is played. Rook takes d4. Will be blitzed out. Yeah, shouldn't be shouldn't be enough. I mean, there is still some some pressure. It's it's kind of interesting that we have one more or less symmetrical position here, and still there is some life. But here, every all all the action is just on the king side. That's why it feels that it should be enough. While in the Vincent's position, for example, there there are two weaknesses, and that yeah, we have to no no we can't even move because now Radek has played the move h5, and it keeps the tension. He doesn't want to let g6 uh, king g7 happen. And how black is going to get out of the box? Rook d6. Ah, he insists on going g6. Yeah, g6, king g7. And if rook a7, then we will have rook f6 protecting the pawn. He should be able to slowly get out. That's a nice defensive technique that you need to make the move g6. So just come back with the rook and found in seconds, showing class here how to just keep everything under control and not panicking when your opponent makes this cramping move like h5. Uh, Peter, I think we can safely call this one as most likely to end in a draw. I want us to go back to the Anish Duda game because that's a rook pawn ending one more time, but far from clear. Yeah, and we are again talking about a position which we talked before that in these same structures, you should not really count the pawns. You have to look at the quality of your position and, and look at this knife. We can't, white has uh, five pawns versus four. But it's only black who can be better with this incredible powerful king on e5, putting pressure on the e4 pawn, protecting the f4 pawn. And black also has this very nice outside passer with, uh, with the a5 pawn. The rook is behind. On the other hand, white is just in time of uh, blocking that on a4. So the rook is not so passive because the rook is also protecting the vulnerable e4 pawn and puts pressure on the a5 pawn. So probably white saves this. 
All right. So despite Black's activity, white should be fine. But it's it's interesting that white has this extra pawn. And yet we feel that white is the one on defense. Uh, that's quite a fascinating thought for a rook pawn endgame. Yeah, it uh, it very much uh, resembles some kind of a banker gambit. Yeah, which also uh, in in banker gambit people would think like, okay, I sacrificed the pawn, I shouldn't be trading pieces. But usually endgame is in black's favor because then those those pawns are much more vulnerable. And I just want to point out the importance of the e5 square in these kind of openings. First, the knight jumps there for a trade-off. Then the bishop comes to the, this e5 point. And then finally, black has got this powerful bind with the king on e5 in this endgame. And all of that is only possible because black managed to advance the f pawn all the way to f4. A very, very crucial idea of the Samish. Yes. Absolutely, yeah. This this e5 square is the key to to all these positions. First, the knight lands there; it's traded. Then the bishop landed there. Then the bishops got traded. Then probably queens were traded somewhere. And then black was in time to get his king to e5. And if you ask Kanish, he will tell you that I'm so happy. I'm enjoying this position tremendously. The only problem is that maybe I can't break through. Yeah, that's that's the only thing. But otherwise, you you are just very happy. All right. And meanwhile, Peter, Arjun has won his game against Hans. Uh, I have to say, though, that felt more like a no game to me after the move Queen A5. A little bit of technique Arjun had to show, but felt like a gift. And I'm just hoping that this was the wake up call that Hans needed, the sleepy Hans needed before his game six against Magnus. Yeah, he also maybe got carried away, yeah, that he, his thoughts were already on the game with Magnus and he didn't. But on the other hand, I also noticed yesterday that he was playing very quickly. So it was not like just today he played quickly. It's kind of his strategy to put the opponents under a lot of time pressure. Now it heavily backfired. Uh, actually, it also backfired against uh, Radek, yeah, because uh, Wojtasek won a very nice game against him in the same variation, the Catalan. Uh, but there it wasn't because of some blunder. It was just some uh, Hans got too too excited. He sacrificed some pawns and and Radek with very precise play just uh, punished him for it. Now mm. it's a different story. By the way, Magnus has won a pawn and he gets a technically winning position. Of course, not easy to convert, but seeing also that David is down to 20 seconds against Magnus is four and a half minutes. Magnus will slowly improve his king position. Uh, push the pawns, h4, then, I mean, his look is so nice on, on d4. Black has, if, if Black would have a pawn on f7 and g6 instead of h7, g6, then at least one could argue that Black can put up some resistance because the seventh rank is not weak, but, but like this, it feels completely hopeless. And this is uh, the one position, the kind of position that you definitely don't want against Magnus. Uh, you know, even whatever chances that you might have to hold, usually Magnus is just so strong in his technique in the end game. Uh, here with the extra pawn, as you're mentioning, the king, the king side pawns will advance, the king will advance. Uh, Peter, it's going to be hard to imagine David saving this one. And... Apart from that, we have still the Vincent game running, if you want to take a quick look at that. Yeah, it's still, uh, it still, it exactly goes along the ways that I mentioned that, yeah, White has this idea of pushing the, advancing the queen side pawns, fixing the weakness on, AC, on A7. Levon was making sure that White is not able to activate the king because he was always uh, chasing it with some checks. He also pushed G5, but now he also has, I mean, three weaknesses. On the other hand, he has an active rook. So everything comes down to active defense. Yeah, look, D2, how can Vincent not deal with this pawn f2? Do we ignore it? Or do we maybe play... Hang on. Can we play king g3 and then provoke h4 check? We take it. And okay. after takes, we come back. And after rook e2, we go king f4. And now we have a nice king. And after we're going to take on a7. It could be very interesting. Mm -hmm. It could be very interesting because... It's nice to get rid of this h pawn because this h pawn is always, yeah, King Vincent goes King g3. But Vincent down to 25 seconds. This is the one, give him one more extra minute. Yeah, just one more extra minute and he will be so super happy. But okay, I mean, uh, thanks to this uh, investing so much time, probably he got this nice position. So one should never, you know, complain if you have little time, but you got a good position because it was an investment. Absolutely. And King G3, as you mentioned, uh, before going for the A pawn, trying to trade off this last H pawn, 
So Lev still in big trouble and now down to 50 seconds. He's thinking about whether to go for H4 or not, but I don't see an alternative because anyway, you're not going to be able to defend the A7 pawn. Exactly. I mean, it's uh, just so unpleasant for, for Lev on the end. He goes King G6. He wants to keep some counterplay with, but look A7. I mean, this King G5 followed by H4 doesn't seem to work. First of all, F7 King pawn G5 is falling. Just, you take Rook F7 and you exactly. still defend the F2 pawn, so you're not even losing it. Exactly. This, this does not work at all because the Rook protects the pawn. So what does Levon want? Rook A2. No, this should not work. I mean, cannot work like this. So what he wants is that if you make a move like Rook A6 attacking B6, then he wants the idea of going King G5. But I don't think you want to make a move like Rook A6. Yeah, you don't. But uh, yeah, it's of, if, it's of course tricky. And this is exactly the problem that I had in mind that down to 15 seconds, uh, you know that you are probably winning, yeah. but... Nine, he do? needs to make a move and he goes for rook a6. But this allows this idea of going king g5 and h4. What does he have in mind for this? Well, but I mean, after h4, you can't take on f2 because then uh, I will have two passers. And if after rook b6, you have to take on a4, then this h4 is not really a, a threat, yeah? But you have to make a move in this position. Peter. You have you to make a move. Yeah, Rook definitely. b6 and now you maybe just yeah go h4 and pick up the a4 pawn. Okay, king h3. King h3 played. Rook f2 looks too scary, so rook a4 makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and rook b7. Yeah, rook b7 or rook b8. I was expecting one of these moves. So now is he going to go rook b4? He goes rook a1, threatening mate in one, rook h1. Yes. Watch out, Vincent. Yes, yes. He wants mate, so king h2. Very tricky. Yeah, I mean, if you would have pre-moved something, you get checkmated, right? <laughs> I mean, in bullet, you 100% get checkmated here. And Vincent goes F4 check, but I'm not liking this. No, this is this is giving chances for Levon. This is exactly what he hoped for. And I Levon had, had that expression that indeed this is what he hoped for. Peter, why do you say that? Because F4 No, looks you like just, you shouldn't spoil your structure. The structure was so nice, just King H2. Why not just to play King H2? It should have been a win. Down yeah, to now, now Levon is escaping. Unbelievable, yeah. So does he go rookie seven and with the idea of trying to get rookie five check or does he give up one more pawn? Does he trade another pawn? The more pawns that get traded, the closer Lev gets to a draw. Yeah, yeah. Well, now, I, yeah, he has to play rookie seven. No, he goes F4 check. And maybe after King F5, he wants to go rookie seven, rookie five. No, King F5, you can take with check on F7. But okay, now Black will just go King F6 or something. King G6 played and Rook E7 now. Yeah, but Rook E7, Rook B3, I just don't see it. Yeah, Vincent needs to make a move. I mean, with one, one second. second. No, I mean, don't do it. I mean, if oh he, he loses goodness. this, he, he kills his tournament. I mean, he shouldn't be he shouldn't be risking like this. Peter, you underestimate these kids and their power to make a move with one second on the clock. <laughs> yeah, but still, <laughs> you shouldn't be doing this. Okay, now at least he's on the right leg because f6 is a, is a weakening. I mean, maybe it's it not going to be enough, but now there are some chances. But okay, rook to b3, how do we really call it a chance? Rook to b3, we call it a chance with, well, first I would like to go king g4. Yeah, king g4, and, and it's some kind of a semi swung, but it's, wow, king f7, not king g4? I mean, if, no, Where but king g4, you can come back king g6. But why did Levon play king f7? Before king g6, you go rook c6, you go b6. No, but this king f7 is kind of a shocking move. I, I don't really understand. What's the purpose? Because white anyway wants, he needs to come back with the king to g6, but he is worried of, of some... What is he worried of? Rook c7 or... And Tad is informing us that here, immediately going f5 check, king f4, getting the king closer to the b pawn, gives white real chances in the position. Will Vincent find it with, and he goes for it, Peter. Your student goes for it. He makes the move F5. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm still in total <laughs> shock. Yeah, I mean, my heart almost stopped there with one second. I mean, I don't know. Oh my God, yeah. Okay, now Vincent, King F4. Vincent, yeah. you need to stop doing this to our co -com, to my co-commentator, to our chess expert. Yeah, well, it's uh, now I need to calm down. Okay, he has to continue with King F4 because of course, yeah, if, if you can bring the king over, I hope that he will not do it with one second. Okay, now it's good. Yeah, he, he has 19 seconds. 
Oof. Yeah, because uh, the point is yeah. that rook b3, oops, yeah, because uh, the rook can't fly to e1 or to b3. Yeah, Levon is trying to, to cut white's king, but this case then the pawn, okay, he, it's very tricky position because if you advance with rook c6, b6, then black will have active rook and king comes to g5. Vincent has to make a move again, again with one second on the clock. No, okay. I mean, sorry. I have to switch to another game. I have to. I have yeah, to because the players are playing on seconds. We have to. We have to see this through. I mean, Winston. Yes, but rook b one, rook c five. Yeah, so they are just repeating at the moment. He's got twenty seconds now, so you can breathe, Peter. Yeah, but I mean, he. The, the, it was the same position after rook e one. Why did he spend so much time and play rook c three? He's just not doesn't make sense again. He is. I think it's either rook c7. He he needs to. He goes for rook c6. Attacks f6 after king g7. He has this idea of going rook c7, rook b7 as well. Yeah. Okay. After king g7, you can't run with the king. So yeah, he goes rook f1. Check. That was kind of the the question. How to deal with this? And king g4 is yeah. Rook g, no, because the king has to run, of course, in the other direction. Yeah. King e4, king g5. Rook c5, protected, and, and, and the king closed the king closed the the e file. Yeah, this is very important. Now, in, the, will Levon go for the rook b1 defense? Probably and he will, but but then also White has rook d5, and then the king slowly marches towards the queen side. It should be winning now. I think this has been some great technique by Vincent on the board and on the clock. Repeating these one moves, getting those extra seconds. He's up to 50 seconds, giving Peter a couple of heart attacks along the way. Uh, I've got to say, I, I love the way he's playing. And now he can also go rook d5 yes, with the idea now... of transferring the king further onto the queen side. Yeah, that's it. Now rook d5 is played. Anyway, the rook had to come to d5. Okay, now it should be elemental win. But I mean, I would have agreed with the nice technique if we would have not seen twice Playing a move on one second. I mean, that's that's a scary technique. Oh my God! Yeah, rook b1, king d4. Yeah, king f4 will be played, but but the king is running basically nowhere. I'm I'm guessing. And you can go king c6 now, so that rook c1 check. You've got king rook c5. Exactly. Yeah, basically king c6 uh, just seals it. So the whole to... point was getting your king to the other side of the board, and Levon shaking his head in disbelief. Just how this rook pawn ending, which seems so harmless. Uh, Peter, you remember those, uh, uh, when we started with that h4, h5 position, the king marching up. And I have to say, Vincent made it look easy. Well, I mean, there was this uh, mistake with f4 check. I mean, he shouldn't have played it. But yeah, with little time, I was, you remember, I mentioned that if he would have one extra minute, I'm pretty sure that he would have very nicely converted it. Yeah, Levon, Levon designs. But but after f4 check, well, it's a very nice end game to analyze, yeah, because it's so much to discover here. We will do that, but right now we have another live game on. Let's quickly jump back to the Magnus versus David game. Big congratulations to Vincent. It's definitely a huge confidence boost and a big point to take home for Vincent defeating Levon Aronian. Always, always a favorite in these events. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's why I got also so incredibly excited. I mean, Vincent is able to beat Levon, which I have basically never managed. Yeah, so it's uh, it's kind of a very nice feeling to see that uh, Vincent is growing so nicely. And, and and here David David is protecting a very difficult position against Magnus. And the moment when we came, we have just seen that. David has made the stunner rook a7 playing for stalemate and thanks to this was this the defense that Magnus missed or it was already a draw anyway we don't know exactly but it, it definitely was a stunning defense what a lovely idea regardless of whether it was a draw or not playing for stalemate you can't pick up the rook so forcing the rook away from the seventh rank uh, very creative stuff there Peter the live board that we have let's just go up to there uh, it, it's very rare that you get to see Magnus not winning an endgame where he's got an extra pawn. Is that about to happen? It's going to happen because this is just uh, completely dead draw. I mean, you, you just can't even imagine that, that you can win this and it will hunt him. It will definitely hunt him because, okay, he had this winning look end game and uh, not making the most out of this chance. That's, uh, that's really uncharacteristic. 
for Magnus. Yeah, you look at Magnus on the screen. He already looks quite woo big on with the way things have gone. Not impressed by his own play. Uh, and that's it. The game ends in a draw. What a mammoth task David Navarra had in front of him. And he did it. He held a very difficult pawn down end game against one of the best end game players of all time. Uh, Peter, with that, it's a wrap of round five. And this is how it went. We had four decisive results with Jan Shrestov Duda, Winston Kamer, Arjun Aragasi, all racking up wins as well as uh, Le Kuang Liam. And meanwhile, the other games ended in a draw. The one thing that stands out is how both Hans and Magnus, ahead of their big, big game coming up, failed to impress. Yeah, well, I mean, definitely there is a lot of tension there, a lot of mind games. You don't know, you, you don't feel comfortable with the situation yeah and this game is approaching yeah so i think once that game is uh, is over we we're gonna see both players uh, back to their usual strengths yeah because that that's that's really not about chess yeah there is just uh, it's it's way beyond anything that uh, usually you witness in a in a chess game and we've got about five minutes to lift off. So we've got to run a poll in our chat. We've got a very dramatic round six coming up chat, a game that we've all been waiting for with everything that's been happening in the chess world over this, over the last two weeks. Uh, we've got Magnus Carlsen taking on Hans Neiman. Magnus will be playing with the black pieces. Let's get our poll running. Will Who will win this game? Will it be Hans? Will it be Magnus? Or will this end in a draw? Uh, Peter, it is not just going to be about the chess. There's so much psychology involved. There's so much at stake. There's a score to settle between these two. Uh, all these uncomfortable feelings from what has happened in the last two weeks, it's all going to play out in the next hour. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, uh, first of all, I'm not exactly sure when Magnus's game will start against Hans because he was the last to finish and it's like, Six minutes to, to seven, and uh, I think everybody has a 10 minutes break between their games. We don't know. We, we will inform anyone. We definitely are going to stay live anyway. We won't be missing anything. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it's just so much tension and how the players will deal with the situation. I mean, uh, I'm, I'm very interested to see how things will go. The, the good thing for Hans, what I see that he's playing with the white pieces. Yes, yeah? so... It's basically in his hands to, to dictate the opening, yeah, how he wants to approach the game. So if he feels like, okay, maybe I just want to try to shut the game down against Magnus, then with White, he has the chance, maybe. On the other hand, Magnus is playing the pierce sometimes and he doesn't get give his opponent a chance to, to shut the game down. I think it's going to be an intense fight. And speaking of intense fights, Peter, uh, in chat, we've got Dane Endley mentioning Peter Lego is a legend. Do you know about his amazing queen move in the World Championship against uh, Kramnik that the engines couldn't see? Uh, look it up, chat. He went one a point ahead on the match. I think he's talking about Queen D3? Was yes, it queen definitely. D3? Yeah, Queen D3, the legendary Queen D3. Yeah. <laughs> Peter, I want to ask you a little bit. We've got time and because, uh, Dane, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, it was, of course, part of your preparation, I guess. And uh... no, not not at all. I mean, absolutely not. Yeah, I was I was almost already in time trouble in a classical game by reaching that moment. Can we have that? Can we have that board up, Peter? And can we just have that position? Because it is such a historic moment in chess. And I remember for the mar it was the marshal. And it was, uh, you know, it had this big impact. The match itself and all the theory ideas that you had had a big impact on the opening theory. Uh, you said it wasn't part of prep. You were down on the clock. When you spotted this move, did you have full confidence on it when you played Queen, B Queen D3? Yeah, well, the whole point was uh, now I'm not able to bring the game up because I did not prepare for it. But no uh, but, the, but the point was that, yeah, at, at that point, Kramnik was still kind of blitzing his opening preparation. And uh, the move Queen D3, I have seen like almost one hour before. But the, there were some other problems that, that I was concerned with. And uh, by the moment I got the chance to play Queen DC, I was so relieved because I simply understood that there, there is something wrong because I can't lose after Queen D3. Yeah? And, and basically that's the most important feeling for a chess player during a game in a very intense battle that you know that you already have perpetual check uh, in any line. And now in, in quiet situation, I can even calculate that maybe it's even checkmate. So it was a very pleasant feeling back then. And you allow this A pawn to queen and you're just winning on the king side. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, the, I have to honestly say that when I played Queen DC, I did not calculate yet everything till the very end till mate, but I have seen that I have perpetual check in every single line and it's very suspicious for him. So maybe I have even something more. Uh, but since he was blitzing, I couldn't even dream of that. It's, it's basically one of the more shocking mistakes of, uh, of opening preparation of all times on, on this level. You know, I remember reading it in, I, I, I'm sorry, I forget the book, but when I, was look, when I was going through and analyzing these games, that it's a possibility that Big Vlad's opening preparation, and he was really somebody who was known and feared for his opening preparation. I mean, his match against Gary was, uh, you know, it just completely changed theoretical ideas as we knew it. That perhaps his team did not even consider that this was a possibility, let the A-pawn advance. And as you mentioned, a big oversight by his team's preparation. Well, I mean, uh, to be fair, I think the problem was that they had too deep and too good preparation. Yeah, that, that was the problem and that, one, that backfired. Yeah, sometimes chess is so crazy and, and so magical. Yeah, that uh, basically I profited from the fact that I didn't know anything, didn't know anything about this position and he knew too much. And uh, in fact, that this whole concept that he, he invented for this game forced me to abandon the marshal. So it's actually showed that I had tremendous respect for his, his idea. So in, in retrospect, if you look at it, yeah, he did lose this tragical game, but he forced me to switch the opening. And maybe thanks to this, he finally eventually managed to, to equalize the match. So uh, things are not so just uh, white or black. Well, regardless of anything, I think Queen D3 is definitely one of the most stunning chess moves ever to be played, Peter. So thank you for giving us that gem. And I see we've also got Grandmaster Benjamin Feingold with us in chat. Uh, a big hello and shout out to him. He will be joining us uh, tomorrow for the pre-show as well. So we look forward to having you with us, Benjamin. Yeah, that's that's great. I mean, I remember Benjamin from from very early Vikings years. Yeah, when I was there in the beginning of nineties, and he was playing there. I I think we had some postmortems. I was always trying to join the postmortem with all the grandmasters, and uh, and it was so much fun. Definitely will be very special. And also, I remember that in in Ningbo, in Ningbo, in the World Team Championship two thousand eleven, uh, Ben was singing on the stage. And uh, he was singing incredibly well. I mean, I, I do remember from, was it from Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers? I think uh, th that, that song, I mean, you can ask him about it because I was just stunned. Wow. I mean, that's sensational. There's a lot of love in chat for, uh, for Ben. I think he's also just such an entertaining streamer as well now. And I had no idea that he was a singer as well. Definitely going to ask uh, Ben. I, I, I and it was Tom Petty and with song, Peter, you mentioned? Cause... Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the most famous song that they are having, suddenly I'm, I have a blackout, but I even have it in my, I, I have it in my mind, but I, I can't, uh, I can't recall. We have to, we have to ask uh, have tomorrow, to ask but, but you know, the other, oh, other Peter, incredible... He's mentioning, he's mentioning, he was singing Free Falling by... Yes, uh, Free Falling, of Petty. course, yeah, Free oh, Falling. This is the greatest, one of the greatest songs ever. It is a song that I love so much. I also it, like John Mayer's version of it, but Tom Petty's original Free Falling. Oh my God, Ben, I had no idea. Yes, no, it, it was, but to shock you even more, the other one who really impressed was Wang Yue. I mean, Wang Yue was also uh, singing something incredible. I wanted to get the recording because I would be listening, you know, every day to, to that performance, to, both from, from Ben and also from Wang Yue. It's, it's one of the best opening ceremonies ever in, in any chess tournament. Amazing stuff. Well, Peter, we see on our camera, Hans has taken his seat and let's just hope there's going to be no free falling in this game with a crucial match coming up. And we've got our poll going on. Let's see how our chat views this big game. Magnus and Hans ready to go. Hans with the white pieces. Peter Lawrence was mentioning that he expects not mainline here from, uh, uh, from Magnus, something a little bit a little offbeat. We've seen him play the perk. We've seen him play the hippo. We've seen him play the modern. What is his opening approach going to be? Yeah, well, very difficult to say. Yeah, because Hans is also uh, playing a lot of first moves. I mean, he played a lot of C4s, uh, also E4. But if I think back, I usually would think that Hans is like a D4 player. But which will be his first move? I just can't uh, can't really guess. 
it depends what kind of uh, game he yeah he plays d4 because this is his this is his main move d4 knight f6 c4 yeah definitely and what no what, what? no w what happened that's it we're gonna try and get an update on this Magnus Carlsen just resigned, got up and left, switched off his camera, and that's all we know right now. Wow. Speechless, yeah? What to say? What to say, yeah? Then the story continues, yeah? This is unprecedented. I, I, I just... I can't believe it. Did that just happen, Peter? It happened. It happened. I mean, it's definitely breaking news. I mean, D4, Knight, F6, C4, 1-0, I think, never happened in the history of chess. Magnus just refusing to play against Hans. It's, it's that moment where he plays the tournament. He, he knows Hans is going to be participating. He will play the tournament, but he's saying, I will not play the game against him. That's making a big statement. Yeah, that's a very big statement. I mean, this is... Uh, and, and also making a first move, yeah? The, the, I mean, after D4, Knight F6, not resigning or not, not coming to the game, you make a move and then you resign. Wow. Don't know what to say. And we're getting an update that actually, to be able to resign, you need to have completed the first move. So he oh, had to play Knight F6. And then he just walks off. Wow. That is it. Well, I mean, okay, this is now a big question that do we get a Magnus interview or something to, uh, from the studio? It, it would be great, of course, to, to get some, something. Yeah, it, it's clearly a statement. Yeah, we understand the silent statement. But uh, it would be so nice to also hear something. I'm not sure if we'll have an interview. We know that we had a media blackout by these two players on day one. Uh, they are obliged to do interviews in the event as participants. But Peter, we just have to wait and watch. And of course, if we hear from, e from either of these two players, we'll keep our audience updated and play the interview immediately. Uh, this is just a very strange situation. And the internet is exploding right now. Twitter is exploding right now. I can I can imagine, yeah. I mean, everybody has been looking forward to. Everybody was waiting for Magnus to say something or to do something, and basically he continues the dialogue by resigning on the spot. You know, on our pre-show, we were having this discussion with Lawrence, and I mentioned that this is so hyped up. I hope it will not be an anticlimactic, peaceful draw, and we'll actually get a big fight. But this is not the anticlimax that I was talking about. No, no, this is this is very serious. I mean, uh, this is not the rookie one Berlin or whatever. And uh, no, it's 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 not about chess. Uh, this is way way beyond. And and this is what I basically mentioned that yeah, all this kind of back and forth and and all these kind of things had already nothing to do with chess. And yeah, it's it's shocking. All right, Chad, we'll keep you updated as the situation develops, and we have more info on this. So. Peter, of course, quite a just out of words about how to understand this, especially given the first tweet, the radio silence, facing hands and then resigning on move to switching off the camera immediately. No expressions there. Of course, a preempted move by Magnus that he did not want to play this game. Uh, once again, we'll keep the situation updated. Let's move on to some chess that's actually being played currently. Wow, if you ask me, then let me bring you to Anish Giriagan's Liam, because look at this. This is exactly the monster knight that, that we are loving against the bad bishop. I mean, if you ask me, this is a strategically winning position for white and uh, definitely something that black should avoid. I mean, should never let, let it happen. It's already the second game when Liam is getting a horrible opening yesterday against Magnus uh, with the white pieces and now suddenly with black. He plays the um, open Spanish. I somehow have the feeling that if you are not a, not a born open Spanish player, you should just leave your fingers from, from this opening because it's so special. Uh, and, and he goes for this old line. 
Yeah, very odd line. Uh, takes takes a4, bishop b4, a takes b5, knight takes b5, queen a4, c5. And, and what is c5? Yeah, exactly. Because you are not, do you, do you play c5 or do you first take on d2? I, I think you, you simply take on d2 and after bishop d2, bishop d2, you kind of castle, push c5, and then you are very solid. Wow, but uh, he actually, maybe this is this is a typical, like, you play too quickly, yeah? You make a move like c5, and after knight c4, the bishop on b4 is stuck forever. I mean, th this bishop is stuck forever, and uh, white has this monster knight on c4. What happened? Castles, bishop is the knight d4. Yeah, and this is the problem, yeah, that after takes, 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 you are unable to capture with the pawn, which you would love to, opening up the bishop, because the bishop is hanging. Yeah, that's that's kind of the problem. So after queen takes d4, queen c2, a5, rook a d1, queen g4, this is a technically winning position. But after just what we have witnessed in the in the other game between Hans and, and Magnus, it's so difficult even to, to talk about finesses, right? I'm still in shock, Peter. I'm still thinking about what just happened because I've never seen anything like that from Magnus, from anyone at top level chess. And you know, Magnus, he's, uh, what came to my mind, if you remember, was his match against Ding Liren, uh, you know, where he won because Ding Liren had this big mouse slip. And then out of sportsmanship, he played that queen d2 move and sort of gave back that point in some way. Exactly. So he's, you know, he's really somebody who is a great ambassador of the game. And, and we haven't had, we haven't really had a statement from him after the storm, but what he just did it sounds like a statement to me that he still yeah. believes in what he said, 100%. Yeah, well, but he didn't say anything. Yeah, that. that... But his actions spoke louder than yes. words. You know? Yeah, exactly. No, that, that's absolutely clear. Yeah, that, that's why I mentioned also that, yeah, he, he continues the dialogue in this way. Yeah. Just unbelievable. It's really hard to concentrate on chess when uh, with this just, with this whole situation. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's try. Let's try, Peter. Let's try, yeah. Okay, let's we have try. a lovely night. We already mentioned that Anish is in total control. Uh, let's enjoy that. Uh, let, let him enjoy that. Uh, let him see... enjoy that. And let's continue with a little quick opening tour. You know what? One game that I want to look at is one of the icons, the legends of, uh, well, as they say, the old guard who's playing against the youngest player of the tournament. We've got 53-year-old 50, Vasil Ivanchuk up against the 15-year-old Christopher Yu. It really is the Generation Cup here at Julius Baer. And Peter, what do we make out of the opening? Well, first of all, I don't, I don't agree with uh, Chucky's age. I simply feel like what he's showing in this tournament, he's forever young. I mean, I just don't, don't count his years at all. And by the way, also a big Alpha Wheel fan. So yeah, that's, I, I, had to, I had to use that moment. Uh, but, uh, and here we see that, again, I was very harsh with uh, Liam playing the open Spanish because it heavily backfired. However, in this game, it seems like Christopher knows his stuff quite well. Uh, Chucky, true to his style, plays, uh, tries to surprise, counter surprise Christopher. But looking at the clock situation, it did not really seem that Chucky managed to, to, to surprise Christopher. On the other hand, okay, White is getting a playable position. And uh, as, the, as the modern theory stands, getting a playable position in, uh, in the open Spanish, it's already some kind of an achievement by itself. So the open Spanish was the opening of choice by Christopher. He's played the move Rook D8 and he's up on the clock. Uh, Peter, a lot of finesses in this opening. And let's talk a little bit about the different kind of plans that uh, Vassil, who's of course trying to create an attack here or trying to create an initiative here. Meanwhile, Black wants to push the pawns in the center. C5 is the natural follow-up that you want to make. And then you decide if you play D4, you bring the knight back to C6. Meanwhile, what are White's ideas in this position? Yeah, well, the first uh, very important moment that the reason why Black played the move Rook A D8, as you said, the pawn on D5 is hanging, and uh, there is there are there are two ways to deal with this. Yeah, to play the move Knight C4, for example, blocking the diagonal, or to take this Bishop on B3. And in order to understand the position, let me just show this strategical idea. So after takes takes, if Black plays C5, so it's the most classical way. 
Then, of course, white will take on e7. And after queen e7, we'll push b4 mm. and fight for the d4 square. And if you are okay. forced, for example, to take on b4 and we can land the knight on d4, then we exactly speak again about good knight versus bad bishop. And that's uh, that's the main strategical idea. And this is the, the, the thing that black will never let happen. Of course, exactly in this move order, I made a mistake because black would be able to play bishop g4 solving his problems. So yeah, white has to kind of uh, use a slightly different move order, but the aim is to get this position. And uh, Christopher makes sure that he doesn't give this chance for white. Yeah, he just goes, look at it. He wants to push c5 without capturing this bishop on b3. Very nice point that you can't allow the move B4 getting control of that D4 square. Black needs that flexibility in the center. C5 coming up next. We'll keep an eye out on this position. And Peter, while this is a clash of ages, there is one game which I know is super exciting is uh, Pragnananda taking up Winston Kamer. The two prodigies, the two young, super sharp talents playing against each other. And in this position, Vincent has managed to build that center. It looks like it was a king's in an attack out of the opening. Uh, Peter, maybe let's take it from the top. Yeah, it's uh, one of these uh, very sharp lines. Yeah, Prague goes for, for knight fc g3, going for the rate. Usually Vincent plays bishop g4, so I think it's the first time that he played something different. He plays this and he allows the, the kings in an attack. And then we are getting this very uncompromising position, queen c7, queen e2, b5. I think Vincent is playing a setup which I was uh, inventing in the old days, this bishop b7 move order. Bishop b7, rook fc8, queen d8. Actually, no, it's not true. You know, I, I didn't invent it. I have I have taken it from, from Lenny Dominguez because I think Lenny, my friend, was the one who first played this bishop b7 and then we talked about it and I said, wow, it makes a lot of sense. And, and ever since it's also, I mean, it used to be one of my weapons, but it's just a very complicated position. Yeah, h5, h6, knight h2, queen d8, queen d2. Peter, Peter the king's in an attack. I've really enjoyed playing it as white. It's one of those openings that you can play against every line. If you start with, in this game, it started as a ready, but let's say you want to start playing e4. You can play the kings in an attack and its ideas against Sicilian, against the French, against the Karakhan. Pretty much every opening that black has, kings in an attack can be your repertoire. And it always gives this uh, race on the king side versus the queen side always up for a very, very combative fight in this opening. And I love that these two have gone for it. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, it's razor sharp and a lot of finesse is here because yeah, Vincent is going knight f8. It's not the most traditional way. Usually one can argue that there are all kind of sacrifices looming in the air with bishop takes h6 or knight g4 and then some sacrifice on h6. Uh, Vincent moves the knight to f8. Usually people move the bishop to f8, yeah? That you, you make sure that you are protecting his pawn on h6, but probably Vincent has his own ideas. On the other hand, he has spent way more time than, than Prague. Yeah, he has already spent five minutes one of the ideas that Black has for defense in these positions, uh, exactly what you're saying, knight g4 targeting the h6 pawn, Black with knight f8 first wants to put that knight on h7 and then the bishop on f8 or a piece on g5 to try to trade off some minor pieces. Meanwhile, on the queen side, what Black wants to do is continue the advance. You want to go c4, you want to go b4, you want to go a4 uh, and try to push put pressure on the center. You can even think about making a move like d4. The pawn structure is so flexible and pretty much there are no bad moves. There's one move that white has to keep in mind to stop the play on the queen side and that is a rightly timed a3. And that often blunts black's counterplay on the queen side. I'm expecting the game to continue with knight g4, knight h7 for now, taking control of the king side first, defending the king side first, and then Vincent going for an opening up of the queen side. Yeah, or at least hoping to open up, yeah, because White is trying to close, yeah, it, it's all back and forth, yeah, all these strategical ideas, it's so complex. Computers usually enjoy the position from the black side at first, but, I mean, one shouldn't get fooled by the fact that uh, engines don't, uh, un don't appreciate enough at the beginning White's, White's play. Often uh, White plays his plan and then suddenly engine says, wow, White is clearly better. Sometimes black gets his play and the engine says that, yeah, black is almost winning. 
maybe the truth is exactly in the middle, yeah, that is some dynamic equality. If both sides play well, but there are so many finesses to pay attention to, it's going to be very exciting. I mean, uh, th this will be hell of a fight. This will be a hell of a fight. And whatever we missed out on the action from the Magnus Hans game, I think uh, this game might make up for it, at least in the chess part. Thankfully, not the drama part. Uh, Peter, we'll come back to this. Another very big matchup that we have is Levon taking uh, taking on Arjun Aragesi. There's so much history between these two players when they've played against each other. They have so much mutual respect for each other. But Arjun's always been a very difficult opponent for Lev. And many times, Arjun's taken the victory from Lev uh, in several of these events. Uh, Peter, what is the position that we have? And also, I want to bring up Arjun's tweet from uh, for, before he went on to play day two. We'll try and bring that up. Uh, but before that, Peter, can you break down the position that we have with White having this double bishop advantage, but Black having a lot of control on the d4 square as well as the weakness on d3? Exactly. It's a very complex uh, middle game. I feel like it's also somewhere around uh, dynamic equality. The point is that, uh, yeah, White does have the two bishops, but the position is semi-closed and uh, the knights are very strong. And usually when you have the advantage of two bishops, it's, it's one of the advantages that you can trade one pair of, of one bishop for something to gain some uh, strategical advantage. But here, for example, this bishop takes d4, c takes d4 will work exactly in Black's favor because then knight will get this wonderful square c5. And, uh, and the pawn on c6 blocks White's bishop on g2, yeah? So, in fact, these double pawns are now super useful. If Black's pawn, instead of being on c6, would be on d6, I would be saying that White is strategically almost winning, yeah? So, just this one little smile, uh, minor difference uh, justifies Black's play. And, and I feel like Black has nothing to worry about. Um, very interesting. Uh, let, let's just see how did this happen. Yeah, I, I'm expecting these four knights with, with e4. Yeah, bishop b4, d3. D6, bishop e2, castles, castles, h6, bishop e3, bishop g4. Yeah, this is the typical way of getting rid of the bishop, but getting access to the d4 square. It also resembles very much of some reversed anti marshals Yeah, it's uh, probably that's the reason why also Levon is playing quite a lot of these systems from white side, because uh, it feels like some kind of an anti marshal Takes, takes, bishop c5 takes and ah that's how we got to this structure okay very interesting i have never seen yeah immediately setting up this vital uh, setup with pawn on c6 making sure that whenever f5 will be played the bishop will not open up on the long diagonal takes takes f5 and we are getting this uh, fighting position fighting position and there we have it a very fighting tweet by Arjun as well fellow prodigies he has to play against teammates and Levon gonna be an exciting day and that's exactly the kind of chess that we expect from Arjun and a creative player like Lev Peter and we are not being disappointed with the middle game that we're seeing with this very unique pawn structure and piece play all right we'll come back to this uh, let's continue taking a look on some of the other boards. And I want to draw your attention to the absolute madness that is happening on the Jan Shristov Duda Boris board. Peter, what on earth is going on here? Uh, Duda down to eight and a half minutes. Boris with five minutes. Black hasn't castled yet. What is Black Spawn doing on C3? How do you evaluate this position? Wow. <laughs> I mean, I, I, have, I have no clue. I mean, somehow my feeling says that it's quite risky and dangerous for Black because, I mean, still, the, the king is in the center. This d4, e4, d5 pawn structure locks down the bishop on b7. The knight on e5 is slightly out of the game. Knight on g6 is also vulnerable. White is ready to push h5. On the other hand, I mean, White is also not yet fully developed. Yes, yeah? so there are many issues to his position. Uh, in order to understand, let's take it. It's clearly a Rossolimo with bishop b5 e6, castles knight e7, c3 e6, bishop a4. So the old classical main line, yeah, bishop c2, bishop b7, a4, knight g6, rook e1, c4, b4, takes, takes. But that's how, wow. I mean, okay, this is a very instructive way that. Actually, I think the Duda was probably very well prepared because this is not an idea that you can come up with so easily 
in a rapid game over the board to understand when you can just sacrifice the pawn on c3 that you are getting these dynamics with h4, h6, d5, bishop c5, and it's already the current position. Okay, it's, it's a razor sharp affair. What is your take, Tanya? Tell me what is your first feeling because I have zero feelings here. Um, okay, Peter, to be really honest, I am, uh, I am occupied with something that's caught our attention on Twitter. And I think we're going to try to bring this up right now and then get back to this position. All right, all right. Because there's been a lot, a lot going on here after what Magnus just just did. Uh, first, let's bring on the Maurice tweet. And he's saying, Magnus just played one move and resigned against Hans Niemann in the online Julius Beck Generation Cup. This is shocking and disturbing. No one can be happy that this is happening in the chess world. Unbelievable. 100% agree with that. Absolutely shocking. And then Tare mentioning that uh, on uh, in on Norwegian television for TV2, I think it is. And if, if I'm wrong, Tad, please correct me. Where Jan Ludwig Hammer is doing commentary. It is the Norwegian television. And he is actually criticizing Carlson for his behavior. It's completely unacceptable to lose on purpose. It's the most unsportsmanlike uh, you can do in competitive sport. And uh, mentioning that he should be sanctioned for this behavior. Wow. Oh, what to say? What to say? Um, I prefer not to say anything because, yeah, it just, uh, I mean, uh, if, if Magnus is doing it, there, there, there are definitely good reasons. Yeah, I mean, you, you mentioned yourself that, yeah, we, we know Magnus when he resigned against uh, Dingley then uh, and he got a fair play prize for it and, and so on. So something really disturbs him. But uh, yeah, unfortunately, if he's not able to talk about it, it's, uh, it's then just a very messy situation. Very messy situation. From a chess perspective, I completely, uh, I completely get what Jan Ludwig Hammer is saying. Uh, in general, when you're invited for a tournament and you're playing, it is just so unethical to throw a point to not play a game, just from the chess perspective. But we can't detach the situation from this game. It's very difficult to do that as well. It reminds me of the Gibraltar incident that happened with Hu Yifan a couple of years ago. And there was a lot of backlash when I think Hu Yifan arrived for the game. And then in a couple of moves, she, she played this very strange opening, advancing her king to the center and kind of a self-checkmate, uh, walking into a self-checkmate. And it was, again, just a very strange moment in the chess world. And it was, um, uh, yes, Tad is informing us that there was an issue about too many pairings with women players uh, in that event. So a different reason. But in general, when you throw a point like this at a chess tournament, it's unacceptable from the sports point of view. Yeah, it's kind of, uh, yeah, it, it gives uh, three... Three points, yes, yeah? three fee points uh, for the opponent. We know that uh, the players are fighting for qualification and earning three exactly. free points against Magnus, it actually uh, means means a lot. Yeah, the, this is clearly on the other hand, you know, I mean, uh, Magnus is not uh, giving these three points uh, because he, he wants to, yeah, he feels that he needs to. I mean, that, that he needs to act in a way like he does, yeah? So he's not trying to help Hans by any means to, to give him the three points. So it's a very complex uh, situation. Very complex situation. And that's exactly the point, that we've got all these players here who are fighting for the top eight spots. Beating Magnus for any of them is really, it's a very difficult, it's a very difficult opponent to play and beat. And we don't see it happen often. But uh, it's kind of not, just strange from a chess perspective, but also unfair to the other participants. I don't know what this will end in, uh, but definitely one gets the feeling that, you know, with this, well, action statement that Magnus has made, we can expect to hear more uh, in the near future, very soon actually, why he did this, because it's not something that he would do lightly. Peter, still so hard to disconnect from what just happened. Yeah, yeah. But I also feel that it's uh, not, not fair towards the other players who are, fighting and uh, we are not talking about them yeah because uh, for example here this this incredible game between Duda and, and Boris it less than I mean just 20 moves played and it's already a blitz game yeah both players done to Boris done to less than four minutes uh, Duda is just a little bit above five just shows that what an intense fight fight it is 
And still, honestly, Peter, honestly, the fact that we can still commentate on these games, I think you're being hard on us. I think it's it's amazing that we're still looking at this game with what we've just witnessed. But completely agree with you. Let's get back to the action. And you had asked me what I think about this position. Uh, the eval bar is making it easy for me to answer that question that now given what we have with the way white pieces are playing, the control in the center, Black's knight on a5 out of the game, the bishop on b7 blunted. Uh, I think it's safe to say that white is uh, white is having the upper hand here. Yeah, well, but don't don't be fooled by the evaluation bar. It's, it's just one move, I believe, from Black, to something to play like look fc8. Yeah, targeting this look on c3. White's structure is compromised. I mean, White really needs to use, in my opinion, this, this diagonal somehow to, to use this e4, e5, queen, dc, queen, h7 checkmating idea. Because if you don't use the, the initiative, then, then actually with this uh, knight on, stuck on b1, yeah, it's, uh, it can get uh, very easily even worse for White. Yeah, it's not a stable advantage. It's, it's the advantage of the momentum. Yeah, and if the momentum is lost, then, then it can very easily switch, uh, switch sides. And yeah, he Duda is back. going for d6 and he wants to push d6, e5, queen, d3 and, and go for the checkmate. Very nice. And that also explains this h5 pawn and the role it plays. So there's no more any g6 blocking that mate. So you don't really care about the bishop on b7 because you're getting to black's king faster than black ever will get to white's king. So let's say, let's make some moves here because it's so sharp. So... uh Yes, and you want to make the move e5 so that black, for example, if you start with queen d3, that gives black this additional opportunity of perhaps going e5 himself and making sure that you never open this diagonal. So let's say you go e5, it's on the board, and now queen d3 is coming in with a direct threat of mate, f5 countered immediately by Boris. Do you now go for the en passant? Because if not, the bishop on c2 is dead forever. So perhaps you have to play en passant. Yes, exactly. But if you play Ampasan, then it uh, the position gets even more sharp. Yeah, Rook takes F6. Just give me one more move, Rook AF8, and I will say that I'm just better. But it's wide to move, and you're going to continue with Queen D3 insisting on, on Queen H7 check. I will not allow you to play Queen H7 check. The only move to stop that is Rook to F5, exactly. Yeah, Rook to F5. And it's still such a complex position. I mean, the, the problem is maybe that you have Rook E4 tempo, but... I mean, even this isn't so clear because after rook e4, I will have a move like queen b6 queen. and I'm threatening some knight before tempo. I was also thinking about queen b2 with ideas of queen c1 and maybe rook h5 stuff if I get the chance to play it. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, it, uh, it might be very good for white if you can spot some incredible ideas, but uh, I mean, just playing by hand, yeah, ef6 on the board, the uh, computer agrees. So it's very concrete. White needs to be ultra concrete to keep that eval bar, uh, to, to make sense out of that eval bar evaluation that we've got. Exactly. And and how do you, yeah, Queen is on the board. So we are expecting Rook F5 and and there is something. something on the board, that... we, call, we call these moves out, Peter. Rook F5 played to uh, make sure there's no Queen H7. And now what are we missing? A Rook E4 doesn't feel like the right way simply because it's coming in your own way of the pieces. Plus this direction of Bishop on B7 eyeing the E4 square. I don't think Rook E4 would be the move here. Yeah, well, but then uh, there is some other argument of trying to develop with Knight BD2 and then set up some Rook B1 idea. But also mm -hmm. doesn't feel so convincing. It's just too slow. There could be some Knight H4, you know, if we want to insist on... Uh, on, on just uh, using the momentum, we can target this uh, rook on f5. The rook can't really move because of, of queen h7 check. But does is there knight e5? Knight e5, you knight e5 we're going to take rook e5, I'm, I'm guessing. Oh, but rook e5 is annoying. But okay, it's it's one. Yeah, I, I think it's just checkmate. Yeah, rook e5 takes, queen h7 check. Okay. King f7? King f7. The bishop on b7 protects the fc square, so it's and not yet one, over. Rook h1. Rook e1, rook h1 is made. I don't yes. see a mate. So you've yeah. got bishop. No, but you've got bishop g6. Then king, king f6. f6. Then king f6. Yeah, exactly. And That's uh, king f6. Nothing. And if you go queen g6, there's king f8 and nothing. Yeah, yeah. No, it's. Uh, I mean, first of all, I'm also not such a fan of this knight h4 because it it gives up the center. Even if after knight h4, let's say I'm I'm just sacrificing an exchange with rook f8. Even this doesn't look convincing to me at all because the black has now all kinds of ideas knight d4 i mean this knight on b1 is out of the game yeah we, we shouldn't be forgetting about this so maybe just a tranquilo knight bd2 i mean but uh, 
Aduki four was my very first thought. I'm I'm curious to see what uh, Jan Shishtov will come up with. He's done to less than two minutes. Night BD to play. Yeah, Night correct. Night BD to play. As you were mentioning, tranquilo chess here by Jan Shishtov Duda. He probably calculated all the lines that you mentioned and they're not working. Decides to bring his pieces to the game. Rook B1 is actually quite a big threat now. So a move like Rook F8, I, I don't think Black has time for it. Uh, because you simply go rook b1. Although there's queen g4 there. Where, how are you following it up after rook b1, queen g4? Exactly. Rook b1, queen g4 is, is super nasty. Uh, so maybe it's not about rook b1. It's just like connecting the pieces and then slowly. But okay, rook e f8. Yeah, it, it would be the most natural move to play rook e f8 here. And then how do we continue? Not so clear. Yes, and, and this every Asian bar is very confusing because. I just look at the position and it looks like a big mess to me and computer insists that white is almost winning. I'm confused. Very Does interesting yeah. middle game. And it's just so complex currently uh, and hard to imagine the eval bar uh, giving this big advantage to black. Anything can happen. Both players down to two minutes. So queen g4 might even just be a threat in the position. He's played the move rook f8 and Duda thinking. No, so no, he played queen b6. Ah, he played the move queen b6. Yeah, the rook, rook e f8, I was, I was tricking you. Yeah, that, that, that was my move and the, the board did not update. But uh, yeah, queen b6 was played. And by the way, breaking news, Christopher Yo has stopped Vasily Ivanchuk. And uh, Ivanchuk just resigns because he somewhere lost the, I mean, he, he blundered the pawn or he wanted to be too smart. What what happened here? And wow. Very disappointed Ivanchuk on the screen there. He is not even moving from the computer screen. Definitely a difficult uh, situation for him. But also Vassal is just so, like his emotions are just very see-through. You know, he he's not one of those players who, who hides what he's feeling, his passion for the game, his disappointment at a tough situation, his joy at a beautiful game. And uh, it's uh, one can always see the raw emotions on him. Wow, well, I think that he just blundered, yeah, because <clears throat> he allowed this bishop g4, he played queen f4, he wanted to play in the spirit, then f6 came, and he noticed some very interesting idea like e6, bishop takes e6, queen h4, going for mating ideas on h7, and you can't really protect this, but there was bishop f5. <laughs> I mean, just trading white's uh, active bishop and after that black is just clear pawn up white has no attack whatsoever it's uh no, we, are ah, getting... we are getting the man yeah. that he lost on time but no i mean it, it has nothing to do with it because he was just so fed up with everything that happened i mean he didn't mm -hmm. lose because of, of of time situation he just pawned down for nothing and uh, and okay he was not happy stopped his misery perhaps sooner. Uh, he's down a pawn, but still would have required a little bit of technique from Christopher Yu, but instead Vassal loses on time. Two big wins by the youngest player uh, in the, of the event, Christopher Yu, who so far has defeated Pragnananda and now stops Vassal's streak as well. So, Peter, quite a debut by Christopher so far. Well, uh, to be honest, when I saw him... Uh get the invitation. I saw him on the list. <clears throat> I have been uh, having uh, Christopher on my radar for quite some time. <clears throat> Pardon me. I remember him from, from Isle of Man, you know, and it was something like he was 11 years old. He was there with his dad <clears throat> and uh, they had breakfast before the last game. They, they had some breakfast. I had some breakfast. It was the only time I had breakfast because I'm usually skipping the breakfast time. I'm uh, waking up way too late for it. And Christopher was talking to his dad, explaining all the finesses of the Berlin defense, Berlin endgame. And apparently, I mean, it was clear that his father probably doesn't know how to play chess at all. He was not interested in the discussion at all. He just kept on uh, reading his newspaper and eating his breakfast. And at that moment, I understood that this kid is incredibly special. I mean, he will be a very strong player because this is exactly the character, you know, that I'm loving. Yeah, when somebody just... Uh, loves chess so much he was telling all the finesses why you you, you can't castle with, with the king on d8 you have all the plans with king c8 bishop this and king c8 b6 with a i mean all the move orders i was like wow okay this uh, we, we're gonna hear a lot from him and now uh, seeing him in this tournament i'm just super happy 
Yeah, and he has reasons to be happy as well. Very talented kid and a very, very strong prodigy from the United States. We'll see how the tournament continues, Peter. We will come back to this game, but we have to rush over to the Levon Arjun board. Levon down to a minute and in a situation that, and once again, anything can happen, but I love Black's position more uh, than what we had earlier on. And look at those rooks eyeing and opening along the G and the F file. Completely prepared for an attack. It's White's king that's under fire. The knight on D4, a very strong piece. The knight on E6, they're both fighting for the same spot, but a lot more. F4 under pressure. And once again, I think Arjun has put tremendous pressure on Levon. And Lev needs to be mega careful. Yeah, wow. I mean, okay, the position is so complex. Yeah, Black pushes G4 doesn't want to because it was so tempting to play g takes f4 but then probably he felt like his king on g8 will be shaky or was it just bishop takes f4 i mean in any case uh, arjun decided not to bother with this he goes g4 ah and after bishop g2 has knight e2 and then he eliminates this uh, bishop on c1 and then f4 falls then he's just winning wow what is the bishop is g2 the knight e2 Okay, let's say you move the queen. I don't have so many squares. Queen e yeah, queen h4 so runs into rook h7. h7. Yeah. So I don't have so I want to play queen e3 because queen f2 does g3. Yeah, but but now I just take on c1 and then the whole construction falls apart. And you're just winning a pawn by force here. Now rook c1. And yeah, you well, up... something, I mean, or you have to make some strategic uh, move that you don't want to make. Levon is down to 10 seconds. He doesn't know what to do. Bishop g2. He did not want to make this move, but he was forced to. Will we see 92 or is, is Arjun having some other thoughts? In any case, Levon is in a lot of trouble. A lot of trouble. And uh, it's been a very, very tough day for Lev, no? Because even in the previous round, he had a loss. Yeah, he just lost to Vincent, yeah. Yeah, to Vincent. And now playing against Arjun is just so difficult, no matter how much of a great chess player you are, Peter to play against this young crop of players. It's hard for even the very best players in the world. Well, we should also not forget that uh, all the players who are involved in the Singfield Cup uh, with all this marathon rapid uh, blitz, then the classical, then the Fisher random, the 960. I mean, uh, they should be exhausted, yeah? And playing four games a day and 92 on the board. Yeah, this is what I was really worried for, for Lavia Queen easily blitzed out. And now you can take on C1 or, okay, you can't take on F4 directly because it's still defended. So Knight F4 is not a possibility. Knight yeah. C1 and he goes for it. So he's going to pick up a pawn next. Yeah, and uh, probably Levon has to take Queen takes C1 or will he include some, yeah, I think he, but doesn't matter what he does. The position looks horrible. Can you try to play Queen C1 and if Queen D3 take on F5 and yeah. see? If that, that's that's probably the best, but uh, for for some reason he's heavy. He's down to three seconds. He plays it. He plays it with two seconds on the clock. Twelve now. Rook takes c1. I mean, uh, he decides to give the f4 pawn instead. You 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 told me that the young kids have nothing against playing with one second. I can I can tell you, <laughs> Levon hates it. That's for sure. Levon hates it. Not just playing on one second. He currently hates his position as well as we can see it on camera. And understandably so. Yeah. And now the big F4 question pawn. is, but what is he going to pick it up with? Will he go knight f4 or queen f4? Because you have to be careful of e5 after a move like knight f4. Yes, e5, then queen d4 is forced, but then white's bishop is opening up. Yeah, we might not want to allow that to happen. And yeah, he takes queen f4. Yeah, takes, takes. It's much more professional not to give any counter chances. And now take on D... Okay, he starts with G3. Knight into D3. Knight F2 check. Ideas always on the board next. This just looks busted. Where are you going to move with the Rook? Rook H4, rook H4. Or, or Rook or H6? Rook, H6. <laughs> rook F1. Wow. Because, Peter, after Rook H4, there was Rook H7. And that was... Can we oh just show that? Oh, my God. Really Checkmate. Quickly? Wow. What a line. What a line. Let's just show that. Rook h4 yes. or rook h6, you go rook h7, you force a trade because the rook on h4 can't be defended. And now knight e2 check wins the rook by force. So Levon was forced to play the move rook f1. Amazing stuff. Yeah, yeah, wow. I mean, okay, this case then... Uh, then I feel like definitely we're not, not going to take on h2 because this would this would ease somehow White's task. I mean, there are chances to, to defend the positions like this. So 
I think Arjun will try to keep the tension. But how does he keep the tension? Because now if you play knight e2, now you have the square rook h3 and you're defended with that bishop. So the same ideas don't work. Exactly. Yeah. Then, then you were. Of course, one could argue that you can just take on DC and then uh, put the knight on f2 with check, then slowly take the pawn on f5, and you should be winning. But uh, probably Arjun looks for a direct way, so takes, takes, and did he spot some fourth way of winning this? Be because I think you really want to have a very clear vision how you are breaking. You just don't want to fool around and then slowly win. Well, Ari Valbar still says that there is possibly a clear way. So rook f6, I like that move. You stop counterplay of f6. Uh, bishop c6, not possible anymore. A very important pawn there because bishop d5 check would be allowed otherwise. And now ah, he's going to this is it. Pawn. Bishop e4 runs into rook h6 checkmate. Yeah, this is very important. Yeah, that if white's king would be on f2, white would not be a worse probably. But yeah, the rook h6 is checkmate. So bishop a6, rook h6. Played as well, and the pin along the H file, that's what probably decides the game, and the king is coming. And then you can go into a winning king pawn ending. Simple plan. You go rook H5, rook F3, king F7. Yeah, well, or you just bring the king first, and then you go rook H5, and uh, yeah, it, it looks, looks winning. But Peter, it appears as if Arjun might have calculated this idea till the very end when he took that rook on h2. Going into this endgame, uh, he might have just seen this line. This it's And it's almost a forcing sequence of moves. Yeah, and by seeing that Levon is trying to trade the rooks, which which basically I would have said that it's a it's a sign of capitulation because it. Uh, but he wants to avoid uh, forced loss. Yeah, so he takes into account uh, a losing position, which is not designable yet. But I mean, slowly he has zero chance here. Is he going to go for king f6 now? Yeah, it, uh, king f6 would be very logical. But maybe he's also thinking about look gh5 trying to insist on the idea. But look gh5, king g2, king f6, then probably white will play bishop g4, no matter if it's good or bad, because black is entering, it also, should be winning. But yeah, king f6. Take, he can take on f5 in the starting position, but he's gone king f6 and now just go rook h5. No, he, he takes on f5 first, yeah. I thought rook h5 was also very, very forcing. Yeah, that. rook h5 and then take on h3, take on f5, and you walk with the, the king through e5, d4, c3 to b3. Was, was completely winning. And now it's all about whether he chooses to go a rook g5 or rook e5. I mean, he can, he can actually get the same endgame with rook g5 and then rook e4 takes, takes king e5. It's, but Peter, you know, I think he's going to give rook e6 check after rook g5. Ah, yes, probably, yeah. He anyway goes, yeah, he goes for it. I mean, now the trick is that black is also slowly winning, but because the position is so special, you feel like you would love to end the game right on the right away. But might not be so easy. Maybe there is no direct way of just winning because now already you can't go for the opponent game. You just have to win it slowly. Yeah? You can just go rook d6 and then you go rook b1. Yeah, you just target all these pawns and you just take it, take them. Bishop e2, rook b1, and that's it. Yeah. We, we start collecting. We start collecting and there is no counterplay for white either against black spawns. Uh, very, very impressive uh, technique there by Arjun. And once again, coming to that point that he saw this entire sequence of move before he gave up that night on F4. Uh, and once again, we see a very calm and an extremely composed Arjun just maintaining his look of absolute boredom as if it's an everyday job for him. Uh, and a very natural state of being of just outplaying a player like Levon. Just unreal stuff. Well, in general, I feel like I have quite a feeling for chess players. I have to tell you honestly that in, in Arjun's case, it lets me down. Yeah, because if I know his games and uh, then you show me the picture, I will tell you, no, no, it's no <laughs> way. I mean, okay, the guy is so sharp. He is so incredibly strong. And no, no way he is, he, this is the person, yeah, that who is just sitting there and, and apparently doesn't even put real effort into playing such good chess. Yeah, that's the incredible thing. 
uh, really incredible. I mean, I I'm amazed by his performance. He's that exception to the rule that chess imitates life. In his case, you're absolutely right that you look at him and then you look at his games and it just makes no sense. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, because he's looking for chaos. Yeah, he, he's always for these uh, very messy positions, uh, but strategically healthy. Yeah, he has a very nice uh, feeling for, for danger. He feels all this, you know, how to grab the initiative. His chess is very nice. Wow. Okay, but basically we, we can assume that he's just winning this game because there is no intrigue here. Let's let's move on to something else. Wow, uh, Duda is checkmating Boris. Yeah, that's it. Basically, okay, King Queen F3 will be played, but okay. Yeah, and then Queen C1, Queen E1 checkmate is coming against Queen F1. So checkmate. Which wow. means that we've got one more game remaining, which is Prague against Winston, and that is it. Boris resigns uh, on this one. Nothing to be done. Levon has resigned against Arjun, so a big, big win for Arjun there. And uh, the final remaining game, Prague against Winston. And how are these two, well, the young stars of the chess world doing? Well, and, and they are playing now bullet chess, yeah, because they are down to 15 seconds versus 20. Um, Peter, you know Vincent really well. What is his favorite time control? Is it classical, rapid, blitz, or bullet, like Nihal? I don't know exactly. I think he really loves uh, rapid chess. He, he loves. Yeah. Uh, but uh, now knowing that the position is so complicated, and basically I don't really see a move. One just needs to shuffle around. Probably king b7, king a7, play it as quickly as possible. Yeah, king a8 is played. He does not want to step into this knight c5 check, but just king b7, king a7 felt more natural. Just to sit and wait and uh, wait for the opponent to, to find the way to break because black can't do anything. White is super solid with the knight on b3. I mean, this, this construction, yeah, Prague is bringing the king. Okay, just king, yeah, gain some time. Yeah, very important not to gain time because you anyway can't do anything. And Peter, even if this position is equal and you know, you're shuffling around, given the clock situation, uh, to me, it still appears to be a, a position where anything can happen. And it's too soon to call out for a result or predict anything here. Yeah, definitely. I mean, okay, now I understand. Yeah, that's why Vincent moved the king to eight, that he wanted to step away from, from knight c5 check, activate the knight. I mean, not really activating, but protecting the weakness on e6. Uh, that was his main point. And now the knight on c5 is strong, but the pawn on d4 is slightly vulnerable. Now the queen takes care of it. Probably Prague is hoping or dreaming to get knight db3. But he takes on a5 and he takes on e6. So the pawns have been traded off. And if you go knight takes e6, queen e6, queen a2, white's queen will have sufficient counterplay against black's king. Yeah, it, it feels like it should be dynamic equality. But now, yeah, I mean... In that case. And I think we might see that after queen e6, queen a2, queen c6 check. We might just see a repetition. Well, but it, it's a bit scary because you might be able to win the b4 pawn and protect the knight on d2. So I'm I'm actually more for queen. Mm. Ah, bishop takes d4. Okay, uh, take this pawn if you can. But this does right. give white the tempo to go knight f3 and bring the knight onto the game. Okay, but knight f3 I'm not worried about. Yeah, we, wow, king h3. Now Vincent is in, in control, but he has very little time. Queen b5 would be natural, no? Just to put queen on b5. Seven seconds, Peter. Do not panic. 15. No, seven, seven seconds, it's a lot. Yeah, I know already. But, <laughs> but, but one second, it's, uh, that, that's too much. All right. So queen b5 played. Now the knight on d2 is a little tied down because the b pawn is running down the board as well as queen f1 check ideas. Always need to watch out for that. Although white's king will be safe on g4. But I think what is more troublesome is b3, b2, b1 coming in. Yeah, and to find the move, yeah, and, and Plug was king g4, yeah, he wants to activate, I mean, uh, he's trying to run away with his king, but it's not clear, where is he running? Vincent and B3 goes b3. On the board. b3 on the board, and with this bishop on d4, there will not be any perpetual, so queen c8 check, king c7, king a7, you give another check, the king marches up the board. Yeah, king a6. I mean, Prague clearly has some idea. I mean, queen d6 check and then queen a3 check. That's how he wants to, to fight against the b3 pawn, yeah? But queen Maybe b6, it's a draw. Queen d6, if you give the b3 pawn, it will be. Can you go king b7 here? 
Yeah, but then, okay, I just gonna give the queen e7 check. It should be fine. And now, very important that king a5 runs into queen a3 check. So Prague has set up a, maybe a draw stuff. Okay, Vincent wants to play for a win with bishop b6, but now he is giving up the b3 pawn. Yeah, queen a3 check, king b7. And how is he going to play a, a play for a win after this pawn uh, is, is swapped up? So I don't know what you take it with, actually. That's a big question. Maybe queen takes b3 is possible because after queen e2, there's knight f3. Exactly, yeah. Queen, queen b3 is fine and it should, it should be okay for, for, for white. I mean... So queen e2 check. Yeah, I, I, it's hard to imagine that white will be in any big trouble now, especially given black's exposed king. So well, okay, f knight f3, queen, queen e6 check. You can't play f5 because of queen e4 check. So it's a miracle that after king h4, you are not checkmated. Yeah, because bishop d8 would be checkmate, but it's, it's a pin. Very uh, important. Very important. And the next move, you have g4 and your king comes to safety. Exactly. Yeah, maybe, maybe Vincent has underestimated, but there was no way. I mean, otherwise, he had to agree to a draw and he wants to fight. But now Prague is, uh, Prague is escaping. And who knows? I mean, if actually White, I mean, if White uh, gets out of this mating net, then, then maybe he's slightly better. I mean, especially with this time control, he, he has everything under control. Yeah, everything is protected. It's, it's more, more pressure on Vincent, actually. Also, let's just point out that Vincent's camera is frozen. It's not, he's not just sitting like that. Yeah, but now after check also, where do you go? Yeah, because if, if king d8, then you can't uh, can't give bishop d8 checkmate anymore. Bishop like c7. Queen so no queen g7 because bishop d8 is uh, is a very problematic check. Yes, and also with, with bishop c7, uh, Vincent wants to discourage g4 because the bishop is already eyeing the f4 pawn. Knight d4. Can you now go queen f6? Six check and king d7. I really want to get out of this pin. But then you give up the light squares. Yeah, it's uh, very but unpleasant. Then why do we play some queen d3? It. He goes queen e7 because if you go queen d7, there was queen c6 anyway. Yeah, but now this is what I was worried of. I mean, this position looks horrible for black. I mean, just king h3 and queen e4. Is this. Uh... After knight b5, we have queen h1, king g4, queen d1, king f5, queen b1, check. Ah, this is the point. So white is unable to go for this line because after king f5, if he tries to run, then there is queen b1 collecting the knight uh, with a double check. Very so, nice. Yeah, maybe thanks. And knight b5 is played anyway. It. Then, it's, then it's a draw. I mean, then it's he a draw has because to now. he so has to queen... repeat, yeah. PW but Vincent goes queen c4. I mean, he doesn't want any of this. Ah, because after queen d1, there was queen f3. So yeah, it's so much tension. Yeah, queen c4, queen b2. But now he can go queen f1 and force a draw. No, no, king h2, no check yet. Yeah, but now bishop b6, suddenly also white's king is in a lot of trouble. What a game. I mean... What? so complex and still the both players are playing on second so anything can happen and after bishop b6 it does allow queen c to check yeah well i i do feel like you know both players are so famous for fighting till the very end but now and maybe not this there should be some perpetual check okay let's just point out that bishop g1 king h1 bishop f2 followed by queen g1 queen g3 is the big mating idea here so white can definitely not allow that bishop f2 king h2 queen g1 king h3 and queen g3 mate that's the big threat on the board and if you go queen c2 check which i was my first intention then after king b8 there's no check in the position yeah he goes knight d6 yeah this was the line that i was having in mind king c7 knight e8 check but then we can play king c6 it's not a direct perpetual yet can you go for knight b5 instead he goes knight e8 king knight c6 e8. King c6, and where is the and then queen c2 check? That will be prox calculation. But queen c2, king d7. And, and then, then queen f5 check, king e8, queen e6, and then you take the bishop. Hmm. Or you but start then h5 pawn is hanging after queen e2. I, I don't know. Queen c3 check played. Computer what agrees. Wait, what does he want after king d7? Ah, then queen take g7. Queen so he g7. goes from this angle, yeah. Queen g7, king e8, queen g6, and picking up that bishop on b6. Well, actually, super impressive uh, defense by, by Prague. 
I mean, can we just take a moment to appreciate that both these players are playing on seconds on the clock? Exactly. They haven't made a single inaccuracy in a position that it's so easy to blunder. But it can still happen. Yeah, Queen C4 was a very strong move also because one second Putin... for Prakaranda has made a move with one second on. The yeah, clock. for the second time. Yeah, <laughs> I, I mean, it's, it, it's probably going to be now Vincent's turn to play a couple of times with one second on the clock. Quincy, I'm I'm already getting ready for it psychologically. You know that uh, it, it's gonna happen. King H3. But now White's king survived. Yeah, I mean he 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 got out of this danger zone. Yeah, and Bishop D4, Queen G4. Now Vincent is in the trouble. I feel that yeah, Vincent is in the trouble now. And down to nine seconds, the pawn on G7 is hanging. Has Very Vincent over pushed in this game? Yeah, but maybe. All right, but he's coming in with the king. So if you go queen d7, he might want to even go king c4, king d3. Okay, or queen c6. Yeah, it's uh, uh, queen c6, knight d6, king c5, knight, knight. king c4. Wow, I mean, he did, I, I thought that he going to play queen c6. Queen c6, maybe he wants to just go bishop c5 is... No, he goes knight d6 check. All right. No, this is not very five. scary. This is not very scary. I think Vincent has blundered. Yeah, knight d6 check. And king d3 runs into queen b5 and you simply snap up the d5 pawn. Wow, so I mean, basically played with less than a second, but I mean, it, it, oh, nah, it doesn't matter because he's losing the game. Queen f5 check, king d2, queen takes d5. And he's going to go queen d3, trying to give queen f1 check. Yeah, he overpushed. Yeah, Vincent overpushed and pays a high price. Queen D3. But you can't, you can't blame him for that. The position was complicated and it didn't go his way, but it very well could have. Yeah, of course. No, it's 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 basically a lottery with, with this uh, playing 20 moves on uh, 10 seconds and fighting in a very complicated position for advantage. The, the same applied to, to Prague also. He was also pushing. Yeah, both players were pushing. Just impressive stuff. And Bida, even though other games have started, we will stick to this one till the end before we move on to the other boards. Yeah, now Knight F5, uh, computer says that this is some kind of a mistake, but why is it a mistake? I don't, because don't really get checks, it. Because you have checks, no? Queen F5? No, there's King H4. Yeah, no, I mean, he has to move the bishop. And he goes for it, Bishop F6. Yeah, takes, takes. And I mean, this three versus two is a very special one. Usually it should be kind of uh, lost, but Black's King is very active. So maybe it's there are chance Queen D6 played. And maybe Black's best bet is to just trade and get his King to the center. No, or maybe just to play King E2 now. I, I, I want to, yeah, I want White to trade on D3. I don't want to let this Knight out because if White is able to get King to F5 in the end game, then he's winning. So it, it's all about Tempi Tempi. Tempi Tempi, and now f5 knight is attacked. Queen d3, queen e6 check played. Wow, uh, but now he's letting Vincent's king closer. Yeah, with king f, these, these guys are fearless. I don't know. And king, why but king f for mistake now. Knight e3 check is maybe possible. That's why I wanted to play your king f2. And king f2 had a devious threat of queen f1 checkmate. I don't know why Vincent has chosen king f1, but now after king f2, there's knight g4. Yes, yes, no, now it's, now it's lost. Well, King G1, but wow. th this is running into mate, yeah, because now this, this knight is protecting the king. Knight G2. Knight but G2, he might want to go no, Queen No, Knight D2. G2, Queen F1, yeah, no, Knight G2, Queen F1, but Queen C6, yes, letting Queen G2 checkmate. And he has to defend it with Queen D2? Queen D2 or Queen E2, but now Queen C1 and then Knight G4, Knight, and then Queen H1. And that's it? Yeah, Queen G. Ah, yeah, yes, it. yeah, that's it. Queen G2, yeah. that's Queen G2. What yeah. a mammoth fight that was. That was an intense time scramble. And in the end, Prague is the one who goes back with the victory. What a game and what a fight by both these players. Yeah, unbelievable. I mean, this was the moment I felt like, you know, both coaches, I think Ramesh and myself, we would have just entered and stopped the clock. Draw enough, you know, we, we have seen enough. It was a great fight. But uh, yeah, they fought till the very end, plug one at the end in dramatic manner.
Very dramatic round overall, Peter. The action that we saw off the board and the action that we saw on the board. Just amazing chess played all out. Arjun against Levon. What a win that was by Arjun. A beautifully played game, not just the result, but the way it he made it look easy. And well, I have to say it almost appeared like he outplayed Levon out of that middle game. Uh, and that's not something you see every day. And then this game against Prague uh, versus Vincent going down to the wire, both players playing, I don't know how many last 20 to 30, 20, 25 moves on seconds and not blundering, but both pushing for the win. Uh, one over pushing at some point or the other. What an amazing round of chess we've had. Fighting, fighting games. And this is where we stand going into game seven. It is Arjun Eregasi at pole position. He beat Hans Neiman. Then he went on to beat Levon Aronian and currently with 15 points. And we've got two Indian youngsters, two Indian super talents right at the top. Uh, Prague at Seoul second with 13 points, followed by Hans Neiman, who, well, I don't know what to say. Did he beat Magnus? Hans won against Magnus. Magnus threw the point. Not sure how to how to term that. But at the end of it, he's got 12 points. Magnus Carlsen with 11. Vasil Janshristov do that 10. And look at this, Peter, the youngest player of the tournament who is playing in the Champions Chester for the very first time. Christopher Yu with 8 points along with Vincent and Lavon. Yes, but actually I'm already in a... Uh... Fully focused on the Magnus Carlsen and Levon Aronian game because we are seeing here some deep theoretical duel between these players. I mean, uh, let's let's take it from the start. We have missed out on, on action. Knight FC D5 G3, another rate. Levon goes for C5 Bishop G2 Knight C6, D4 E6, Castles Knight F6, and now we transpose to, to the Catalan. To the main Catalan with, with D takes C4, C5, Knight C6, Queen A4, Bishop D7, takes, and this is a very topical variation, Queen D3, C4. I think that there was a game, Oparin against Levon Aronian in, uh, in one of the Grand Prix where Oparin beat Levon in a game which basically killed all hopes for Levon to qualify for the candidates. And now he goes for the very same line, Bishop F4, H6. And Magnus goes knight c3 b4, knight b5, ultra sharp stuff, queen a5, knight d6 check, takes, takes, knight e4 comes with a tempo, hitting the bishop, bishop f4 comes back, c3, yeah, black is trying to get access to the c3 square with, with knight c3, and then queen b1, f5 played. So far, both players have blitzed out, and probably this is the moment when when the real battle starts easily breaking up the structure still barely taking seconds to make such moves in, a, in once again what is a very ultra sharp middle game that we have and levon immediately replies with shot castle uh, so clearly in the books very familiar but peter uh, let's take a look at some of the lines that can happen some concrete moves that can be played here if white takes on b4 black recaptures with the queen so that looks fine for black after a b4 queen b4 yes because okay now b takes cc would be logical and uh, i guess i'm guessing that okay guessing is not enough because one needs to calculate knight cc runs into takes takes and bishop no, d6 you double knight two, no or it doesn't change anything knight yeah it e doesn't two. change anything yeah this we will be able to to take but this is the problem that suddenly both of these pieces are hanging but the the answer is that level after e takes b4 bleeds out the move king b5, which wow. is clearly his prep, and uh, and he's just happy. Yeah, that's one hundred percent preparation talking right now. And I'm also wondering, Peter, what what is Magnus's mindset right now? Just you know, after everything, of course, it was a decision that he had taken earlier. But let's say with Navarra, he was a pawn up. He did not win that. And then what happened in the second game of the day? And now coming to play against Lev and Lev just blitzing out these moves, which also puts additional pressure on you because you feel your opponent is so well prepared. Uh, I know it's hard to say, but what do you think is going on in Magnus's mind? Well, I don't know Magnus enough. To, to be able to tell you what's going on in his mind. Uh, definitely, I think now he's, because the position is very uh, interesting, he's just focusing on this position. He, he can't have any other thoughts. 
I think that uh, maybe knowing that he has already made up his mind and, and what happens in the, in the second game against Hans uh, dis distracted him in the first game against, against David. On the other hand, it was such a nicely played game and he got this tactical rookend game that he should have converted uh, normally. And uh, okay, he just plays. But the problem is that Levon is uh, blitzing out some heavy prep. I think Magnus is ready for a fight, and also his opening choice basically showed that he he wants to fight for the maximum. But but Levon is very well prepared. Very well prepared. He's got almost seventeen minutes on the clock, and this last move, Queen B five. Uh, is, I think, what really implies that he's still in familiar territory. Peter, very interesting stuff here, and we'll definitely come back to see how Magnus handles this critical moment uh, because he's going to be thinking for a couple of moments, a couple of minutes. Let's take a look at the Adiban hand sport because Hans was on the other side of what just happened in the previous round. And let's take a look if that has had any effect on him. How's he doing out of the opening? Uh, I've got the position in front of us and also, again, a sharp middle game here. Well, I mean, it's, it's a middle game, complex middle game, but I think White has more or less everything under control and a very uncharacteristic position for Adiban. It, it feels like he's just trying to be as conservative as possible. Yeah, we, we don't see any of those fancy things from him. What happened here? It was a Bishop D2. I mean, easily castles Bishop D2 Nimso. Very popular nowadays. D5, Knight F3, B6. Hans going for the classical setup with Bishop A6, takes, takes. Queen C8, Queen B7. I mean, actually, ironically, this is a setup which uh, Magnus uh, played quite a lot himself with the black pieces. Not exactly in this move order, but in, in this type of structures. A3, Bishop D6, Rook FC1, C6, Knight A2. Kind of very interesting nice because White's problem is the bad Bishop on D2. And the black's problem is the pawn on c6. Yeah, if black's pawn would be on b7, everything would be different. But now there is a target. C5 was played, and then dc, bc, b4, breaking up the, the powerful central chain and creating a weakness. Yeah, so after rook fc, rook a b1, c takes b4, something will hit the pawn back. I mean, take the pawn back on b4, and white should be tiny bit better, but, but black is quite solid. I think one of the issues in Black's position could potentially be that knight on a6. It's really quite out of the game. And after c takes uh, b4, of course, if white doesn't recapture with the pawn, you will have the square on c5. I am slightly surprised that Adiban is taking his time because to me, the natural reaction here would be a takes b4 to kill that knight on a6. Yeah, but if you take a b4, then Black plays knight e4 immediately. And let's say you can... Oh, if you come back with the bishop, there might be rook c1 stuff. No, yeah, that's well, also, also, I mean, you might be able to now bring the knight to e6, so knight maybe heads to, to b4. Okay, after knight c7, I'm expecting you to play b5, yes? Not, not okay. giving me the chance to block it. I was thinking about knight d4 as well, but b5 also looks really great. We might be seeing it because it's on the board. A takes b4 was played. A takes b4 makes a lot of sense. You don't want to give that c5 square away to Black's Knight for activity. And knight e4, as you mentioned, a very natural move here. Uh, I like White's position. Yeah, it's it's interesting. It's dynamic. Yeah, and, and Hans goes knight c7 immediately. To be honest, my natural feeling was somehow maybe even to take with the bishop on b. I mean, I, I felt like I would like to take with a piece. On the other hand, I was not sure how exactly. So A takes b4 is... Perfectly fine. It keeps the most tension in the game. Yeah, we did before. Knight c7. All right. So this is a strategic battle. Let's take a look. What else do we have? Radek yeah. versus versus Ivanchuk. Okay. This this I have to I want to see because uh, Radek is a very nice uh, theoretician, and usually Chuki was always slightly suffering against someone who had a very deep preparation. He didn't like it to, to be faced. And that's why he likes to, to shuffle in his openings. We have also talked about this. I think Magnus uh, mentioned in some interview that Ivanchuk is, is the one who is the most uh, near characteristically to his, his style. Yes, stylistically that he's also switching openings, a lot of psychology involved against whom, which opening he plays, but he is not so happy to enter some very long, uh, complicated uh, force variations. 
And now we are seeing he plays the Cambridge Blinks against Radek. So that goes for knight d2, bishop b4, queen c2, castles, bishop e2. So a very sharp double h stuff. Castles takes, takes, e5, bishop e3, b6, a4. Yeah, black's queen on a5. That's, that's the problem of, of black's position. So he needs to pay attention. Bishop a6, look, fc1, that's the current position. And Peter, it's still in the right out of the opening phase. Rook c1 played moves like rook c8 come, come to mind, just finishing development. And there are often these wow, ideas. Of hang on, sorry, breaking news. Anish has blundered against wow. Boris. Did, did he blunder? I mean, it looks like a blunder. Bishop f is coming, but he will have bishop a6. No, it's, it's not clear at all. Sorry, bishop f3 and your rook on a8 doesn't have squares, but he first trades on uh, d8 and then plays bishop f3. Yeah, but now black can sacrifice the exchange. I think now black is perfectly fine. This so, is... uh, can we just back up? Because just everything happened really quickly, Peter. Let's yeah, back up and yeah. see what just happened. Wow, I mean, there, there was this moment. Yeah, Tadeas mentioned and I immediately jumped here and... Uh... Yeah, b4, knight e6, castles, bishop f6. Yeah, it, so it's a very complex uh, position. Look, b1, c5, apparently bc5, knight c5. And here was some stunning win by playing e5 first. Wow. I mean, e5 first instead of bishop takes e5. And then combining the ideas. Bishop takes e5. And then the key move was apparently f4. Okay, but who can think like this? Yeah, f4 and then followed by bishop f3 and you win, win exchange. My big question is that then why not bishop f3 immediately? Yes, get... exactly. That, that, that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, that bishop f3 looks good enough. Black will have to sacrifice the exchange, but uh, black has to fight for his survival then. And the current position that we have, all right, but what is the difference between the line that you just showed us and what happened? Yeah, the, the big difference was that actually he had the move c6, yeah, because now that black has already taken dc5, the bishop controls the b8 square. Oh, then, that's a very crucial point. So your rook finds an escape and you don't end up uh, with less material then. Yeah, I mean, my first instinct was anyway that black wants to sacrifice the exchange and maybe he has enough, but probably white would have been better then. But yeah, Anish just plays c6, bishop c6, rook b8, and has things under control. Okay, probably white is not worse, but definitely not better with, with the two bishops. But bishop on d5, protected by your pawn on c4, white should be able to, to, to maintain the balance here. Okay, looks pretty balanced. We'll see if Boris can grind down anything with that strong bishop on d5, eyeing f7. But it looks like this will end in a draw. Peter, let's just go back. We're just wrapping up that vassal's position. And uh, I see that we've had a couple of moves. So rook c1, rook c8 was played. And after queen b2, h6. And uh, what do we feel? What is our final evaluation of this before we move on to the next, uh, next game? Well, very difficult to give a final verdict. I mean... Black has this problem with his queen. On the other hand, white cannot really use it because knight b3 is always met by queen before and then the queen escapes. And it's more like a status quo that black wants to keep the tension with pawn on d5. My big question is, can white just give a pass? Yeah, black has just played h6. I mean, if black has played h6, why can't I just play h3, for example? It's, it's one argument. So it's still a, it's still a, it's still a long complicated game this one and I think uh, far, like you mentioned hard to give a, a verdict on who's better and who's not right now uh, but Peter actions heating up on the Lev Magnus board so let's jump to that one and Queen B5 we were very impressed with Levon's preparation to which if we just back up a little bit Magnus responded with the simple small move rook e1 but defends the e2 pawn and Levon played a5 here. Well, Levon did hesitate for three and a half minutes. It was the first thing in, in the game from his side. On the other hand, Magnus already spent like eight minutes and uh, he goes for a5. We see according to computer, it's not the best choice, but uh, practically speaking, it's a very interesting move because it puts a lot of pressure on white. You don't really, I mean, what is really your, your move? Yeah, you don't want to take on c3 because that allows knight takes c3 followed by a takes b4 and then the knight is cemented. If you take b takes a5, you are running the risk of some c takes b3, c takes b2, followed by knight c3. Of course, the line continues because you have rook a2, and then I might have to give the exchange with rook b8. 
Bishop takes b8, rook takes b8, and good luck calculating this, how this ends up um, at the end, because knight c3 is still a big threat. The queen is blocking the pawn on b2, which is a nightmare scenario. Magnus goes for it. We might be seeing it. b takes a5. Wow, that's an incredible line that you're pointing out. b takes a5. And uh, I, I think c takes b2 is perhaps the way to go. Queen b2 doesn't feel right. So... Queen B2, you don't need to take on B2. So you can just... Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, I'm, I'm pawn up, yeah? So th that's why I feel like if already Levon has played the move A5, it's clearly with the intention he wants to take CB. The only, only question that how does this end? Rook A2, Rook B8 has to be played. The pawn has to be protected. White takes the Rook. Black captures. And then we have to deal with this Knight C3 threat. And um, am I on time with A6, Knight C3? I'm not in time, probably. I, I think I'm... not. Yeah, I think not. Yeah. I don't see any tricks there. Yes. I mean, okay, it's it's such a razor sharp position. So basically, this is what both players, I, I believe, are calculating on. Or no, I don't think Magnus has any other choice. Look A to look B8. So takes, takes. And can we Has find the move C2? here? Has he made the move CB2? No, 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 not yet. Not yet. Okay. Not yet. But I mean, I'm trying to find the move for white in this position. Because Magnus clearly has something. He has 95. I think this might be super important. I mean, he has 95. But if this works, then everything what Levon has done backfires. The, okay, the point five. being that if you play knight c3, now I can just take on b2 at the end of the day, the bishop on d7 is hanging. And if you take the knight, then I take the e4 knight. Yeah, that's the, that's the key difference. And I keep the exchange. I mean, even now, okay, after knight c4, you've got bishop d3. I already have bishop d3. I'm, I'm very happy. But uh, yeah, Levon probably to his horror, he realized that something went wrong and he, he changes or was g5 his intention. I can't really believe that you you play a5, b takes a5, and then with, with the intention of going g5. But who knows? Well, also, completely... let's not forget that Levon has lost two consecutive games. Yeah, so yeah. We, we don't know exactly in which mindset he is. Definitely, he was very happy using prep, but no. uh, the, the game is on. No, and not very pleasant losses either. The game against Winston, as well as against Arjun, very difficult games uh, from start to finish for Lev. So G5 played, uh, not going for C takes B2. All right, so there's a direct threat on the bishop, Peter. Let's take a, it doesn't really have those many squares. Where are you going to go, bishop E5, or will you dare go bishop C1? Yeah, well, bishop C1 also crossed my mind, yeah, because the position is so special, yeah, that um, bringing the bishop back to C1 might be interesting. So there are so many ideas on the board. C2 comes to mind. Uh, so that queen C2, knight D4 is there. But maybe after C2, you just go queen A2. No, but maybe I can also just take, yeah? Because, okay, C2, queen takes C2. If knight D4, I have knight takes D4. Oh, yeah, my queen is hanging. That's right. Yeah, but Magnus says, you know what? I don't want to, to give this wow. initiative. Let me use the momentum. I Let me sacrifice. Yeah, BC takes, takes. And he relies on his, his pawns. Oh my goodness. So G takes F4, what do you want? Your C3 pawn is hanging as well. Well, what I want, I have no idea. But what Magnus wants is look B7. <laughs> he answered just on time. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> Save me. But, but I also had look B7 on, on my radar. The only problem is that I did not see the follow-up yet. Yeah, for example, look F7 followed by bishop E8 is just very messy for, for my That's standards. At some point, you'll have to play a6. Yeah, you will have to. But do you recapture an f4 first or not? Do, do we care about the pawn on c3 or not? Many questions. Many questions. And Peter, with all the excitement in this matchup, completely forgot another a fire pairing that we have between uh, Arjun and Pragnananda. Should we just quickly get an update on that board and then jump straight back here? Yeah, wow. I mean, I think Prague is very happy with the black pieces. He controls the clock. He has a very comfortable position. The big question is, 
I mean, he has just played this incredibly tense game against uh, against Vincent. Yeah, how much uh, energy did it take from him? Yeah, that's very important. One should not not uh, forget and underestimate this kind of things. Yeah, they just had this incredible intense time scramble with with 10 seconds on the clock for like 25 or 30 moves and uh, just to calm down and being able to to focus and start a new game immediately with full focus very big challenge but if someone then then Prague has already shown that he's very much capable of handling this situation also in such a situation when you've had this long strenuous game but you are the one who manages to win at the end there is this positive energy that comes out of it. It's definitely, I think, Vincent, uh, we're going to check out his game next, will be harder for him because it was such a big fight, intense fight. But at the end, he lost the game. And that's always way harder to deal with. And uh, to, you know, let that loss be behind him and to go for the next game. I think for Prague, it's more of the adrenaline, which might work in his favor. Yeah, exactly. He already has the three points in his bag. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's huge. Yeah, Especially with this three three-point system, yeah, any game which was very hard for them, it was more like it was draw-ish, I mean, very intense, but but closer to draw, then it just gives you so much extra points. And talking about this, yeah, then let's check out uh, in, in Vincent's situation. And and yeah, he's, uh, he's probably faced with some great prep by Sadic, yeah, because Sadic has blitzed out all his moves. Yeah, this is some kind of a nightmare scenario for Vincent after losing that marathon dramatic game. Exactly. And this is such a tough situation to be in because, again, it just comes down more than how long you've played, what the fight has been, what has been the end result of it. With the short turnaround time between games, it's very hard to deal with if you've been on the receiving end of the previous game. And I think that's what we're seeing here, seven and a half minutes on the clock and still pretty much nothing has been traded off a very complex game this is going to be a tough uh, fight for Vincent and it will be very impressive if he's able to keep things under control here yeah well basically he's he's fighting for his life because uh, he's not playing against his opponent he's also playing against his preparation and he's under pressure so I mean knowing what happened in the previous game on the other hand after takes takes d5 he's signaling that he has given up on the ambition of of being better he just wants to stabilize the position and stabilize his mind peter as well so it makes a lot of sense you know in such a situation you just uh hope and want a kind of a a game that just makes you calm that just makes you calmer and forget what has just happened so understandable decision to go d5 and not go for anything too complicated yeah well he also didn't have a choice yeah because d4 pawn was hanging and uh, that uh, this is a very special line. I mean, if you just very quickly look, uh, how did this happen? It's it's a G3 uh, Grunfeld finally G3 C6, and Vincent played this very aggressive line A4, which he already used in some of his games. So I believe that Ivan was clearly prepared. Played Bishop E6, Knight C3 takes. Yeah, you see that Vincent is playing sacrifices the pawn, and usually it's very interesting. But if you open and look at this, all this 96, night before, bishop e6, 98 was blitzed out. I mean, everything so incredibly precise. Knight g5, look d8, and then takes, takes d5. Takes, takes, knight d4. Yeah, this is the this is the question that if white has to take on d4, and probably he needs to, yeah, because queen takes c4, rook c8 is trapping the queen. I, I think I have already calculated this line. White's queen is trapped. Oh, that's a stunning queen trap in a relatively open position, center yes, of the yes. board, and there are no squares. So you can't go queen c4. Yeah, you can't go. And and only heavy-heartedly you are giving up your dark squared bishop. Yeah, because this is this is the best piece. On the other hand, you can't play a move like queen d2 because black will be able to jump knight d3 and, okay, he's pawn up and everything. So probably white needs to take on d4 and, yeah, he goes for it. Takes, takes, queen takes c4. And it should be some kind of a dynamic balance, but black clearly has uh, everything under control. All right, we will come back to this. Um, I I would think that this one, uh, it looks like it should be fine for white, at least to my eyes, but I know what you mean with that uh, dark squared bishop basically being stronger than white's bishop. We'll see if it's enough or not, Peter. Let's head back to the Magnus Levon board because that's really where the fire is. But before that, just a quick question. The hands game, is that ending in a draw? 
Well, it's uh, actually becoming quite, I mean, he's pulling up now. Yeah, he just, I mean. Yeah, just... Hans, Hans is a pawn up. I mean, just very quickly so that what we are talking about, maybe white has good drawing chances, but yeah, black is the one pushing. Uh, but the big question is, what about the, the Magnus Carlsen level Naronian game? Because this is an incredible clash of, of titans. And, and I also and I up. also feel that the game's quality is just uh, incredibly stunning. I mean, this is this is some uh, ultra high level chess. Peter, let's take it from where we left last. As you're mentioning, it's ultra high level chess, so we want you to break down every move. Yeah, so Magnus has seen that he can sacrifice the piece and get some position where probably he, he feels like he's risk-free. I mean, this might be uh, piece done. He has such a nice structure and so many pawns for the sacrifice piece that he's not really risking anything. He can afford to waste a move for easily just making sure that he stabilized the position. The pawn on e2 was hanging. Levon jumps back with the knight to d5, a6, and the pawn is pushed. And after rook f7, knight e5, that was one of the key ideas of, uh, of Magnus. Knight e5 takes, takes on, on d5, eliminating this very nice knight and destroying black spawn structure. So if, if white would have captured on, on e5 first, then black plays bishop c6, and black will have a wonderful bishop on the long diagonal, keeping an eye on the a6 pawn. But the big difference is that now that white was able to take on d5 first, after ed5, f takes e5, if black will have to play bishop c6, this bishop is gonna be dead, yeah? I mean, it will cover the a8 square, but White will be able probably just to bring his king slowly. I mean, there is a weakness on f5 and then combining pressure on the, with, with the a pawn and the activity and the vulnerable pawns. I think uh, Magnus will uh, show us some masterclass here. This is just amazing stuff, no? He's sacrificed this piece. He's down a bishop, but he's the one who's pushing with that a pawn. This just shows some other otherworldly understanding in this game, giving that bishop on f4. Uh, I think, Peter, mere mortals like myself, I would not have even imagined this sacrifice to be a possibility. Well, this is, uh, I, I told you, yeah, it's it's super class. Yeah, this is what we are witnessing here. This peace sacrifice also not, uh, you know, not being carried away by the fact that Levon blitzes out his prep. Yeah, Magnus took time, find this look, fe one small move. And after e5, immediately jumped on his chance, sacrificed this piece, and uh, and he's in the driver's seat because yeah, Levon goes rook a8. He doesn't want to compromise his bishop. He feels that he has so many weak pawns that he wants to somehow activate. But also I believe rook b7 was a threat, and rook into a6 was a threat. Yeah, so but Magnus will just play a7 so that he has, for example, a rook a6 idea in the future. That's why Levon wants to go bishop b5. Exactly, it's clear. But I mean, because if White's king is coming to f4. And then black's position is falling apart. Black might be even in some tsuk swung. So um, you have to go bishop e2 and then you go king g3. Yeah, bishop e2 does me that does me nothing. Yeah, you've got king g3, king f4 as well. Exactly. I think Levon in a lot of trouble. Yeah. And uh, let's just make some moves to understand this compensation. Let's say bishop d3. Uh, or okay, king e6. I, yeah, king I, e6. I, yeah, okay, king e6, king g3. No, king f3, maybe. Yeah, not to give rook g8 check opportunity i just I play know. king f3 ah, next Peter, maybe king that's f4. a great idea can i play bishop e2 king g3 rook g8 king f4 king e6 queens and rook g4 mate maybe it's yeah but i'm gonna play f3 at the end of the day yeah can we at least show this brilliant yeah idea? yeah yeah. i i have already calculated this back then when we talked about first because yeah, it's just impossible Peter. yeah first of all i mean yeah rook, rook g4 runs into king takes f5 and there is no mate because the rook is hanging so bishop dc does nothing and after king e6 we also simply go f3, stopping rook g4 checkmate just to illustrate this line. Yeah, Peter, eight, are you eight. sure? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Rook g yeah, let's just show this. And let's just back up for a moment. Uh, oh, just one more move. We have the live board with us. So we just quickly, after rook g4 check, king f5. Can I not go rook g5, rook g4 draw? I just found a draw. I just yes. found a draw. Okay, yes. Okay, congratulations. <laughs> you, you, you find the draw. Which means that after bishop e2, I just start with f3. So I just say that I don't care. But that was that was a nice draw I found, Peter. That I, was I, a nice draw. Yeah, I was paying attention to mate, but but you came up with a perpetual check. Yeah, very nice. 
That, that was nice. Yeah, of course, Magnus will play F3 and then get his king to F4 and, and then he slowly wins. That's why Levon immediately sacrifices the pawn. Yeah, he pushed F4, sacrifices another pawn. It's already now four pawns for the piece in order to set up, trying to set up some blockade with king g6, king f5. But uh, this will not work because white will play king f3. He will be even able to put king on e3. And then eventually there will be some rook f6 checkmate uh, motive as well. I don't believe that black can uh, survive this. All right, but what is... Let's say that black maintains this bishop so that you don't have rook a6. Are you just going to march with your king? Yeah, you go king e3, king d2, king c3, king b4, king c5, king b6. No, I thought that I have a very clear way. Like uh, if you play king f5, which I'm assuming, yeah, then uh, I might have, I mean, rook b1, bishop moves rook b6, and then setting rook f6. The no, only I'm, not going to, I'm not going to put my king on f5. I, I was oh. thinking like, how are you winning if I just maintain my bishop here and not put my king in a mating attack? Ah, no, okay, but sorry, you have pushed, I mean, not you, but Levon pushed f4, so he wants to come king f5, he played king f5, and actually I thought like maybe it's important for me even to put the pawn on h3, because at some point when we are talking about this rook b1, bishop d3, for example, rook b6, bishop e4 check, king e3, rook takes a7, then after rook f6 check, you still have king g4, yeah, that's my, I feel like, okay, putting the pawn on h3 would be nice, but Magnus already goes rook b1, so he probably calculated that this, this wins anyway. But how does this win anyway? Because of this, uh, I mean, a7 pawn, you definitely don't want to give. So let's Yeah, say but you... after bishop d3, he just protects with rook b7. That's it, finish. Game and over. Bishop, yeah, and bishop e4, just king e3. Yeah. I mean, it's four pawns plus a terrible rook and, and, and everything. Wow, Magnus, Magnus wins a fantastic game. Just very nice. This is what we want to see yeah, from, from Magnus. Magnus just doing Magnus things right now. This is just amazing stuff. I mean, this, this is a masterpiece for the ages. Yeah, definitely. And, and played after that game, which was not played in the previous run. Yeah, I mean, imagine now the frustration of, of Levon also, yeah? That, yeah. It's it's tough. Yeah, now he goes bishop a4. Okay, this is... So he wants to give a check from d1. If you play rook b6, threatening rook f6 mate. Yeah, this... but it's, it's just prolonging the battle. I mean, okay, it's just it's, it's hopelessly lost. Yeah, I mean, white is up the material and has the winning position. Well, he's going to go rook b7 to defend that pawn. And he's done it. Bishop d1, king e3. Yeah, and, and okay, how do you stop? Because if you run away with the king, then actually white will have two connected pass pawns marching on uh, becoming new queens. So yeah, this is, this is hopeless. What a fantastic game by Magnus. Just amazing. And actually, it's been a really rough day on Lev. He, if he it's loses the third, this one, It's the third loss yeah. now. Yeah. It would be the third loss if this uh, if he doesn't manage to survive this. And looking at the eval bar, looking at Lev's face, looking at the position, it looks like it's not going to be a position he's going to be able to hold. Yeah, not at all. No, this is this is completely busted. All right, we uh, Peter. Do you wanna do you wanna quickly jump over to another board and then come back to this? Yeah, I think that we can we can jump because okay, we we already acknowledged that Magnus played a wonderful game. But he's he's winning. Let's take a look at Arjun versus uh, Prague because it's also so important. Also, a lot of prestige at stake. I also, also don't know. Do do you know their uh, individual scores? I mean, how do they play against each other? I am not sure, but maybe we can find out. Uh, a chat can inform us. Chat, if you can look this up, what is their head-to-head uh, -head score? And perhaps Tad can give us some information as well. Meanwhile, just an update that Adiban Hans Neiman has ended in a draw. And uh, But I do know that these two are, of course, they're really good friends. And, uh, you know, often they, they work together. They've played several times. They know each other extremely well. So it's always interesting when those dynamics come into play. When you play somebody you have such good relationships with off the board. Yeah, and it would be probably even much more important to know the internal score between these two players than, <laughs> than because I, I don't remember that. I can't recall that they faced each other so many times in, in tournaments. But uh, as you said, probably they have played hundreds of blitz games against each other. So there is a special atmosphere be between them. 
but we know nothing about this. What's also very unique is that they're very good friends, but it's also there's a lot of healthy competition between these two. I think when you have one player who's performing really well, it kind of motivates every other player, every other youngster around. So very often, you know, when Arjun has a great performance, it it it's an extra determination and motivation for Gukesh, for Nehal, for Pragnananda to do the same. And just, it works it works vice versa. So uh, despite being really good friends, there's also a, a, a sense of very good and, uh, you know, an encouraging sense of competition between these uh, youngsters from India. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I also know that uh, they also have very positive influence on Vincent, yeah, because simply by by these players improving and marching forward, that, that also encourages Vincent, yeah, that, okay, come on, if they can do it, I, I should also be able to, yeah, and, and it's always wonderful. I think it, it's also connected with Abdul Satarov as well. I mean, all these, all these guys, they are more or less the same age, they are motivating, they are pushing each other for, for more and more. I think Gukesh had this wonderful interview in New Inches where he also explained, yeah, that he, he thinks that this is very important for his, his generation. And then suddenly somebody was asking, but why people are not mentioning uh, Firuza as, uh, as, as great talent? Well, first of all, because Firuza is not a great talent anymore. He's yeah. one of the very best players in the world. Yeah, he has just won the, won the Singfield Cup, crushed everyone there. So simply we don't think about him anymore as a talent. He's already a ready ready player to fight for the crown at this moment. 100% agree. I think uh, very often we don't see Ali Reza put in the same group of um, Abdul Satara, Vincent, Prague, Nehal, Gukesh, Arjun, because of this very reason that it's not a, it's not a talent or a potential that's yet to be realized. You know, he, he's already there. He's already with the very best. He was world number two just a couple of months back. Exactly. He reached 2,800. He has already played his first candidates, uh, wins the Grand Chess Tour. I mean, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, usually, if, if you just achieve this all your lifetime, you feel like, okay, that's already sensational. Yeah, but he's only it's, 19. It's already, it's already an illustrious career. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And now, okay, back to, back to Magnus's game, because, yeah, Levon is putting up heroic defense. He's somehow also trying to create some kind of a counterplay with his king on, on the H file. And Magnus says, you know what? Where are you running, my friend? You, you are thinking about eventually hitting my pawn and then making good use of your H pawn. You will have none of it. Rook protects the pawn, gets ready in our level, switches back with, with king g6. But this is now clear that it's, it's completely hopeless. And this is the plan that I was talking about, Peter, that if Black keeps, uh, if Black doesn't do anything and just holds on, then White's King simply marches to the A pawn and wins the game. You don't, he might not, I don't think he'll even bother picking the D5 pawn up, giving any activity, just goes King B6. And uh, now... Uh, yeah, he want wants to, to take on C8 and go King B7, and B7, yeah. And the E5 pawn will eventually decide the game. Exactly, yeah. The, the, the protected pass pawn, yeah, the famous protected pass pawn. King F C rook takes C8, takes King B7, followed by A8, and we are queening the E pawn. Beautiful. This is beautiful. I mean, whatever our opinions and uh, however we might perceive what happened in the previous round and Magnus's decision to not play that round, this is perhaps been the game of the tournament so far. From every point of view, from, well, the way the opening went, facing a very, very well-prepared player, coming up with this sacrifice over the board. It was clear that Magnus, for him, it was unfamiliar territory out of the opening. And taking this decision and going for it, just a class game start to finish. Yeah, this is the, this is the classical moment when one can say that, uh, that, the, that the game spoke for itself, yeah, because uh, really it, it was wonderful. Levon still, but okay, no, I mean, the e is the going, yeah, Levon designs. That's it. What a game. And, I, and I, I feel that it was a very important round for Magnus because he's aware that a decision like the one he took in the previous round will polarize people, will make people feel that what he's doing is not right till, of course, he comes out with a, with a follow-up statement or what the intention was behind what just happened. But this round just proves the kind of player, the kind of world champion that he is. The chess that we just saw just amazing stuff. For me, Peter, this has definitely been the best game of the event so far. Yeah, absolutely. It, it was super high class. 
<clears throat> and uh, also very important because let's not forget, yeah, players are fighting to qualify for the knockout stages and by giving away uh, three free points. I mean, uh, Magnus was jeopardizing his own chances of qualifying. Yeah, so we shouldn't be forgetting it. And yeah. after winning this game, now Magnus is on on the right track. On the other hand, if if Levon would have beaten him, for example, then uh, Magnus would have been a, in a lot of trouble. All right, Peter. Can we uh, go over to the Wojtasek Vassil game because fire on the board right now. Take a look at the position. Wow, and Radek down to fourteen seconds, and also Chuki down to twenty-two. Okay, this is uh, this is very uh, intense. F five protecting the G four pawn, making sure that you can't really sacrifice. I'm not sure how experienced Radek is with this little time. I mean, rookie sleep probably should be played. One second, he needs to he needs to make. Okay, he made a move on a second. It's just incredible when this happens. <laughs> no matter how many times it happens, you just can't get used to it. Yeah, and wow, Bishop E8 a blunder apparently according to computer. But why is it? Because rookie C is so natural. A ah, queen G5 and then rookie three. That's it. Chucky blunders. Oh, and he just realized it himself. Oh my goodness, rookie three, rookie seven will come in with a check and a mating attack on Black's King. Yeah, that's it. I that mean, is queen eight six or queen f6 check follows, and that is game over. Well, I mean, yeah, rook takes e7, king f8. Okay, now you can just move the rook, yeah, because uh, there is just no check. no check. Just go rook yeah. a7 or rook d7, and then the queen comes on to d8. Yeah. You can't go queen f6 because there's a queen on d4. Yeah, rook d7. And it's checkmate in the next move. Wow, and, and you see, this is exactly, Radek played with one second, then probably Chuki got carried away, yeah, that he thought like, wow, what's it? And now yep. queen d8 next move is just checkmate. Bishop e8, queen takes e8. This is game over. What a turnaround on seconds, Peter. And look at the disappointment. It's just, it's heartbreaking to see it. Yeah, it's uh, it's very tough. Yeah, but this is exactly, you know, I, I hate when my opponent plays uh, a move with one second because I feel like my heart is uh, is jumping out and I lose concentration. I, I want to give him one extra minute. Let me stay calm. Let me be able to, to be focused on the game. And and I feel like Chucky blundered because of this. If, if Radek would have played with five seconds on the clock, this blunder by uh, Vasil would have never happened. And it, what was the evaluation of that position at that moment when bishop e8 was played? Right. Well, about it, it it was a very complex position. Yeah, after f5, I was already here stating that rook e3 is, is kind of maybe the move. Yeah, I was because you can't take on f4 rook e7. But after rook e3, clearly Ivanchuk wanted to play queen f6, and he has everything under control. Mm -hmm. And what he missed suddenly that after rook d4, this diagonal opened up. Yeah, I mean, he did not miss it because he played bishop e8, bishop g6. Transferring the bishop there, he should have probably just moved the queen back to f6. Stability and, and the game goes on its razor sharp position. It was somewhere like 0-0. Zero, zero. So, I mean, computer was showing equality. But after bishop e8 suddenly checked, bishop g6, rook e3, decided the game on the spot. What a big miss. And it's just... Uh, yeah, it, it reminds me of what happened against Prague. You know, a beautifully played game. You're better throughout, and then in well, when you're on seconds, just something drastic happens. Uh, but hopefully, in the last round, we will have well, Vassil would have uh, would have forgotten about this, and we'll see a good game from him. Let's go back to the live action, Peter. Arjun against Prague is still on. Prague's a pawn is down the board on a3. How dangerous is this pawn? To me, it looks like if anyone's pushing, it has got to be black, and it all comes down to a3. Yeah, it, it looks that black is better. The, the big question is, do you have enough to win this game? Yeah, because after the white has a very strong knight on c5, the knight on b6 is eyeing the d5 square, but but with the queen on b on a7 and rook on a8, protecting the a3 pawn, it's not clear that how you can make progress. Maybe white has maybe white has things under control. He should be maybe able to hold this. Yeah, and by the way, I, I got some message from Tadeas uh, claiming that, yeah, uh, Arjun and uh, Prague has only played three games, so, three official games, and uh, both of them won each each one of their games, and uh, and one game was a draw, so 50% there. And maybe that status quo will remain, because I feel that this will most probably end in a draw. 
and two minutes to Arjun, five minutes to uh, two minutes to Prague and five minutes to Arjun. So we have a little bit of time to look at the other live game. Let's take a look at Winston versus Ivan. If either of the players have made any progress. Yeah, in fact, these are the, the two games which are still in progress because they were the ones who, who started the, the latest, yeah? Because, because of that uh, very long game between Prague and, and Vincent before. Yeah, now Queen FC E6 played and uh, putting pressure on the D5 pawn. Vincent down to a minute. He needs to make up his mind. How is he planning to react to this? Well, you can't take on e6. You can't push the pawn. And right now... Yeah, it is you can just play rook cd1. Yeah, it's kind of... I mean, after ed5, knight d5, it looks like we might trade everything and it should be a very drawish position. But you're still not being able to take on e6. Can, can black actually try to pump up the pressure on this d5 pawn somehow? Yeah, that's a big question. Yeah, that's how can you do it or do you have a good way to do it? Not being able to see a good way to do it. Yeah, because I also have queen, yeah, b6 played, yeah, trying to prot anyway, the pawn belongs to b6, protecting the e5 pawn, even if you just take on d5 next. And now you could just defend your rook, no, with queen e2 perhaps, and just, uh, but then knight d5, yeah, maybe just queen e2 here. Yeah, Good but pressure. then also the question that can actually black go the move, play the move e5, yeah, it's... Uh, Probably that's the reason why Vincent is also trying to have his queen on f3 in order to discourage e5, because e5 is some move that, especially in time trouble, it would be very unpleasant to face. All right, so still a lot of venom in the position. Yes, yes, and very unpleasant to play with little time on the clock. Vincent down to 18 seconds. He needs to find a good reaction. You're just so tempted to try and trade off everything. And for that, it's really important to defend that rook on d2. He goes queen e3. So Peter, similar ideas. He wants to take on e6 and your move e5. Is that still possible? Yes, but uh, now the, the queen on e3 is better because it keeps an eye on the f4 pawn. Big update. Arjun is having a tough time currently on the Prague board, Peter. We've got to run over to that because look at this. The knight on e4 was pinned. f3, the only way to save it. He's managed to advance the pawn on a2. With f3, white has created weaknesses along his own king. Immediately, Prague replaces the queen on a6 uh, with the idea of going queen e2. King h3 against that threat. But this is definitely big progress for black. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, forcing white to weaken the, the structure with, with f3. It's huge and, uh, okay, what is happening? So knight c4 is met by knight c5. That's the only reason why black is not winning on, I mean, because knight c4 looks very tempting, but yeah, knight c5. But then you still have queen ch check, but then you move back with, with the king, yeah. So it's not, not, not clear. Why is, why is it so bad after all? I'm not sure. I, I don't think there's anything immediately happening in the position. You're, you're pointing out knight c4, knight c5. Okay, I mean, uh, the, the answer is yes. The rook on a1 is terrible and black has a pawn on a2. So yeah, that, that's why it looks like uh, black is almost about to win, but not so easy. Is white threatening to play knight c3 and pick up the a2 pawn? Is that a legit threat in the that's, position? That's uh, that's the idea of this whole knight e4 operation that, that Arjun started, yeah? So he calculated this line. He probably didn't see a way why it, it does not work. And, and just like us, we also don't know why it's not working. Yeah, and, and Prague done to a minute. Yeah, he's done to a minute. What did he play? Uh, he, just, he just repeated to gain some time, okay? And no, he's, he's not okay. repeating at all. No, he played queen c8 what? check, g4, queen, g4, queen a6. So he's provoked the move g4 and just basically passed the ball to Arjun. That make your move here. Wow, okay. Tadeas, you see how the human brain works. Yeah, knight c4 was the first move that I, I saw. And I'm pretty sure Prague was also thinking about this, that knight c5, queen c8 check, king moves back. And what is the benefit now? The knight is hanging and the pawn. And then computer says, you know what? Rook b8, just forget about the pawn. Forget about the knight. You will checkmate the opponent. Rook b2 check. King moves away. And queen h3 wins the game. This is what the computer does to the players. Yeah? And, and th th that's why you, you can't fight against a computer. But it's so hard to find this. I mean, to find this idea of going knight c4 and then allowing knight c5 and then rook b8 at the end, you can't fault uh, Pragnananda for not finding No, no not at all. Yeah. It's, it's just that 
if suddenly you have you have computer assistant for just one second, then you win any of these positions instantly. Yeah, that's uh, that's kind of the the danger always. All right, d5 played. So the pawn is advancing. Arjun also wants to go d6 next. And uh, what is the move? Knight d7 comes to mind. So no knight c5. But I don't know where my knight is headed after knight d7. Knight d7, rook b8 ideas. A2 is hanging. Not clear at all. Yeah, well, wise problem, of course, is that knight c3 can never be played probably because of some queen d3 and hitting the f3 I, pawn. Yeah, that's, I, that's what Prague probably, why he provoked this g4. And now knight c4 played. So now what happens after knight c5? What uh, is queen he... f6. Yeah, that's that's a human way of uh, of dealing with the, with the problem, yeah? Oh, nice. And then your rook on a1 suddenly is hanging. Yeah, but I'm not... Is, is it winning? Probably it's winning. Yeah, knight c5, queen f6. Rook takes a2. Then we just take... take Queen takes f3, check. King h2, and then knight e3 should win the game. There is no perpetual check. So, yeah, there are all kinds of dangers. Luckily for Arjun, at this moment, he still has time on the clock. Very important. He goes knight c3. He goes knight c3. And can he still anyway go queen f6 now? But maybe queen f6, you just go queen c4. Exactly. Now the rook is not, uh, not hanging. The rook is not hanging and queen f3 check doesn't get you anywhere. So no queen f6. Knight c3 has a big threat of rook takes a2. And there's no queen d3 anymore. So how are you actually now defending this pawn? Yeah, knight, knight d2. That was the way. Okay, queen takes a2. I mean, okay, now finally black has, because you, you can't keep the queens. Yeah, you have to take and take on f3. And this now it's white who is symbolically better, but okay, black should hold it. With the king on g8 being able to fight against the d pawn, I don't think this will be anything. And you just go, what, knight d4 here? Well, I, yeah, you, you, yeah he goes knight g5. He wants to... Probably he wants to have g6. Yeah, he wants to break and then start changing as many pawns as possible. Okay, also bringing the king first. Bringing the king always makes sense. And now you can go king e7. I mean, the, the, the line instead of knight g5, if, if black would have played knight e5, king f4, f6, it's dangerous because then you might never be able to break with g6. Yeah, that's what Prague wants to make sure that he will always have this uh, opportunity to, to trade the pieces and then eventually also sacrifice his knight for the last pawn. But that's always a very huge uh, drawish margin. All right, Peter, now that this dust has pretty much settled on this one and it's going to end in a draw soon, the Vincent game is still pretty exciting. Do you want to jump over to that one? Yeah, it's super exciting because I think Vincent has very little time. Yeah, he has, as usual, 15 seconds on the clock. On the other hand, with knight on b5, pawn on d6, he doesn't seem to be risking anything. But black is in time to make a draw. Rook takes c5, bishop b2. Now the idea is bishop e5 check followed by bishop takes d6. I don't really believe that any sides have chances to, to win this game. King f4, yeah, bishop e5 check, king e4, bishop takes d6, and then basically... Rook e5, there's rook e5. Ah, yes, sorry, pardon me, yes, pardon me. I mean, I already see everything being traded and then the draw and I lost uh, concentration already. I mean, white can't improve the... I mean, th that's the problem, that the knight can never move then the pawn on d6 is hanging. Bishop g7, bishop f8 is played. Nice. So you just target the d6 pawn and as you mentioned, no knight c7 check because there's king d6, king e4 and now he's going to go bishop f8. Yeah, then rook e5, then rook e5 check followed by king d5. That could be actually unpleasant maybe black shouldn't be allowing this but then white has some chance but well, there is some hope then then in fact white is pushing because there is also the idea of going now rook c6 now that the king reached e4 and then knight c7 check and if white king lands on on d5 it go yeah now rook c6 is very strong Wow, so once again, Vincent doing what he did against Levon, transferring the king to the queen side with all these ideas and tempos. Yeah, but he plays rook f5. No, rook c6 followed by knight c7. That, that was the key, but with so little time on the clock, it's so difficult to, to, to notice this. And he wants, yeah, he's letting the knight c7 check, king d6, knight e8 check. Yeah, that's kind of his idea. Also unpleasant. Also very tricky. But maybe, maybe just look f7. Okay, defending this position from the back side is, is, is not easy. And, and okay, Sadic still has 40 seconds. I believe that for Ivan, it's also very important to have time on the clock. I, I don't see him as a, 
as an internet uh, blitz specialist or something on, on, on online, he, he needs time to maintain the, the control of the position. All right, so bishop g7 played, not allowing knight c7, knight e8. Uh, he has to think of a way to give knight c7 check, right? And for that, yes. you need your rook defending the d6 pawn. So can he try to do it while rook d5? And he goes for it, rook d5 with yeah, the Yeah, but idea then you don't have access to the d5 square with the king. Yeah, that's the problem with rook d5. That's why this rook c6 idea was so effective, yeah? Because it, it has suddenly everything works. Seemingly, it works for you. Rook f7. Trying to get king to d7. Yeah, if king lands on d7, it will be very difficult to do anything. Maybe it's time to go rook c5. So that king d7, you will have rook c7. And then if you go rook d7, you can go rook c6. Okay, in any case, make a move. Yeah, yeah rook c5 played. <laughs> Rook c5 played. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because okay, it's we, we know the tendency of instant. Yeah, he he's so trying to be super cool with one second, but yeah, bishop f8. Finally, rook c6 will be played, but probably a little bit too late. Can you go rook c7 now? He goes rook c6. He goes rook c6. Now he has an idea to go rook a6 after the a5 pawn, but already it feels like black should be able to activate the rook. Maybe rook g7 followed by rook g4 check targeting the a4 pawn. That's the rook way. Rook g7, knight d4. Yeah, and then king d7, rook c7 check, yeah. Yeah, and then rook g7. But king, king d6 actually it's a draw. But okay, down to nine seconds. Down to nine seconds. Now oh, Ivan goes, look, at that, that's what I told you. When Ivan will have to make a move with few seconds on the clock, then it, it should be a blunder because uh, he isn't used to these situations. But is this a blunder, rook f1? Well, according to computer, yes. Knight d4 check, king d6, king d5, and now rook c7. Check. There are no checks. There so are rook... no checks. And this is what you wanted. You always wanted Vincent to get his king on d5. He's finally listened. He's heard your advice, Peter. Yeah, well, thanks to Ivan. But now he's pinned, of course. It's not so easy with a few seconds on the clock to, to show the winning plan. I mean, do you give check or do you just go rook a6? Yeah, he goes rook, rook a6. a6. I'm... I like this, yeah, because you always have rook a7 check. And rook c7, king d8, rook h7, black would have had bishop d6. Exactly, yeah, we, we just don't want to let this happen. So maybe black will push h5 because there is no threat yet, yeah, on in the position. Yeah, h5 played. And now maybe you, uh -huh, now also rook a7, rook a5, black always has this bishop d6. Peter, maybe you can point it out with arrows that white can't, or we might see it happen. Rook a8, king f7, there's d7. Wow, check king f7, d7, but uh, computer says that this is draw because at the end you will have rook a1. That's it. I, Ivan escapes. Yeah, d7, bishop e7, d8 queen takes, takes, and then rook a1 takes the last pawn. There is no way to defend that pawn. But bishop g7 he played. What, what on earth are we witnessing here? He missed it, and I think he immediately realized that he could have gone for this line with bishop e7. d8 check with knight. But actually, why? I mean, d8 queen was just winning. Why would he play d8 check with knight? Well, I mean, okay, when you play with, with seconds on the clock for so little time on the clock... Maybe he just thinks that this is easier than going for that exchange down endgame. The point was rook d4, rook d8 would have happened. In yes. any case, he decided to play uh, knight f4 now. Wait, it's a check. Yeah, it's a check. No, now it's, it's, now it's clear. Now it's just completely winning. Wow, I mean, okay, it's, uh, you know, whenever Vincent plays and I have to comment it, then I feel like, okay, my brain stops working. Yeah, because I just can't, uh, can't be objective. No, Peter, no one can tell that you have a bias at all. No one will ever know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm rooting, rooting, uh, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, he's also playing these this games with few seconds on the clock, yeah? So suddenly you don't know. The, the tension is taking to me and I can't calculate anymore as, as usually I do. Oh my God. Yeah, okay, one. It's, you know, for me, what is even more impressive is, of course, he still has to show a, a few precise moves here. But the fact that after what happened in the previous round against Prague and coming from such a difficult game, to play like this, D5, it wasn't an easy opening, and to fight to take his chances, it just shows an amazing fighting spirit in Vincent. He's a fighter. 
Absolutely, yeah. I mean, sometimes I tell him that draw is also a good result. I mean, you you don't need to try to win all games, but no, no. And I also don't want to change it. It's uh, I know that it's fantastic. It's it's great. You you need to have this uh, in order to to succeed. And uh, sometimes he loses games, but I also whenever it happens that he loses games because of over pushing, I tell him, but how many games you win because of that? Yeah. So it's. Uh, exactly. Uh, as as long as you win as many games as you usually do, then it's then it's fine to lose some games. No, I think I think it's a big gift to have to not fear pushing in equal positions and taking your chances because that's what gets the uh, maximum points in the big picture. Exactly. Yeah. Now now okay. The the two knights and the rook combo should be. But, but it's kind of always funny yeah, that if you are searching for a mate and there is no direct mate, you're also getting nervous that, wow, why, why is it not, not a checkmate? Am I not, not seeing it? But the position is, of course, completely winning. I mean, even if he decides to not go for checkmate and just make a move like rook c5 and pick up the a5 pawn, it should be fine. Yeah, or go after the h4 pawn with rook h7, just take rook takes h4, protect the a4 pawn with the, with the rook. <laughs> <laughs> and then you just make as many moves, you know, collect all those 10 seconds. But yeah, Vincent goes for a mate with knight d5. Oh, Vincent is going for a mate. There, there isn't a mate directly, but okay, yeah, of course, the, the position is just winning. Yeah, rook f1, king g6, I'm assuming. But king g6, he's gone for it. And now black has to run with the king to the other side. He goes king e8. And now knight e6, does he want to play knight e6? Yes, threatening rook e7 checkmate. So not so many options for black. You've got to give a check. And now... And king, just... king h5. Now the king is it. hiding behind enemy pawn. Excellent, yeah. And Peter, you're only excited about the king hiding. There's no defense for the mate. <laughs> rook e7 is mate. <laughs> yes, that's why I'm so happy that at least our king is safe. Yeah, opponent <laughs> is getting checkmated. What a game by Vincent. Amazing end game play, taking his chances, going for these uh, risky options. And in the end, it pays off. Vincent wins against Ivan. What a round we've had. Dramatic chess. One of the most beautiful games we've seen uh, from Magnus Carlsen against Levon Aronian, uh, sacrificing that piece in an unclear long term compensation and playing this end game and showing amazing technique. A uh, standout game that was. And then we saw this. Marathon fight between Vincent and Ivan. Vincent won that one. Vassal Ivanchuk lost in dramatic fashion to Radek after an oversight. And this is where we stand going into the final round of day two of the preliminaries. Arjun Aragasi and Pragnananda still on top of the leaderboard. Magnus Carlsen along with Prague at 14 points. Hans Neiman, Jan Shrestov Duda with 13. Vincent Kamer at 11. Vassil at 10. Wojtasek at 9. And if you take a look at the Second half, at the other half of the leaderboard, some big heavy favorites there. Anish, uh, they need to start scoring up. They need to start racking up the points to have a chance at qualification. Uh, Peter, a big round coming up. Let's take a look at our matchups. For this well, time. actually, you know, we got carried away. They already started the action, yeah? Game uh, number eight. I mean, one number eight. And look is... at this, Peter. Before we get into the chess action, we have got a matchup that always excites us. That's always full of firework works. Pragnananda takes on Magnus Carlsen. And these two have had a bit of a history in the Champions Chess Tour. Their previous matchup was in the FTX Crypto Cup in the final round where Prague beat Magnus. Magnus and wow, wow, wow. Pardon, sorry that I interrupt. Prague blitzes out h4, h5. So it means that he has expected the peers and he comes up with a sacrifice on move six. And Magnus be scared, be very scared because Prague is already drinking water. And we have discussed this many times that when Prague takes a sip of that water bottle, it's time to be very terrified. Well, definitely. I mean, if your opponent blitzes out uh, h5, yeah, because let's take a look what happened. e4, g6. So Magnus plays exactly the same line that he has played against uh, Arjun Erigaichi in the first round. Knight c3, bishop g7, bishop e3, a6. And now instead of the typical queen d2 move and, oops, I mean the typical queen d2 move and then follow it up by h4, Prague goes h4 immediately. And after knight f6, which seemingly stops the move h4, h5, Prague goes h5, and after knight h5, boom, rook takes h5, g takes h5, queen takes h5 on the board. And, and look at this devolution bar, jumps, loves it from the white side. We know that Prague definitely in preparation, otherwise you don't do this. 
Is Magnus in a lot of trouble already? Can, can somebody tell us, is, is this theory? I mean, this, did this ever happen? Because I know this action sacrifice from the Leningrad Dutch. Yeah, that's uh, very typical there that you go H4, H5 and sacrifice on H5. I haven't seen it here yet, honestly. E6 played, trying to get queen to E7. Yeah, trying to get some stability. Ah, yes, Tadea says, as always, he knows everything, he checks out everything. Some games, yes. Okay, so there are some games, so it's not a, not a stunning novelty or something, which means then Magnus should have been aware of this, but, uh, but maybe not. Ganguly Kartikeyan, MP, ah, this is the trick, because usually many times, you know, these uh, online events are not included in the online database. It's very tricky. Uh, maybe people haven't checked out Ganguly Kartikeyan. If Surya plays it, it's good. I agree. I mean, Surya is an incredible theoretician who loves the initiative. He also loves, you know, strategical fundament. So if he sacrifices an exchange, it's, it's definitely not a speculative one. He believes that it's fine. It's good. All right. But you sacrifice an exchange against the world champion. He's made the move E6. And now you start thinking. So you might be prepared with the idea, but E6 is a move that clearly Prague is not familiar with. How does he continue the initiative? What's the follow-up of this? Well, I mean, I mean that, 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 that's why you have to do your homework. And I'm guessing if Prago that he sacrificed the exchange, he, he should have analyzed this position because just sacrificing the exchange, it, it's not enough. You have to know the follow-up. If it would be so easy, then, then everybody would know the idea that, aha, okay, this and that happens. Um, Ganguly just castled long and then played e5 after knight d7. So something like knight d long castle, knight d7, e5 was that game. Ganguly versus, uh, versus Kartikeyan from, uh, from MPL. He's gone for e5 directly. Directly. Long, okay. Yes. No, yeah, he made the move e5 instead of going for long castle. Yeah, that's basically the idea, yeah, that white wants to target the f6 square as quickly as possible. Now, imagine white gets a chance to go bishop g5, knight e4. It's game over on the spot, yeah? So, actually, black is running huge risk here. So, you might have to play h6 immediately right now to stop this idea of bishop g5, because you can also twist the move order and go bishop g5, knight e4. I mean, imagine how, how Magnus feels at this moment, yeah? He has just played this wonderful game against Levon. And uh, instead of being able to enjoy it a bit, yeah, I mean, he's faced with these problems over the board. I mean, but he created it for himself. E4, G6, it's fine if it's a surprise. And what Prague wants to say that, you know what, if you have done it to my friend, you can't do it to me because I'm, I'm ready for it to punish you. Prague looks very confident right now. It, he, it, it, the fact that he's playing Magnus just doesn't seem to phase him ever. And this is no exception. I mean, look at him. It's like it's an everyday job for him. He plays Magnus and, uh, you know, beats him all the time. That's the kind of expression he has. Uh, looking very well prepared right now. I have to say, it's, it's amazing to see him. Absolutely. But uh, also, we know that uh, Prague is very strong with initiative. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, there, there are players, for example, for me, it was always a little problem. Yeah, that I like to sacrifice. On the other hand, I like to just build up the pressure, yeah, slowly, step by step. And if I sacrifice something, then I have, I feel this pressure that I need to do something, yeah. And uh, and sometimes it was unpleasant to to deal with this feeling, yeah, because you are fighting against yourself, against your own instinct. But in Prague's case, this is his main asset, yeah, that he he is just going for it, and he doesn't like to play very. He he's also capable of playing very slowly, yeah? but but his natural talent is, I think, also Kramnik was mentioning this, yeah, that. He always wants uh, very double-edged uh, dynamic positions. All right, Bidil, let's look at some potential ideas here. Let's say you do stop the move bishop g5 with a move like h6. What's the follow-up? Do you go long castle and play slowly with long castle 94? I'm going to go long castle, exactly, yeah. And I, think I, mean, I mean, if Surya has done it, uh, then, then I'm going to do it as well. You can trust Surya, that's for yeah. sure. When it comes to opening prep, he's definitely one of the best. Now, after Long Castle, can Black continue with trying to finish his own development? Uh, kind of hard to find a move. How you're going to do that? But let's say B5, Bishop B7 comes to mind. B5? Wow. I mean, but B5 is is very committal. No, I mean, you are 
not developed and you are weakening some more diagonals, you are also stepping into some D4, D5. But I'm and, struggling to find an alternative move. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's just otherwise knight D7 maybe. An yeah, idea. well, the, the, the other move that I wanted to highlight, you know, that what about closing everything with D6, D5? We can, we, we can of course, do, it, do, do this already after, after E5 immediately. Yeah? Maybe H6 anyway is useful that, but the problem what I see with this position is let's just, for example, make this move. So yeah, H6, long castles, and D5. Okay, we closed it. We are not getting checkmated at the moment, but maybe we are strategically lost. And white can just play very slowly. For example, maybe just bring a knight to h5. I mean, you, you just bring this knight, for example, via like this, you remove the queen, knight lands on h5, the game is won almost automatically because black will not be able to challenge white center and, and everything is just uh, gonna collapse, yeah? So th that's the reason why I'm loving this exchange sacrifice that it gives white tremendous initiative, but it also has this uh, position of fundament that you know exactly that you are absolutely not risking anything. H4, H5, and you just give up the exchange. That is, that's a great thematic idea, idea in many, many uh, openings that we see. And I'm kind of surprised that Magnus did not take it very seriously and now goes into a big thing. He's already burned five minutes on the clock and needs to take a decision that is definitely not pleasant. I, I think he's about to make a move. So let's just make... Wait for his move before we move on to another board. H6, D5 are two moves that come to mind. He's gone for your idea, Peter, immediately. Stopping any opening up of the center. No knight E4, not allowing the knight to jump on and place the move D5. But this means now it's going to be a strategic compensation for white. Long yes, castle. no, and then don't understand. Yeah, because I just hate the move D6, D5. And I think Magnus also hates it. It's, it's done out of necessity because, okay, we, we don't want to get checkmated, but... If, if you have to play d5, it's basically you know that you are just strategically lost and you are hoping for some miracle, but you really need a miracle to survive here with black. The other player who really needs a miracle to survive is Jan Shristov Duda. Peter, with the white pieces, he's managed to get his queen trapped. Wow, what? What has just happened? Can we just... Against Rudd, wow, I mean, okay, this is... First of all, I have to say that uh, Radek is an incredibly strong and stable player. I, I'm just loving his chess, but he's always suffering against Duda. He has lost so many games. He, he's just unrecognizable usually when he faces Jan Shishtov. So if he would win this game, actually that could be a big turning point maybe for him because whenever you, know, you have an opponent against whom you are constantly losing, you need one game to win and then to feel that oh, I can actually beat this player and then you can start to fight against him on equal terms in the future. So it's, it's kind of a reverse King's Indian. Knight c4, f6, c3, king h8, a4, bishop e6. Everything fairly standard. If we think that this is wow. a King's Indian, of course, from the white side, you don't really see this position too often. Rook b8, knight fd2, b5 takes, takes, queen b5. Queen c7, rook a6. A big blunder, Peter, rook a6. A huge, huge blunder because of look at this stunning move, knight cb4, attacking that rook on a6, and the queen on b5 is stuck, and bishop d7 won the queen. Yes, cb. And we see that why it's so important to make this prophylactic move, king h8. Otherwise, bishop takes d5 would be a check. Now it's just some speculative queen sacrifice already. Yeah, the, the queen has nowhere to move. And you will only be getting two pieces for the queen. Wow. This is a really, really big moment for Radek. He has already beaten Ivanchuk in the previous round. If he wins another game, he has all the chances to qualify. I think also we have been talking about that we are rooting for Chuki. Everything I have to say, I'm rooting for Radek also very much. I mean, he's a very good friend. We have been working together for, for Team Vichy. I respect him tremendously, his, his working ethic and everything also as a person, he's, he's wonderful. So getting your chance to qualify and, and winning games, that, that, that's really nice to see. Currently in eighth position, so definitely in the race for that qualification eight, eight spots that we've got. Peter, This I, I just want to back up to that position where he played Knight CB4 because what a stunning move that was. And... Is everything just over after this? Is there nothing that white can do? Well, I mean, bishop d7 is coming. The rook is hanging. Uh, the, the best is already that you sacrifice the queen 
for, for two pieces yeah. and for some light squares. The only problem is that it doesn't seem to be enough at all. So the and final- And also let's, let's point out that after bishop takes d5, bishop takes d5, c takes b4 would not have changed anything because now the queen gets trapped from c6. Like this, yeah? But hang on, if, if you take bishop takes d5, uh, bishop takes d5, can I take on b6? Or nothing changes, yeah? You, you trap the queen then on the a5, bishop c6, queen a5, rook a8. Ah, you wanted to play bishop d7 instead, yeah? No, I was I was actually thinking that just knight takes d5 would be strategically winning, yeah? Just forget about the queen. If, if you give up the light square bishop, the soul of this position, just after knight d5, I look at my opponent, okay, do you want to design? I think rightly so, but uh, of course, if we can win the queen with bishop d7, then, then it's even better. d7 is the cleanest, yeah. Yes. Wow. What an opening and what a miss. And then knight cb4, stunner of a move. Peter, now it's just uh, probably a matter, matter of technique that for a player like Radic should be trivial. He's up a queen for just two pieces. Uh, we'll keep an eye out on this one, but let's move on. Yeah, basically, I think also important to mention just, and then we move on, that he might even have c takes before uh, because hitting the bishop and indirectly then even creating a c5 square for the bishop and then it's you are queen up and uh, also activate the bishop it should be uh, hopeless and what about what on earth is boris already boris is winning against christopher you i mean he's peace up after move 10 what has happened here tiredness I happened Peter yes exactly it's the exhaustion that these yeah. players are feeling it's so easy to forget about how demanding this format is and that's exactly what we saw a player like Jan Tristov Duda does not get his queen trapped in 17 moves Christopher Yu does not blunder a piece this is all about keeping your stamina and energy and it's easier said than done ah uh, wow yes I mean he basically he is okay the position is Probably very bad already, but yeah, knight bd7, blunder g4, and uh, bishop g6, g5. Usually people run after the bishop on g6, yeah, but now due to the pin, the, the knight on d7 will be lost. So he had to take on g4, bishop d7, knight d7, knight takes g4, and okay, just a piece. You know, I have to mention here one thing that last year Boris uh, Gerfand was one of the main mentors of, uh, of this. Uh, Judith Porga Kramnik's uh, initiative of the Julius Bear event. And uh, I feel that maybe Christopher, you know, was getting also lessons from Boris and everything. Maybe there is also some tremendous respect, yeah, knowing that how, how good uh, Boris is, maybe even displayed on his mind, yeah, because this is very uncharacteristic how Christopher just, just collapsed. I mean, th All this right. is shocking. Peter, he's up by a piece. Once again, another game that uh, is, for, for someone like Boris, should be trivial to convert. Uh, Peter, we have to rush back to the Prague Magnus game because the action is just there. It's uh, it, He's decided to commit with f4 and then develop the knight from f3. So he's playing like nothing's happened, but it looks like a dominating position. I also look at our eval bar. It likes white, white more. Uh, would you agree with that? Is it really this bad for Magnus? Yeah, it's, it's really good for, for White, of course. It was very important to mention that the difference between what we were talking about after h6, long castle d5, and black gives a tempo, or by keeping the pawn on h7 and after long castle going c5 immediately. Of course, this is the only way how you can play this position from black side. Magnus immediately grabs his only chance, practically speaking, of course, now after dc5, be careful, knight e4 is a big threat using the pin. So Magnus, of course, sidestep that first with bishop d7, preparing knight c6. And after f4, knight c6 is played. So now white has to play in a very energetic way. In the, in the other case, when with pawn was coming to h6, I was mentioning that slow plan with knight e2, knight gc, or knight hc, knight f4, uh, knight h5. That's not the case for this position. Yeah, You have to really focus on the center. Yeah, I'm expecting some knight fc. And eventually, the big question will be that some timely f4, f5 break before black will be able to castle long because also it's not easy to castle long even after queen c7 long castle the f7 pawn is falling yeah and then there are all kinds of problems in in black's court and queen a5 played is the most logical at least creating some kind of a counter attack against the a2 pawn as well 
And how are you responding to knight g5 here? You want to play knight d8? No, no. <laughs> de de definitely not. Everything but not knight d8. If I, if I feel like if I have to play knight d8, I'm going to lose. So uh, anything else is better. What, what do I do? I have no idea. But definitely what, is the, not... what is the else in this position? Your f7 pawn is hanging. Yeah, le yeah. let me think about it because... I mean, I want to break with some d4. Can I play, for example, rook f8, sacrifice the h7 pawn, and then... But what I mean, about your bishop on g7? Do you not even care about your bishop on g7 after queen h7? No, it's, it's of course, yeah, the position is bad. But, uh, but okay, so I have to cast along, yeah? Okay, it, it was my main move anyway, and knight f7, I have this bishop e8 idea. Knight f7, you have bishop e8, so I'm just wondering yes. if I should take queen f7 instead. Yeah, so basically, yeah, just to show, yeah, knight f7, bishop e8 is, is fine. I mean, fine in the sense that it's it's a fight. And uh, queen takes f7, bishop h6, and then we... Are we alive or we, we, we are not? Knight takes e6, we have knight takes e5, maybe. What? d8 is hanging, no, Peter? Oh, knight e5 here, okay. Knight takes e5, maybe. Fair yeah. enough. I mean, okay, everything is hanging. In any case, I feel like if we are able to castle, yeah, it, it's already uh, some, some good news. It's anyway the only move, yeah. Magnus not looking happy with his position and the opening outcome at all. Very understandable. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he's, he's in a lot of trouble. Wow, by the way, we also have the clash of Another clash of generation, Ivan Chuk against Vincent. It will be very interesting also to keep an eye on it. But for the moment, we have to stick with this position. It's, it's very intriguing. Very intriguing, Peter. But can we also just get a quick update uh, while uh, Prague comes up with the move on the Levon Adiban board? Because, again, a wild position. We won't spend that much time on it. But I've got to take your attention to it because you're going to love it. Well, I mean, yeah, Bishop F5, okay. If, if we talk about Adiban, then basically I'm expecting that he's going to crush this position. I mean, there is just no way that the beast will not strike here. I mean, uh, you, you can't... I'm also seeing some action sacrifice with Luke takes f5 because I would really love to keep that, that bishop on c8 alive. But yeah, Levon is trying to go queen e5 eventually, so it's not clear if I can sacrifice the exchange. But can you not just pick up the pawn instead? Bishop f5, g f5, rook f5? Yeah, but uh, I, I just told you that I wanted to, to keep that light squared bishop. Of course, uh, it's, it's the way, to, probably it's the way to go. Just take the pawn and, and everything. But it opens up Maybe some play for white. Yeah, I, I'm not, not entirely happy with this. Rook g1 and there's some counterplay. Yeah, oh, the so rook g1, queen d7. My queen might be coming to h3, so watch out. Yeah, but uh, still, I, I mean, knowing that it's Adiban's position, I, I somehow can't really believe that he will simply take on f5. I think he's going to take on f5, but with what, I don't know. <laughs> yes. The, I mean, my first, you know, I, I really wanted to play like this in the spirit, but one should not underestimate this queen because this, this look g1, the, the main problem is after bishop f5, queen e5 comes. Yeah, that, that, that's the move which, uh, which was very unpleasant. By the way, okay, let, let them figure it out. Uh, Prague has... Gone for knight g5 and Magnus has castled long. Oh, so wow. That... This is the line we were looking at, right? So no knight d8 to your relief, Peter. <laughs> and instead he goes for long castle. Now, uh, I think queen f7 will be played. Knight f7, bishop e8 is easy to spot and not something you want to get into. So queen f7 is what we're expecting here. But Prague needs to not burn the clock too much. He needs to be a little careful. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, he takes queen f7. I mean, this was the most logical and most human way of of dealing with the problems and we talked about bishop h6 and then if knight e6 then who knows maybe even knight takes e5 would be a move maybe there are also other moves i mean also white has to watch out for some timely d5 d4 but it doesn't seem to work yet all right let's take a look at this so queen f7 your bishop's attack i don't see another move bishop h6 rook g8 doesn't feel right Yeah, it, it feels that we, we don't have the luxury to, to waste time. And this brings me the question that is d5, d4 an alternative at all? Yeah, because yeah. if you are not talking about bishop h6, then, then somehow the other dynamic move would be d5, d4. 
And which is why he's having a little think and he's not immediately moving the bishop. He's definitely considering d4. So what's the point, Peter, if... Uh, if you go bishop d4, knight d4, rook d4, you get queen c5 in. A very important... But then there's rook c4. What's your point? Yeah, no. I mean, I was just hoping that something might work out. After bishop d4, I, I'm not planning to take. I want to move maybe then the bishop to, to h6. I don't know. Just so that something might be hanging. Ah, wow. Okay, the instinct was right, but I did not see the point. Luckily, we have uh, Tadeas. And he points out that knight takes d4, rook d4, bishop takes e5 is a stunning resource. Wow, brilliant. Oh, and rook f8 and the bishop on f1 suddenly is hanging. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So the instinct was right. Now also the first instinct is to, to take rook d7, but it's probably just too much because, um, I don't know, rook takes f7, rook f7, queen takes c5 would be suddenly very dangerous for white as well. But okay, three, three pieces, but the yeah, queen is the check is coming. No, this is scary. But Peter, if this is a problem, then this is a forced line. I mean, after d4, if white takes bishop d4, all this happens by force. You take bishop d4, knight d4. Can we just have it on the board? Let's say Magnus decides and finds this move d4. He's definitely... I, I have a very strong feeling this is exactly what he's looking at right now. If yes. you don't take bishop d4 and you take the bishop on g7, then d takes c3 is definitely counterplay. Absolutely, yeah. No, I mean, okay, this, this bishop takes d4, but... Also, I mean, rook d4 is probably too much, yeah, just to, to take rook Double d4. Double exchange sacrifice. Yeah, I mean, okay, the position is so crazy. I mean, if we can just uh, clamp the position and eventually, for example, just to highlight. Maybe rook example, d4, bishop takes, e5. Maybe rook d4, bishop e5 anyway. Yeah, I just want to highlight that if the knight lands on d6, then I don't care if I'm double exchange done because everything is logged <laughs> and, and I have a very nice grip. But but this is probably just a dream dreaming. It's not realistic. In wow, any case, Magnus yeah, Magnus, right yeah, Ma Magnus is, is thinking he needs to spot this bishop takes e5, the source. Yeah, d4 on he the goes board. For a d4 on the board. Yeah. D4 on the board. He has found the idea of bishop e5. Peter, let's just take a look at it one more time. This brilliant uh, point that Tad just mentioned that after rook d4, bishop e5 is the key move which makes the entire line work magnificently. Yeah, and then, okay, maybe we also get to this, uh, this position, which, which I was, you know, it, it was kind of a human move, like, like takes, 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 and after queen takes c5, I can, I can play rook f3. Yeah, this was the move that I was calculating, and I saw that if I can stabilize, I might claim some advantage. Queen because, e5? Yeah, queen e5, and then I just put the knight on e4. I mean, mm -hmm. just give me bishop d3, a3, cement, and king to a2, and I'm winning, yeah? So, um, it's, uh, it, it's, it's a complex situation. Our Valbar seems to say that even after d4, white is much better. Is this the best that white has? At least the most logical. I mean, uh, something like queen takes g7, d takes c3, a3 was mentioned by Tadeas as also computer shows it, but with a big smile, he said that it will never happen. I mean, uh, I, I perfectly agree with him that the queen sacrifice, but first of all, you have to spot bishop takes e5. Then to understand that it's not a cold shower, because after all, I can, after rook f8, go for rook d7, then you have to calculate this position all the way to, to this point and make sure that after queen c5, you spot that you have rook f3 back, because without rook f3, probably you are losing on the spot due to queen e3 check. So a lot to calculate. And then make sure that after Rook F3, everything works in your favor. Yeah, Bishop D4 played. We're going to see this. Knight D4, Rook D4. No, Rook D4 not yet on the board. But it will be on the board. He's thinking about, I mean, Queen G7 is the only other alternative, but it doesn't feel right. Because after Queen G7, you can also go Knight F5 or simply Queen C5. But he has opted for Queen G7. Strange, oh, wow. slightly and strange. I, I, and the bar disagrees with this decision. And suddenly Magnus is back in the game. So what's the point? Is it knight f5 or is it queen c5? Well, oh, bishop c6. I mean, uh, bishop c6 is also a very tempting move. Ah, no, bishop c6, rook d4, blunder. Okay, pardon me. I, I just feel like I, I needed the break, but we never had a chance. And, uh, and I'm a little bit stuck here, yeah. Uh, but yeah, he goes knight f5, yeah, getting the tempo, as, as you mentioned, yeah, knight f5, hitting the queen. 
And no. Peter, I think Queen F6, Rook F8 is the queen would be in big, big trouble there. Yeah, but then where do you put this queen? Yeah, queen, queen F7. F7 queen H5. You have to get out from H5. Yeah, but I'm, I'm not liking this. This is feeling like black is getting the momentum. I mean, Rook F8 tempo, Queen C5, Knight E3, I mean, all, all kinds of things. And, and knowing Magnus, he might, uh, he might use his chance. Yeah, Rook F8 played. I mean, at, at least he's, he's so relieved that he got a game, yeah, because there was a, there was a chance that he will be just crushed without uh, getting a single chance to, to fight, yeah? And I think Prague just didn't like, Prague is the one who did spot bishop e5 as well and just didn't like that line for white. So he didn't want to go into this uh, queen sacrifice position. I'm not sure if he spotted the whole variation, but perhaps after bishop e5, just rejected it and went for queen g7. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's very tough, yeah, because we know the evaluation, we know what computer says. He might have missed bishop takes e5 from, from a distance, yeah, thinking that everything is under control. And then you are also under in a state of shock. Yeah, and it's uh, very difficult. It's very easy here to for us to, to to say, ah, of course we can do this. If we don't know, then Tadeas is helping us out with with some computer lines. Uh, but but for the players to to sort things out, it's it's very tough. And, very and tough I'm get, getting the message, by the way, sorry to interrupt, that Hans Niemann is in a lot of trouble against Liam. Look and, at and, that king on h3. Oh my yeah. god. Rook h1 is a mate in one which is threatened. Peter, the king is paquetoed. White's king on h3. Would that absolutely. be the right way to say this? I mean, all these pieces that you're highlighting, it's like, it's some sort of a crazy version of Fisher Random where you blocked up your own king with your own pieces, but on the third rank. Yeah, no, this is horrible because the problem that the pawn is on G for the F4 square, this is the key square, yeah, the, the knight is eyeing on this square. Black has now entered with his rook into enemy's territory. Uh, with, with rook H1, it's not yet checkmate because you have knight H2, but can you imagine such a pocket? I mean, oh rook H1, God. knight H2, and, and then, okay, something will happen, but you, you can't move at all. You can't move at all. The knight on g2 has to keep defending h4. Otherwise, that once that knight from f6 moves, the queen h4 ideas come into play. This is such a strange position that White has built for uh, himself. Why would he come into this? Peter, can we just quickly play through the moves and see how White landed in the soup? Yeah, well, he got over ambitious because suddenly he opted for the g4. It looks very nice because, I mean, I don't know if it looks nice, but somehow looks tempting. Yeah, probably looks tempting is the right word that you want to use this momentum, but suddenly just, ah, because the, this knight on b no, this is, the, this is too optimistic that suddenly you weaken on the king side with g4 and then you are trying to regroup the knight from b5. I mean, black will also reshuffle and, and the knight is coming, knight reach g2, knight is coming to g6. And then finally this takes, takes queen d8 and the rook is entering. That's, that's kind of devastating. Now king h2 played, finally. And computer is loving, loving black's position. And it should. I mean, take a look at the pieces. But is there a killer blow in the position? Or a moves like knight f4 come to mind? Knight f4, but you still trade and you have rook g2 there. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I just don't want to do anything. Because in fact, I don't see white's next move. That's the big problem. I mean, and Tan uh, is saying you're absolutely on point, Peter. He needs to play in Peter's style with Queen D3, completely dominating, and uh, the end game is dead lost because you lose control over the E4 pawn. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, actually, Queen D3 is a brilliant move because it's so easy to get carried away that you want to win on the spot. But in fact, you win by trading the Queen and eliminating the only defender on, on the E4 pawn. All right. Well, Peter, yeah. this looks like bad news for Hans. Let's quickly go back to the prog board because action is heating up and things are just happening at crazy sp speed. Uh, wow, that's a lot of moves. Let's back up to where we left it and take it from there. Yeah, now again, I'm actually, before we go anywhere, I have to state that I'm loving White's position. So this double exchange sacrifice happened and I, I don't think that Black should have allowed this. Magnus jumped in with 93. And Prague immediately using the chance to 
hit on D7, Rook D7, Rook D7, Knight XC6. Did you just bang your keyboard right now, Peter? Exactly. Yeah, because it was such a move, you know, that this had to be banged. Yeah. I mean, just uh, it's, it's too much emotions. Yeah. When you can Bang sacrifice up. double exchange, this is the this is the the treasure. Yeah. You just love it so much. It deserves a banging on the on on Peter's keyboard. Rook G8. Peter, two double exchange sacrifices against the world champion. How do you do that? Yeah. Well, we are seeing yeah that uh, the, the first exchange sacrifice happened very early on. And basically, the second action sacrifice was very much in the spirit, yeah, because it was fighting for initiative. Magnus was about to take over the initiative, but uh, he got he got careless. I mean, he shouldn't have allowed this. But of course, still everything to play for. It's such a mess. I mean, if you would not see the evaluation bar that white is better, we would probably be saying that it's, it's just insane. We have no idea what's going on. Even with the engine son, I have no idea what's going on. I, I'm just loving white's position. Until I'm not blundering anything and losing. Yes, so I, I know it's very tricky. All right, let's try and see some moves. You love White's position, but I also see two rooks on the board and they belong to black. Is it really this bad? So you're saying you're mentioning the move bishop to d3, Peter, and it's on the board the moment you made that arrow. Prague goes for it. Uh, to my eyes, first question. Okay, I was going to say, what about the g2 pawn? But Magnus says knight d5. I like no, that. No, then, then I had queen e8 check. Yeah, that was the trick. Oh, that was a nice trick. Yeah, so just to highlight. Yeah, that takes queen e8 check. Yes. And it, it, that's a devastating check. Yeah, that, that's a problem. So Magnus is knight d5 is actually super smart because knight takes d5 runs into queen e1 check. So we have seen that there was queen e8 check if black rook moves from g8 and suddenly there are all kinds of queen e and Prague done to one and a half minutes. Okay. Rock down this... to one and a half minutes and a completely crazy position. Our eval bar also saying that anything can happen currently. Knight d5, Peter, you can't take knight takes d5. Knight takes c3 is a big threat if you don't take it. What's the move for white here then? Well, who knows actually? Maybe I have to take on d5 and then after queen e1, just trade the queens and play the end game with... Because we also have so many pawns, but I mean, I don't feel that white could be better there. Definitely not. And, and by the way, fire on board on everywhere. I mean, Levon Aronian against Adiban game is just completely insane as well. Oh my God, what we are witnessing what a position. here. What a position, but let's stick to this. Still exactly. It clarifies a little bit and then we can move on. Yeah, so we get that end game that I've been talking about. And I feel like white can maybe just King E2, ignore this. You need to activate the King. King E2 is the move I'm, I'm loving. And look at this. Look, take G2, King FC, and we would be just. So happy with white, I guess. I mean, all, all these pawns, all this domination, I, I really feel that th this king needs to move. Currently, currently, it took me a while, a while to calculate, but white has got four pawns for the double exchange. So that comes down to two pawns each for an exchange, which in general is great compensation. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, we are, we are not materially done at all. Yeah, it's, uh, exactly. we have so many pawns and we have lovely pieces that and King E2 played. On the board, Peter, on the board, Prague playing in the, si in the style of Peter. Uh, as you we were mentioning, even the math works out for white here. Yeah, King G2. And now the only question, and, and Prague is thinking about this, that after King F3, he has to pay attention to Rook takes D3. That does he want to allow it or should he play the move King E3? It's already a finesse, which with 30 seconds on the clock, King FC, of course, it's, it's the move. I was calculating while we were talking about this Rook DC CD. Rook takes B2, and I thought like there is no way that all those uh, pass pawns will not queen. Magnus goes Rook H2. And now you can play your move King E4 and then start advancing. Yeah, I mean, this looks, this looks devastating. E4, defend the E5 pawn and F5 next. He goes King G3. All right, that's an interesting decision. Yeah, I'm a I'm little bit uh, disliking this decision because, yeah, I, I really felt like also, as, as you stated, yeah, this King E4 and then F5 and, and everything. But, okay, Magnus is trying to play as quickly as possible because he knows that he's in trouble and he doesn't want Prague to be able to think. Yeah, that's, that's clock, his strategy. The clock is Magnus's best friend right now. Exactly. And okay, let's not for I mean, Magnus has collected now two pawns. Can and he go if, e6? Can Prague go e6 right now? But, ah, yeah, because king d8, knight f7. Oops, the king can't run like this. Yeah, Prague just collects the pawn. 
He wants to maintain the material equality. And yeah? he has three, I mean, two pieces are like six points and uh, three points are, are, are nine versus the two rooks, which, which is 10, but the dynamic factor is clearly in white's favor. So one really feels that white is not, not material done at all. Okay, Black's king is heading towards e7. Yeah, it might be able, I mean, he might be able, yeah, now, okay, now Magnus is super happy and relieved. Takes, takes king e6, draw. And as you're mentioning, Magnus is relieved. We see a little shaking of Magnus's head. He is definitely feeling that too, that this perhaps is his best chance. Feeling confident, a5, b6. He's just going to lock his rook on c5. And uh, probably no way for white to improve. Yeah, I mean, okay, nobody can really improve. Yeah, black. Black's king will be marched back to, to this. Okay, after f5, it's a different story. Does he go b6? Ah, but it's a little bit surprising. I mean, I did not expect Magnus to, to, to let his look locked out, yeah? Because the only danger is if, if White's king is able to target the weak pawns, yeah? I mean, just absolutely no reason. He could have played b6. Make okay. sure I wanted to highlight that I would love to actually regroup now my king to d6 just to be able to control my, my queen side. And Magnus... Blitzed out look h5 and after f5 now he's and look at this he said like damn it yeah did you see his his hand behavior yeah like he's very upset with himself how did he give this chance when he made the move a5 i thought it was pretty clear that he wanted to play b6 and rook h5 definitely a little bit of a surprise there uh and f5 now he's slowing down to think meanwhile hans neiman goes down to uh, liam so a big win for Liam there. Anish beat David Navara as well. And Boris wins against uh, Christopher Yu. Yeah, so a lot of, uh, lot of dramas everywhere. And, uh, and of course, all eyes on this game. Yeah, because now Magnus needs to switch to the sixth rank defense. Yeah, if, if King C5, then King E5 followed by B6 holding on together. But... I, I understand Magnus' reaction perfectly, that he was so upset with himself. It was just completely unnecessary. Just go B6 and that's it. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, he, he knew that he, you know, but sometimes you are so relieved that you know that it's, it's a draw now. I survived. I, I can't lose it. And then you blitz out one move and you end up in the trouble again. All right, but, but maybe not too big a trouble. Rook a6, exactly. the more you look at it, the more you feel it's still everything's under control. You can just go king e7, put b6, and it feels like some sort of a, a fortress that white can't break, break through. Exactly, yeah. I mean, after he realizes that he's still having things under control, he will calm down. But yeah, he's very upset with himself. Yeah, that, okay, he shouldn't have given this chance. And now he's slightly on the defensive, yeah? Because, okay, it's, it's a draw, but he needs to... To be careful, while if he would have not blitzed out to h5, then the game could have been agreed to draw immediately. By the way, I'm I'm also now keeping an eye on Levon. Levon seems to win the game against Adiban. This this craziness ends probably in Levon's favor, and it's so important for him after losing three consecutive games to finish the day on a high note. Super important. Yeah, now, now here in the Magnus's game, I, I can't really imagine any, any dramas anymore. Magnus is back on the defense. The right okay. defense should Peter, be drawn. Let's go. let's go to the Levon game then. Because as we can see that this one should be uh, held by Magnus, uh, but the Levon board. Yeah, it, but it, Levon, is, Levon is now winning. Yeah, there, there is no excitement here. All right. So this one's also over. He just goes knight b5 next. And that's it. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, this is that's it. The the big game that but we are not missing out. I think we will still have time to catch it. Is Ivan Chuk against uh, Vincent? Because look at it, just to highlight and to understand why I'm saying that we are not missing out. It's just a very complex middle game because they started later, and I'm assuming that the Magnus game will finish in the next couple of minutes, and then we will be exactly in time to to catch all the action in the Vincent game. Rook c5 check. Maybe even we're going to see a repetition of moves. Immediately. So after king d4, you go back. Rook c7. Or maybe I mean, what, what were the last couple of moves? So yes, bishop e4, rook c7, king e5, rook c5. Ah, no, but king d4, I can... No, but okay, I, I don't play for... Okay, b6 will be played and it, it's equal. But maybe plug going to play now bishop d5. And after rook takes c2, gonna push f6 check and then collect on b7. Okay, it's a, it's a draw anyway. 
And 12 seconds, he needs to decide one way or the other and not over push with his chances. Prague making sure he doesn't run too low on the clock and goes for bishop d5. So he takes this chance, Peter. And after rook takes c2, as you're pointing out, let's just have some arrows on the board. Rook c2, there's f6. Rook c2 on the board, it's been played. Yes, it's been played. F6 on the board as well. King d7, bishop takes b7. It's the logical outcome. Yeah, and boom, boom, boom. Making sure that you, you can't lose. Basically, both sides make sure they can't lose and, and the game should end in a draw. Bishop. And now you just go rook f2 next. King d4, rook f2. Yeah, well, or, yeah, king f5. Yeah, I think that king f5 and now king e5. This is the most professional way. I don't think that you can do anything else. Just king e5. King e5, rook e2. Because if you go king g5, that's king e6. Yeah, okay. He goes king is Okay, now uh, uh, king e6, there is bishop c8 check. All right, okay. N not, not that it matters, but... I mean, there is no Magnus threat. Black can just the... move the rook to f1 and nothing is happening. Magnus almost has this look of disbelief that, you know, just just draw, just go king e5. We repeat, we end the day. But Prague's like, no way. If you want to draw, you got to earn it against me. Well, I don't know who is playing for what. Yeah, because now bishop c8 check, king, king... Also, king e5 is possible. Yeah, king e5, f7, and then king d6, followed by king d7 back. Yeah, and, and Magnus is not bishop trying F5, to... Bishop f5, Peter. There's bishop f5 in that position. Yeah, no? but king e7. Yeah, then back. Uh-huh. Nice. Yes, and then Magnus might try to, to play on. I don't know. It's, it's, of course, a draw, but that's why he was surprised that are you really asking for bishop it? Bishop c6, bishop c4. Yeah, and then it's a draw. He's just going to put his bishop there. Black will be forced to put his king on f8. And then nobody improves. Yeah. But Prague is down to 10 seconds. Yeah, he needs, yeah, he does bishop a6. I mean, that's what we were expecting, bishop c4. And okay, now black will just move the rook on the f file all the way. White's king is cut. No matter where, it's the, the game is going to end in a draw. I mean, Prague going king g4, <laughs> not king g6. I mean, what are you doing? Prague is what? just playing on seconds and declining repetition every time. <laughs> Yeah, trying to play on Magnus has on and on the commentator's nerves. Yeah, because we thought like, okay, it's it's gonna be a draw, draw, and and nothing really changes, but the game continues. All right, and now uh, the players are thinking a little bit. Magnus thinking. I mean, he can just play rook f two. There is no progress that White can make in this position. No, White can, but that's the point that maybe Magnus feels like, okay, come on, hang on. If it less time on the clock. You are trying to get away from, from the repetition, then let me suddenly start doing go, something. He wants to go king d6, king e5 is what he's thinking about now. No. That's, no. that's <laughs> maybe too much already. No, 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 no. no. I, I don't, don't think that... You, you think that he wants... To, uh, and then he wants to... Uh, no, no, it's not. It's no. too much. I don't think you can do it. I know. He, he just f7, takes on f7. Okay. He forces it. He forces the draw. And now the point is that Black's king just gets there in time. Yeah, but I mean, there was also absolutely no reason why it had, I mean, okay, it, it just forcing a draw. I mean, Magnus felt like enough is enough, right? I mean. But what a game, what a game in so many ways, right? With Prague also just going, taking it, taking every single chance he got. Uh, for so many of us, it might be so easy to just say, okay, let's, we are getting a repetition here. Let's take it. But Prague says no. And Magnus had to find, uh, well, a forcing way to force a draw. Otherwise, Prague would be happily willing to go down another 20, 25 moves. And look at that. Magnus congratulates Prague and applauds, applauds him for this big fight and an amazing play with Rook H5. Double exchange sacrifices. Magnus recognizes. What a brilliant game by Prague. It, it was a wonderful game. And also by Magnus, I mean, to, to find the chances because it would have been so easy to collapse. I mean, okay, the, the position was terrifying. And then he find all these ideas with D for them. We have seen the double exchange sacrifice. It, it, was a, it was an incredible clash. But now we have a chance to catch up on 
on the drama in uh, Ivanchuk versus Vincent game because Chuk is down to 40 seconds. Vincent has two and a half minutes. So it's the first time we don't see Vincent behind on the clock. That's already at least some good news. The position is very complex. Peter, that was really nice to see Magnus' reaction after that game. I, it just goes on to show the amount he the amount of mutual respect between these two players and Magnus recognizing that it was a tough game and all these creative ideas that Prak came up with. Uh, I really liked that moment. Yeah, but uh, now if after the game he will realize that Surya has already played this action sacrifice, <laughs> he'll be very angry with himself or with Peter Hein and Nielsen that, okay, come on guys. I mean, why nobody told me about this, yeah? <clears throat> Uh, yes, the first yes. exchange sacrifice maybe Surya played with, but the second exchange sacrifice Prague played himself, which itself was pretty uh, impressive. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, but okay, now all eyes on this battle because this is, I think, the first game between Vincent and, uh, and Ivanchuk. A very interesting battle because I know that uh, Vincent has tremendous respect for Chuki. I mean, uh, because at the moment when Vincent was uh, starting to, to play chess, then Chucky was like number two in the world, yeah, and was, was absolutely uh, one, one of the very best, so has tremendous respect, but he's having everything under control now, yeah? And the big question is, do we trade queens and then activate the knight, or should we keep the queens on the board? Yeah, it's a big question. I mean, I, I don't know exactly. I mean, practically speaking, just trade the queens and then bring the knight to g5 and then slowly try to improve. On the other hand, maybe it won't be so easy to improve. And white will also try to activate the bishop. Eventually, the pawn on b6 might be uh, a weakness. So Vincent taking his time. How to react? Maybe keeping the queens actually makes a lot of sense, especially because white is the one who is trying, but queen f6 runs into g5. That's that's one trick, no? Queen, queen f6, g5, a g5, rook h3 with checkmating ideas. Oh, that's a pretty, that's a pretty one. It's quite brutal as well. Uh, does it work though? Do you have g6 in that position? Yeah, maybe, but I mean, I, I just wanted to highlight that, yeah, there is a lot to calculate and you, you don't know. There is, there is an argument and Vincent goes for queen f6. Wow, really? Asking? And Chucky just blitzes out queen g2. No, but the no. thing is, right, Peter, if you play g5 and sacrifice the pawn and it's not working, then black gets this chance. Black gets this opportunity. Yeah, and black just wins. Yeah, that's why you should be fearless in modern chess. Yeah, you just can't uh, allow your emotions, you know, that, ah, that's scary and it's dangerous. You, you have to be ready to calculate. Because modern chess, without calculation, you cannot succeed. Queen I'm G2. getting an update that both Magnus and Hans have declined the interview today as well. So we won't be hearing from the two players. Well, it was, it was the logical follow-up, if, if we can say. Because, okay, if, if there was no statement before, then, then why should be any statement afterwards? But okay, all lies on, on Vincent. He's also not also, he's not down to 30 seconds and Chucky back to 45 seconds. Did he actually miss Queen G2? Well, D5 is attacked currently. So how, and I don't really see a good way to defend it. Also, G5 is a big threat. Yeah, G5 is a, I mean, okay, we don't know with which threat to deal with, but he needs to deal with somehow. He's down to eight seconds. He's down to seven now, six, five, and he plays rook to c8. Yeah, targeting this bishop on c3, it's a clever move. Yeah, because where do you move this bishop? The d4 pawn is weak. So bishop b2 is the only move. Bishop a1 would have run on to run into rook c1 check. Queen d6, yeah, that's how Vincent is trying to stabilize, protecting the d5 pawn. And but after g5? What about g5, exactly? What about g5? Does he want to play h5? He might have to, or, or can he go knight h7? No, I don't think so. Yeah, g5 on the board. We're going to find out. Hg5. Hg5. Queen, rook g5, queen f6. Rook, rook h5. h5. Threatening all this. Queen. Okay, queen h2 will always be met by g6, but still, it's very shaky. Very shaky, but for white as well, right? Because the white king is also quite unsafe. Well, yes and no, because how do you target it? But, but for black, it's so difficult to make a move. 
and down to 10 seconds, very scary situation for Vincent. He, he might be still be better, but it's not easy to play. Can you try to, can you try to go rookie eight, rookie one? He goes for it, Peter. He goes rookie eight. So trying to get the rook into the game. And if you go queen h, queen h3, there's always g6. Yeah, always this g6 business. Yeah, but uh, still, it's it's so scary to play this position with 10 seconds on the clock. I mean, okay. you remember it started that Vincent at two and a half minutes, and Chucky was down to 30 seconds, and I, and I felt like, okay, this is kind of nice. Now we can enjoy the time travel, and it and it turned, they just turned terribly. Queen g3, occupying the, the dark squares. And now can you try to get into an endgame with queen e7 and trade? He goes g6 instead. So after f takes g6, he wants to pick it up with the pawn. No, with, um, with the knight. No, the he, knight. he wants to finally activate this knight. Yeah, because, okay, this was his, his problem with this knight on f8. He was stuck. Now rook takes d5. All right, so the pawns are still equal. Material is balanced. Both kings wide open. Yeah, but the pair of bishops, uh, yeah, bishop e6 played. Now the big question, where is this rook moving? Because eventually the bishop from b2, if, if it ever wakes up with a timely d4, d5, it will decide the game. Time to go rook d6, but maybe rook d6. Yeah, but rook d6 is also a little, I mean, rook g5 or rook d6, yeah, it's a very tough call with little time on the clock. You have to believe your in intuition or your calculation. Yeah, the rook g5 is more natural. And I like it because you're threatening bishop g6, d5 always in the air. How are you fighting bishop g6? Because king g7 is just such a scary move to make with this bishop on b2. And he goes for it because there's no alternative. Yeah, he plays king g7. I mean, he needs to block on, on d5. Yeah, he needs to be able to play rook d8 or something. Bishop c3 plays probably rook c8. Yeah, hit this bishop immediately. It's a tempo. Well, and dramatic position, yeah. Have to come back, Bishop B2. Bishop B2 and now Rook, ah, Rook, can we play Rook D8? That's that's very important question. But uh, the Rook on C8 is actually quite nice, so it's difficult to move it. But which piece moves anywhere? It's not easy to find the move. Rook D8 played. And Rook D4 in the air. So this exchange sacrifice is always uh, something that White needs to watch out for. Can you go queen g2 trying to threaten d5 here? But then, yeah, what about queen g2? Yeah, queen g2 is possible, of course. d5 is a threat. I can't put anything on d5 because... And, and Chucky just goes a4. Okay, now yeah. he gives the chance to block block something on with rook d5. Can we go rook d5? Yeah, rook d5 played. No, and Vincent must be very relieved after getting rook d5 in because queen g2 stopped rook d5, defended the bishop on b2 and threatened d5. Yeah, I mean, I, I was suddenly, wow, rook e5 trying to keep, it's what a nice move. I mean, rook e5 is a really nice move. It's a really beautiful move and something very easy to miss. Yeah, and if rook e5, d5, then already bishop d4 will come. And Vincent played with one second on the clock, takes, takes queen e7. He's eyeing with queen b4 Five. some counterplay because bishop d4 is a problem. Then, yeah, but you've got queen a3 and you start giving checks. Yeah, queen b4. All right. And after bishop b6, he wants to take the a4 pawn. Yeah, he wants to. And then both sides will have some, some very annoying passers. Very difficult to say what, what happens here. 12 seconds to Ivanchuk. Bishop b6 played. Yeah, probably you need to take on a4. But there are also ideas like bishop d8. B, no, but bishop exactly. d8, queen d4 is a big blunder. Okay, you can't play bishop d8. But you have to be careful about these threats. Maybe he'll just move the king and he does it king f2, though. Yeah, so he's still not threatening anything. Queen a2, queen a2 check king e3. And now black has to be careful about bishop d8, bishop f6 ideas. Exactly. This this idea is, is there. It's going Did, to happen now. He's going to go for it. Did Vincent miss it? Yeah, because he pushed a4. Seeming like he has things under control. Maybe he has under control, but very scary. Yeah, bishop d8. It's on the board. Bishop will land on f6 and black's king will find itself in a mating net. 
Yeah, queen b3, cool defense, king bishop f6, so king g8. Yeah, the, this pin was very important because this case then also white finds it difficult to... Or maybe king f8 so that your knight isn't pinned anymore. But but king f8, yeah, maybe it's because king queen g2 is a big blunder due to the queen takes this d check. Exactly. The, yeah, this, this fork has to be... Maybe queen f3. Maybe queen f3, then there's bishop d5. Taken care of because this, this motive is there. Queen f3 played. And now you have to play bishop d5. You don't have to, but it's an option. Yeah, bishop d5. On the board, hitting that queen, stopping queen a checkmate. Basically now, one could argue that queen h3, bishop e6, queen f3 could be a very logical follow-up. Okay, queen g4, bishop e6 is also the same. What a dramatic game, queen c8. So bishop e6, queen f3, bishop d5 might be a repetition. But, it's but bishop e6 is apparently a blunder. Yeah, bishop e6 is such a natural move, but... Why is it a Queen d4 and then coming to d8. Ah, Vincent blundered this. Now he's in a lot of trouble. Now it's and over. And Russell immediately spots it. That's why he played queen g4. Yeah, that's why he played queen g4. So sharp. Okay, so queen d8 is a big threat. Queen c5 check. What happens if you go bishop d5? Well, then queen c5 check and then checkmate is coming. Is it coming? King g8? Oh, yeah, and queen... The knight on g6 gets pinned. He's queen pinned, c yeah. yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah, so he had to go queen d5, but okay, there is no, no escape here. Do you just take on a4 now? But queen well, a4... Or queen a7. I mean, I thought queen a7 maybe just insisting on all these mating ideas. Queen a7 is very strong, Peter, because knight e5, you've got queen b8. Yeah. Yeah, queen b6 played. Okay, it's basically a very similar idea like queen a7. How, how do you stop the mate? Yeah, that, that's already very difficult. How do you play like this on seconds is the question in my mind. Yeah, it's, it's impossible. Yeah, queen d7 played with two seconds on the clock. <clears throat> Queen Still B8 not. check. Still queen C8, yeah, good. because, yeah, trying Still. to fight. But maybe you just go Queen D6 check and go B6. Yeah, but okay, this B6, then we also push A3 or, or but something. But then B7, Peter. B7 you take and there's Queen D8, Queen H8, mate. No, then we have Knight F8 already. I'm not pinned yet, but I mean, uh -huh. yeah, with so little time on the clock, it's uh, I, I have no idea what's going on. Uh, by the way, yeah, Queen C1 check. Yeah, there is a check. Finally, there is one check. Oh, wow. So B6 was a big inaccuracy then. Wow. I mean, of course. Now there is probably perpetual check. Yeah, queen B2 check and the king can't even run away. Well, what terrible game. blunder by Chucky. What a game this has been. It's a roller coaster. And now Vincent gives queen G1, not, not queen B2 check. I mean, just to tease us, right? I mean, okay. Queen B2 was a direct... Okay, this is also perpetual. Peter, I really don't think Vincent is thinking about us right now. Yes, definitely <laughs> not. No, no, it was more of a joke. Yeah, that's okay. Peter, this is the last game we started late. So with, with two seconds on the clock, that's that's what is in the mind of Vincent for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's it's perpetual. It, it should be perpetual, but knowing Chucky and also knowing Vincent, who knows if the game ends here? Maybe it's just the beginning. King B2, there you, there you have it. This, I think, will end in a draw, though. You can go queen d2, but queen no, d2... No, then bishop c2. No, why, bishop why? no check. No check. Yes. I mean, that's why, you know, I thought, like, okay, you give queen b2 check, making sure that opponent has to come back to ec, and you give perpetual. Why, why would you give any other check? But Vincent has good nerves. Queen f2 check. And after bishop c2, he, he going to play bishop b3 or what? Can he go a3 after bishop c2? Well, king b2 played. King a3 played because I think after bishop c2, black had a3. Yeah, not king b4. White is running out and white is winning the game. Is he? What according to our eval bar, Peter? I don't know. But I mean, with few seconds on the clock, I feel like, okay, this should have never been allowed. Yeah, because, okay, now the, the king is running out. But running out where? And what's your threat? Can't black just go A3 next? Oof, I don't have the nerves for that. I mean, okay, maybe I'm getting... I mean, black has to go for it, but... Uh, but A3, bishop, G6. But who knows what's that? Yeah, A3, bishop, G6 is just game over. Because F, G6, queen, D8 runs into mate. 
Well, knight f8 is the only move. I mean, with few seconds on the clock, how do you find knight f8? And Quisley check is the law, and now king a6, it's game over, no? Now the, now the king finally escaped. I, I told you that, no, of course, you, you, you simply, if you have two options, you should give the, give the option. And now, now he finds knight f8, but it's just too late. Now it's too late, because after b7... A3? Bishop C8, what a move by Winston. This yeah, is just, but okay, this is not just, just lost. It's just I don't understand. No, okay, B8 queen was coming, yeah? There was already no way to... But how is this different? The difference is that the queen from B3 is stopping the B7 pawn. That's why... Exactly, knight then knight D7 was possible, yeah. That, that's the point. Well, I mean, we have seen, yeah, Vincent is fighting, but he, he let two games uh, run away. I mean, this, this game against Prague and also against uh, Chucky in, in time trouble. All right, but he's still fighting. Queen takes a3. No, I mean, okay, he's, he's peace done. I mean, okay, you, you can't expect any miracles here with peace done. And... <clears throat> I don't know, Peter, whatever we've seen of this tournament uh, so far, I'm not going to call out anything yet. Yeah, but look at, I mean, Chucky is also leaning back. He knows that, okay, that's it. Now this is a method of technique. I have the technique. Probably queen goes back to d6 or he, you know maybe he... Knights? knights are always a little tricky. Yeah, queen d6 on the board. Okay, black will play probably. No, you, you can't play queen c3 because of queen c8. I mean, queen b8 check. Basically, it's over. Yeah, queen eight. Yeah, hard to say something. I'm, I'm of course, very sad. Yeah, that Vincent had such an. I mean, we joined in the the game. He had the chance. He could have traded queens and be pulled up in an end game. Uh, with two and a half minutes on the clock against 30 seconds, just uh, but but he got fooled by Chucky that Chucky was done on the clock. This is this is the lesson you are getting against uh, Ivan Chuk that you should never look at Chucky's clock, just pay attention to, to the objectivity of the position because uh, he, he never collapses. I mean, he always has the, the clock on under control and with 10 seconds uh, increment. Uh, and now just queen d8, queen d8 would probably be the simplest. Yeah, okay. Now it's uh, just even not, not clear if Chucky wants to trade the queens. He can even go queen d7 and then try to checkmate. But yeah, queen d8 forces resignation. It's good enough. He goes for it. It's just so clean. You don't want to take chances with the knight. Yeah, yeah. This is, this is Chucky. I mean, he was shaky today. I mean, he, he really had uh, hard moments. But when it comes down to, to such fight, then he's super dangerous. I mean, he controls the, the clock very well. and. And then, yeah, finally, okay, Vincent at some moment made the decisive mistake. The king comes in. But, Peter, the way Vassal ran with the king and uh, managed to hide it, also just amazing play there. It's not just, you know, you, you take your chances. Yes, Vincent made some mistakes, but I think overall both players just played an incredible game. Well, it was a great fight. I, I don't say a that it was uh, it was brilliant quality, definitely not. But it was it was a very hard fought game, and with little time on the clock, what else can you ask for him? With with the king stuck on the last rank, getting mated, finding all these resources, giving checks with the queen, the b pawn running down the board, the a pawn running down the board. We saw all these ideas in one game. Yeah, the reason why Vincent is not yet resigning, okay, I think that he, he should, is simply the disappointment. Yeah, he, he knew that actually he was, he was having a, a very nice game. He was controlling the game very nicely, outplaying Ivanchuk at, in the middle game. Oh, okay, yeah, the now, now the knight is also trapped. Bishop f6, and that's it. I think Vincent in this moment resigns with the knight, getting traded off. What a win for Vassil. A difficult moment for Vincent, but a tough fight, an intense fight in a massive time scramble. And with that, Peter, we've wrapped up our final round of the day. Let's take a look at our scoreboard. And if we can just maybe have the camera still on, but all right. So we've got Anish Giri 
who won against David, Hans lost to Liam. Levon beat Adiban. This was Levon's only win of the day. He lost three games back to back and the final one managed to win against Adiban. An important win for Lev, otherwise it would have been a very, very disastrous day. Prague on the upper hand, what a game by Prague. Two exchange sacrifices, always keeping Magnus under pressure, declining repetition after repetition, and in the end was rewarded by an applause and a thumbs up by the world champion himself who recognized the gigantic effort Prague made in the game to try to get the point. Ivan Saric drew with Arjun. Ivan Chuk won against Vincent in a big fight. Duda lost to Wojtasek, while Gelfand beat Christopher Yu. Yeah, so let's take a look at the standings, yeah, because uh, it's it's completely crazy what we are witnessing. So many ups and downs for all the players. So many ups and downs. And at the end of day two, we've had a lot of leapfrogging in the standings as well. Uh, we see a lot of shifts and turnarounds. Uh, Arjun and Prague now on top of the leaderboard. Arjun with 17 points on, on pole position. Chasing him, Prague and Magnus with 15 points. Vasil Ivanchuk. Hans Neiman, Jan Shristoff Duda, all with 13. Radek, Liam with 12 points. And then right behind them, also in the race to make it to the top eight, Vincent, Levon, Anish, Peter, so much to play for in uh, the big day three coming up of the preliminaries. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, uh, everybody is fighting. We, we see that everybody has a chance with the three-point uh, scoring system. The, the standings can change dramatically and very dynamically. Of course, now I'm, I'm really disappointed for, for this completely unnecessary loss against uh, Ivanchuk for, for Vincent. Yeah, when we joined in, uh, I can just pull back that, that moment, yeah, that it was this moment that Ivanchuk has just played the move Queen H2. If we will get the board, give me a second. Yeah, Queen H2. I mean, this was the moment Vincent had two and a half minutes versus 30 seconds of, uh, of Ivanchuk. And uh, clearly, I mean, just trade. Activate the knight, knight h7, knight g5, you are pawn up. Okay, who knows, white has some chances to survive. Chucky would have definitely fight with bishop d2, but, but okay, nothing can happen to you. Um, Vincent, of course, wanted something else because he was probably worried that, yeah, bishop d2, and I already highlighted that eventually the bishop eyeing uh, bishop c7, so there is counterplay. And then after queen f6, queen g2, that was, that was kind of a turning point. After that, the game became very nervy. And it was anybody's game. Finally, after a big time scramble, Ivanchuk won and made a very important step forward because he had a very rough day. He did lose two games, I think, and draw one. So it was a very important, huge victory for Ivanchuk. Huge victory. And we've had... Peter, so much has happened today. I mean, if we just do a little roundup of the kind of, uh, well, chess drama that we witnessed. As far as the games are concerned, I'm still thinking about the Magnus Lev game that really stands out from today from start to finish. We've seen time scrambles. We've seen turnarounds. We've seen precise play with these players playing on seconds. And uh, incredible chess between Vincent and Prague as well when they played. We've seen clash of the ages. We've seen prodigies play against each other. Uh, just an overall amazing day of chess. Fantastic play. And of course what we witnessed in the Magnus Hans uh, match as well. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> basically that, that speaks for itself. N not, nothing to add to that. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, tones of action, that's what we love. That's what we expect. Uh, the, the lineup is fantastic. It guarantees all these uh, crazy, exciting fights. Uh, we see that the players with few seconds on the clock don't back down from, from taking risk and uh, they are willing to go for the maximum. I mean, really incredible to see this because one could argue that, okay, you, you take the risk when you have everything under control and when things escalate and you have zero time and, and you don't know what's happening, then you automatically take the safety approach. No, 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 not none of it. I mean, the players are really um, going for the maximum and, and we witness all these dramatic moments. Very dramatic moments on the board and off the board. And Chad is informing that there is an interesting tweet on the matter uh, by Levy Rosman and let's see if we can have that up for food for thought right before we leave Peter because like you said one can't add much to what has happened 
that said, I think a lot is going to be added up very soon on that after what has happened. Uh, let's see if we can get it up. This is what Gotham Chess has to say. Dear rest of the world, you'll probably be seeing Magnus and Hans on your timeline today. Chess is a wonderful game. You should give it a try. We're just having a little drama right now. All right, that's quite a light, a lighthearted tweet there. And I think a perfect way to wrap up the day that we've had. Uh, definitely, chess is the game and we all should be playing it. Uh, it's a lot of action coming up on day three as it's all about the race to top eight. Of course, there's also action off the board. We'll be back with all of it tomorrow, chat. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a good night from us. Yeah, bye-bye. Air quality isn't the first thing that comes to mind when you think about chess and esports, but it affects our focus, decision making, health, sleep, and more. What's in the air you breathe? Find out with Air Things.